Okay, everyone, welcome. It's 831. I know we all want to be on time. Um, I'm Allison Baker, one of the co-organizers, and Alper Altunas is here in the front row. And we're just going to start off with a welcome by Thomas Hauser. He's the new director of the Sizzle Lab here at NCAR. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, welcome to beautiful Boulder. I think uh, hopefully you enjoyed the view and take some time to enjoy the outdoors. It was a little chilly this morning, but it's going to get up into the 50s and it's going to be uh, warmer to tomorrow. So I recommend taking a little walk, stroll outside. Um, looking back, this kind of workshop really, I think, started about a year ago where Alison, Eileen, I don't know if she's here, Carpenter and I, we met at Supercomputing and talked about kind of verification of climate and weather codes on different computing platforms and how kind of bitwise reproducible is really not working on those platforms. And Allison has developed this ensemble tool and then Dan Milroy has developed some tools to really identify where these errors come in code. So we talked to HPE and nothing really came out of it, but then I pushed Allison to say, let's submit a proposal here to our internal innovation funds. And Allison ran with it and organized this, this workshop. And I think it's especially important for NCAR now, we are kind of developing our strategy and as part of our computational strategy, we are looking at our codes and building this, what we call community software facility. And on the roadmap for year one, I mean, this is a long-term effort to really treat our models more as scientific instruments and building kind of the infrastructure and development processes around that. And part of this is in year one, we want to develop this testing and verification framework. So this workshop is really very relevant uh, to us. So I'm super excited. Unfortunately, I'm pretty busy. There's some budget meetings, but I'm trying to join some of the talks. Um, yeah, as, as the new director, I have now I have to tackle the things that I ignored as the interim director, and so things are uh, super busy. And then I don't want to talk too much, but I really want to thank um, Alison and Alper Altunas for the uh, organizing this. Also the committee, Eileen Carpenter, Brian Dobbins, I don't know, I don't see him here, uh, Michael Duda in the back, uh, Dorit Hammerling, um, and Carsten uh, uh, for organizing this. And also a uh, big thank you to our administrative staff that really made the logistics work, uh, Tasia Peterson and Lisa Larson and Kristen at the, Kristen at the thing. So give them a big applause and then let's dive into this. Thank you, Thomas. I'll let you face the other way. Yeah. Okay, so I think Thomas pretty much gave an introduction on what our motivation was for having this workshop um, and acknowledge some of the funding. Um, th these are the people that helped um, organize the administrators, the committee, all of the committee will be here in person. Um, so please introduce yourselves to us if we haven't met you before. A few things, um, this was in an email you got, but by participating, you're abiding by UCAR's code of conduct. I think um, that won't be a problem for everyone. This is a QR code to the workshop webpage. On the webpage is the schedule. Um, you can also click on a link to read everyone's abstracts if you want. Um, we have four keynote talks, several contributed talks, and at the end of each day, there's an hour slated for open discussion, and there's um, several 30-minute breaks. So I'm really hoping that we can all kind of get to know each other and introduce ourselves. It, um, we hope that everyone will participate. We have quite a few remote participants. If you're remote, um, use the Zoom hand raise signal if you'd like to ask a question and we'll call on you. Uh, you could also, if you're more comfortable, type the question in the chat and certainly let us know if you have any issues. And for the people in person for questions, um, what Alper, I probably need this morning, we'll run the microphone to you. It's important you use the microphone for your questions so that the remote people can hear. And then of course, this is the most important slide of the day, lunch. You all should have gotten red tickets in your badge that um, they're probably stuck in the back. There's one for each day. This is prepaid lunch. At lunchtime, we'll all funnel down to the cafeteria. You can basically choose what you like from the specials. There should be stuff to, um, 
satisfy anyone's dietary requirements. The cafeteria folks are super nice. They will help the NCAR regulars will help with the cafeteria. Please do not lose your red tickets. Tasia tells me we cannot give you a new red ticket. So if you lose your red ticket, you have to make a friend or use your credit card. Okay. So um, this is the schedule for this morning. We're gonna start off with um, our first keynote speaker, Steve Easterbrook. And Steve, I'll let you get mic'd up while I introduce you. So Steve is the director of the School of Environment and a professor of computer science at the University of Toronto. He received his PhD in computing from the Imperial College in London and then joined faculty at University of Sussex. From 95 to 99, he was the lead scientist at NASA's Katherine Johnson Independent Verification and Validation Facility, where he investigated software verification on space shuttle flight software, the International Space Station, and the Earth Observation System. He moved to University of Toronto in 1999 and currently studies how climate scientists develop computational models to improve their understanding of Earth systems and climate change and also the broader question of how that knowledge is shared with other communities. He's just published a new book, which I see that he has, called Computing the Climate, How We Know What We Know About Climate Change. I believe he has some available. Sold out. Oh, he sold out, <laughs> yes. The book is so popular, he sold out. You'll have to go to the, to the uh, Cambridge University Press website and order it. But, if you're interested, yesterday he gave a nice hour long seminar about what's in the book. And um, this is recorded and on YouTube for CGD. So if you haven't had enough of talks by the end of today <laughs> and you want to watch another talk tonight, then just, you know, you can see Steve's talk. But we're very happy to have him here. So thank you. All right. Well, thanks for that lovely intro. Let me see if I'm smart enough to read your slide. Okay. <laughs> I should actually, let me give you a little a little addition to the introduction while we're bringing the slides up. So I I, I kind of feel I'm very honoured to be the first keynote today, um, and a, and a little worried because I know you guys have been doing a lot more work in this topic than I have in the last few years. Um, I feel my knowledge might be out of date, which is why I want to come here and uh, listen to what's going on. But what I what I wanted to do this morning was give an overview. So um, so the book that just came out. Uh, for those of you that didn't see the talk yesterday, it's an attempt to describe for a very general audience, an audience that has no background in climate science, what climate models are, um, who builds them, how they build them, how they test them, how they establish confidence in the results, and then uh, what the results tell us. So it's a book that as much as possible tries to avoid jargon. Uh, there are no equations in the book, although I snuck a few in in the footnotes. Um, and, and my goal is not so much for this community, but to get this out to other people who perhaps are curious about climate science, have heard all sorts of conflicting things in the media about it, and actually want to know more. So, you know, recommend it to your friends and family. Um, good. Oh, I, I, yeah, tell us away. It's fine. I put wisdom in the title. I don't know if I have a lot of wisdom to impart, but we'll see. Okay. So what I want to do... Uh, yeah, um, ooh, well, let's see if I can get this working. How do you advance the slides? Because I thought the arrows would do it. Will return do it? No. Oh, I've got to use that, have I? You can use this. Or not. Um, there we go. You can All right, so that'll work. All right, good. Yeah, so so um, while we're on the shameless plug. <laughs> so what I want to do today um, is a deep dive into chapter eight of the book. So chapter eight was where I get to the question again. I've talked about how the models are constructed. I've talked about what kinds of experiments scientists run on the models. I've got a couple of chapters of the history going all the way back to the early attempts in the 19th century to, to compute uh, the, the strength of the greenhouse effect. What I do by chapter eight is I say, okay, how do we know these models are any good? And I attempted to lay out a whole set of strategies that I've observed at different climate modeling labs 
each of which gives us a, a piece of a piece of confidence towards understanding that the results we get out of the models are correct. Um, and the other thing that I did for the folks from Hamburg in the audience, I've woven through each of my later chapters uh, and it, examples of the labs that I visited and some of the scientists that I visit. So chapter eight, I focus on um, um, Max Planck Institute in Hamburg as my case study. So it's woven all the way through the chapter. So there's another hook to get you guys to read it. All right, good. So here's what I want to do today. Um, I want to start off just with that very first model in the 19th century. Um, I talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, I'm going to say a little different about it today. So uh, if you saw the talk yesterday, bear with me. Um, and then what I want to do is kind of walk through how I lay it out in the chapter, which is to give a whole bunch of different perspectives of how we think about this question of, uh, of model correctness. Um, and hopefully I can end up with some wisdom at the end. All right, so um, here's the story of uh, Svante Arrhenius's model. Uh, so he was working in Stockholm in the 1890s and got interested in this question of could a reduction of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere be the explanation for the ice ages? And most of his colleagues thought he was crazy, that there was no way that uh, uh, a trace gas in the atmosphere like that could have changed enough to affect the temperature of the planet in a big way. Uh, but he set out to try and prove his theory, um, didn't have any computers available, everything done by hand. Uh, so a year of paper and pencil calculations um, to work out an answer to this question. Um, so here is, I showed this slide yesterday as well, but um, this is the last slide that's an overlap. Um, here's a schematic of his model. What he did is he realized in order to understand how changes in carbon dioxide might affect ground temperatures, you had to solve the energy balance at the top of the equation. Uh, energy in must equal energy out for a stable climate. And then uh, there are a number of parameters in here that if you change them, particularly this um, uh, E, the emissivity parameter in here, if you change that, that's equivalent to changing the levels of greenhouse gases. It changes how much of that infrared from the ground the atmosphere will absorb versus it being passed straight up. And first of all, th this is a phenomenal insight for a 19th century scientist to first of all realize it was the energy balance equation that he needed to solve. And secondly, to find data on absorption. And he focused on two greenhouse gases. He focused on carbon dioxide and water vapor. He realized those were the two strongest gases. And uh, he found a data set um, that uh, um, Samuel Pierpoint Langley had measured uh, about 10, 15 years before of infrared from the, from the moon coming down through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Langley had measured it over about a five-year period for different elevations of the moon in the, in the sky, and he'd recorded local humidity at the time. So Arrhenius realized that data set gave him um, absorption coefficients because if it comes down, if the moon is at different heights in the sky, it's come through different thicknesses of atmosphere. So it gave him these absorption coefficients for different thicknesses of greenhouse gases. And, and he's got the um, absorption bands across the infrared spectrum. So he puts all that together, does all the calculations, um, and ends up with, oh no, I've got to do it on here, haven't I? Um, ends up with a result that looks like this. Now this, this isn't, a diagram from his paper, not surprisingly. Um, <laughs> this was my students who a few years ago rewrote his model in Python. Um, and as far as we know, we're the only people ever to re-implement his model. Um, certainly there's no published papers on it, so other people might have done it as an exercise, but certainly nobody's published it. Um, and this um, represents, oh, hang on, no, I've got the wrong slide. Oh, go back, go back, go back. Oh, sorry, this one, this is his results. Um, so what he found, uh, so, so the grid he used is uh, 10 degrees of um, latitude, 20 degrees of longitude, because those were the published weather tables that he could use to initialize his model. He needed ground, he needed ground temperatures, he needed albedo, um, he needed humidity conditions in each grid cell. And those published um, 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 weather records would give him that, apart from the polar regions where there was just not enough data to, to give him any numbers at all. 
What he found, and this one is if you double carbon dioxide, he did, he did reducing carbon dioxide to try and prove his hypothesis about the ice ages, but he also did increased carbon dioxide because he was curious about the effects of industrialization and, and us burning coal. Um, he actually thought it would be a good thing if the planet warmed a little bit. He's in Stockholm. Um, and he thought it would take hundreds of years for any signal to, uh, to, to emerge. But anyway, what he found was that you would get on average about five degrees of warming for a doubling of CO2. And um, he, his model actually allowed him to predict a whole bunch of other important things. First of all, you can just about see it on here, polar amplification. The polar regions warm more than the equatorial regions. The land surfaces, if you squint, you can see it. The land surfaces warm slightly more than the ocean. Um, and then he did some separate calculations and realized nighttime temperatures would warm faster than daytime temperatures. So all of those are correct predictions. Um, and, um, you know, truly stunning piece of work. One of the most remarkable things um, that I took from my students' re-implementation of this is their results are ident exactly identical to his. So in other words, he didn't make any mistakes in his calculations. Nobody else was able to, to replicate his work. Nobody else was able to check his calculations, but he didn't make mistakes. That's quite remarkable. We could talk, we could talk about that for the rest of the day, right? How did he do that and not make mistakes? However, his data did not support what he was trying to do with this model. So this is the model run with his own radiative absor absorption data. So his tables, his data is all published in his papers. There's a there's a hundred page paper he published in German, uh, which we had to translate. Um, and in the middle of it, there's page after page after page of data tables. So we could put all his data into the model by now. So then we said, okay, what if you don't use his radiative data? What if you use modern radiative data? So we put that into the model and boom, nearly all his results disappear. Notice the scale has changed here. We're talking, he said five to six degrees of warming. We're now down to 0.05 uh, in the equatorial regions, maybe up to 0.1. Uh, towards the poles. So what's going on is that data is not doing what he thinks it's doing. He's missed several of the key absorption bands for carbon dioxide. He's got the absorption bands for carbon dioxide and water vapor conflated. And um, basically, it, um, actually, Langley warned him of this at the time. The data does, doesn't do what he thought it would do. So you put you put the actual data in, you get completely different results. Um, why am I telling you this? Partly because even though his data is rubbish and doesn't tell him what he thinks it should be doing, he's still got those correct predictions about the nature of the effect, about you know where we would see more warming and less warming. So a whole bunch of correct predictions from an incorrect model. The other problem is, um, and those that have um, 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 studied greenhouse effect in, in detail will probably realize this straight away, his model treats the atmosphere as a single, a single block with a single temperature. There's no lapse rate. There's no change in temperature with height. And the greenhouse effect depends crucially on that lapse rate. You can't get a correct prediction of, of, um, of temperature rise without including that in your models. And it wasn't until um, Manabi's work in the 1960s that finally somebody produced a model that had the vertical structure of the atmosphere and, and actually came up with what we now realize was the first correct prediction of doubling of CO2. And Manabi said it's about two degrees. And then he didn't have all the feedback loops in there as well. And it's about three degrees if you include all the food feedback loops. And you know, there's some variation on what the what the actual result is, but three degrees is the center point for the IPCC's current uh, estimates. So, um, if you so the so the floor in his model is that the atmosphere is a single block. One, what my students did then take this model and kind of stack up layers one on top of the other, other exactly the same model, but 17 layers of them because there's 17 layers in the Lotran data that we were using. And lo and behold, we get more than one degree of warming if you do that. So now we're pushing towards what we now understand as the correct result or you know, the, 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 uh, within the range of what today's models give, give them without all the other Earth system uh, effects in there, without all the feedback effects in there. So two errors in this model, the, the treat the atmosphere as a single block and bad data, which fortuitously sort of canceled each other out. 
and allowed him to come up with his five degrees of warming prediction for doubled CO2. Um, and, and lots of people tell this story and they say, oh, look, he predicted a number that's very close to the IPCC results. And they don't look at what he was actually doing. And what he was actually doing was deeply flawed. Uh, interesting, correct predictions from it, but also flawed. OK, one of my arguments, oh, let's not show you that diagram yet. Too much cheese. Um, one of my arguments then is that Arrhenius missed or didn't have several of the really important ingredients that make science work. First of all, there's no community replicating his work. I, the immediate response when he published this paper was, we don't believe it. Uh, and in fact, there were several other scientists at the time published some experimental results that said, there's no way carbon dioxide could do that. And then for 50 years, nobody went anywhere near the question, really. One or two people published in that time, but basically nobody looked at it. So no community replicating his work no ability to run this on a computer over and over, perhaps do ensemble runs or anything like that. All of those are crucial ingredients for us doing good science. As not to say what he didn't was good science, it was phenomenal what he did, but he didn't have those uh, secret weapons. So in the book, um, I draw on um, work that I did, um, Alison was uh, nice enough to tell you about my work with NASA before I started working with climate models. I start off talking about some of the work around how NASA approaches fault protection in safety critical systems. And the key principle is this Swiss cheese model, which uh, some of you may have heard of. The idea is that it's impossible to avoid making errors. We always make errors, it's just human nature. You can't write complex pieces of software without making mistakes. And what we have is an entire system of activities that prevent any of those mistakes getting through to um, uh, causing a loss, in NASA's case, causing a loss of a spacecraft. Uh, in the case of climate science, causing serious flawed scientific work, getting published, getting picked up in IPCC reports, uh, perhaps uh, leading to, uh, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why our work doesn't lead to good policy decisions. But anyway, let's let's not not go there. All right. So the idea is we have all these layers of Swiss cheese, and so I kind of use that as a metaphor throughout the chapter. What are the layers of Swiss cheese in the client's climate community? Um, have I got time to tell you this? Yeah, maybe I will. So let, let me tell you one quick case study from NASA because it's my favorite. This is the Mars Climate Ob Orbiter, which was launched in 1998, uh, sent off to Mars. Uh, takes about nine months to get there. And when it got there, instead of inserting itself into orbit and sending us back climate data from Mars, it crashed into the planet. And the reason it crashed into the planet, and the newspapers love this, is because NASA screwed up on a conversion error from uh, imperial to metric or metric to imperial. NASA still works in imperial on these, uh, on these designs. Who knew? Anyway, so let me tell you then because to me, this is a brilliant case study in that notion of the slices of, quit, of Swiss cheese. Surely NASA has a whole load of processes that should stop a simple software error like that causing loss of a spacecraft. And of course, they do. They test the heck out of all flight software. Uh, they set up uh, all, all the conditions they think the spacecraft is going to uh, exhibit, and, and they do all their unit tests. They do their system end-to-end -end tests. Um, they have a whole bunch of design reviews. Um, they have issue tracking systems. Um, they're supposed to uh, investigate every anomaly uh, on these spacecraft while they're in flight. And what happened on this particular mission is that every single one of those uh, safety steps was overridden by stupid decisions, sometimes driven by budget cuts, sometimes driven by staff who were overloaded and just didn't have time you know, to log the issues, um, didn't have time to sit in on design reviews. Uh, so there's a whole, if you read the accident report, it's a beautiful example of like doing everything wrong at every step. So the error actually isn't even on the flight software. The error is in a file called small forces that computes the impact of a thruster when it's fired on the trajectory of the spacecraft. And it's a piece of ground software, the, the uh, mission control um, are supposed to use that every time this fires a, tr a thruster to check whether it's still on, on its navigation path. And then that allows them to fire var various course corrections on the way to Mars if they need to. The data for small thrusters, the data file was given in Newton's, Newton seconds, 
and the software specification called for it in pound seconds, and the conversion factor is about four and a half. So this data file was giving them underestimates of the effect of this thruster by a factor of more than four. So they thought there was a lot less effect on its trajectory than, uh, than was really the case. Um, for the first four months of this mission after the spacecraft was launched, they couldn't even use that data file because of other software errors in the, in the navigation software. So they were doing the calculations by hand and getting them correct. Uh, four months into the mission, they had time to correct those errors and they fired up this thing and they realized straight away that it was disagreeing with their hand calculations didn't log that in the issue tracking system, didn't investigate, continued to believe the most optimistic of all their estimates of where this spacecraft was. Mm -hmm. So if so, they've done all, if they'd done all of that work, they could have fired okay. the course yeah, corrections yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. saved this spacecraft. Was there, was there a question? Or... Okay. All right. Beautiful, beautiful example of how the story isn't about converting to imperial to metric. The story is a systemic failure of an entire organization to do all the things they're supposed to do uh, in terms of software safety. All right, so here's how I lay out the story in the uh, chapter in the book um, um, about uh, what I've observed at different climate modeling labs uh, in terms of software testing. Uh, sorry, not just software testing, the whole big picture. What are the slices of cheese? Um, so let's start off talking about engineering quality. Here's a study another one of my students did a few years ago. Oh, God, it's more than a decade ago. Uh, time marches on. Uh, that's the paper there. Um, he attempted to measure the defect density of three different climate models. So what he's looking at here is uh, errors in the code that are found after release. So after the official release of the model, after it's gone through all its testing, how many latent errors are in the code that are discovered later? Um, don't wanna to spend too much time on this chart because uh, there's a lot of complexity in here. He's got three different ways of assigning errors to which version of the, of the code do they belong to. Um, briefly, it's uh, an interval of time, six months after official release. Any errors found in that time belong to that release. Um, span assignment is any errors found between this release of the software and the next release of the software are, are assigned to the first release. And the last one is more complex. You have to go through the issue reports and identify which release of the software that error belongs to. And there's a lot of manual work in, uh, in doing all of that labeling. But in every case, what he found was that the a defect rate in the climate models he studied, these are the, we didn't name what the climate models are in the paper, but these are the three climate models, was much lower. He had two open source projects, Apache and VTK, which is a visualization toolkit. So the, the error defect rate was much lower than the open source comparator projects he was using. And then there's one more, somebody else did a, a study of the Eclipse software. And basically the error rate uh, the, the defect density in the climate models is much lower than any other published case study of defect density in software. So it's higher quality code than almost any other community is building. Still has errors in it, of course, but uh, there are a lot fewer errors in this code than one might expect based on open source and commercial uh, uh, software. Pretty much the only software that's better than this is NASA's flight software, strangely enough. All right, but then, oh no, so NASA's flight software, certainly the space shuttle flight software, I would argue is the most expensive software ever written per line of code. So safety costs money. Um, so we wrote in the paper a whole bunch of uh, hypotheses for why, if this result stands up and somebody should replicate this study, uh, somebody should replicate this study. Um, if this result stands up, why do climate models have such a low software defect rate? And basically, we, we, we brainstormed all of these possible answers. One is that the code is written by the experts themselves. So most other software, that's not the case. You have programmers and you have domain experts. The domain experts have to explain to the programmers what they want. The programmers don't get it. And then you have this back and forth. Oh, yeah, OK, right, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. You have to write specifications. You have to have meetings and so on. If you're writing your own code and you are the expert, you are going to make fewer mistakes. Um, 
There's this idea that there is a really rigorous development process where every change to the model is effectively treated like a scientific experiment. You set up a hypothesis that I think I can improve the model on this place where it's going wrong by making the following change. It might be quite small. And you set it up as a formal experiment. You've got a baseline. You've got your experimental case. You've set out your hypothesis. You run it. You, you figure out what the measures are for, um, uh, for success on that hypothesis. And then you go through a peer review process. If you think this is a model improvement, it goes to various working groups and committees who have to check it over before it can get accepted into the next version of the model. So also a slow, cautious development process. I've never attempted to measure this, but I bet you lines of code per person day is much lower than commercial software. Um, Narrow usage profile. This is software that's largely used only within the community. You don't kind of release it and let everybody else in the world go and install it on whatever crazy machines they've got installed with whatever kinds of software it has to interact with, which is, of course, what gives you all those weird corner cases that cause software to crash. Um, there's, other, there's also this idea that many of the possible errors you can make in a climate model are either obvious or they're irrelevant. They're obvious because you can't get a stable run. So of course you have to fix those errors or you can get a stable run, but it's completely implausible uh, um, um, from a physics perspective. You have to fix those errors. So you're not going to release a model that has errors like that in it. And then if it if it's an error that allows the model to run for a stable simulation over decades of simulation time and give you a reasonable climate, then the error is so small, it doesn't matter. We know the models are always uh, imperfect versions of the real world. So errors that don't affect the climatology in the model and allow you to run the stable, other, basically we, we said maybe they are acceptable imperfections along with all the imperfections that we know are in the models anyway. Okay. All right, so let me, um, oh yeah, plenty of time. Let me walk through what I saw as a whole bunch of those other layers of Swiss cheese in that perhaps partly explain this uh, low defect rate um, and uh, partly kind of shine a light on some of these practices. So um, as I said, I wove through this chapter, um, um, my uh, observations when I was in Hamburg. So here is kind of laid out, I interviewed a whole bunch of folks from the ICON team. I did this work actually in 2010, just when Maybe I should say a little bit about what the ICON model was. So this was a new project started in 2001 to build um, an icosahedral dynamical core. It took them about 10 years to really get that dynamical core working. And I arrived in 2010 just as it had passed all its first tests and they'd ramped up the team. They doubled the size of the team working on the project that year. And we're now starting to couple it to build a full Earth system model. So I kind of arrived at an interesting point and I quizzed them all about their testing strategies. And, and it basically, you know, you'll see this in any climate modeling lab. It's a whole series of different tests, starting out with very simple controlled tests where you've got a known solution, like the shallow water test and so on. Um, baroclinic wave test is interesting. You run uh, a, um, a version of the dynamical core with a stable atmosphere and you inject one disturbance in that atmosphere where you have a reference solution for how the waves are supposed to propagate and you're supposed to see a series of cyclones form uh, if the model is doing it correctly and they the icon team had that set up as an automated test every time they changed the code they would rerun that test to check that they hadn't messed up that that basic simulation i know we're going to talk later today about bit reproducibility tests so maybe i'll skip over those um, um, Comparisons with the reference model, they used, uh, um, they used. Um, oh, now I'm blanking on the name. My Hamburg colleagues remind me what the what the other model at Hamburg is. Uh, not Hamburg, huh? Ecam, yeah, Ecam, Ecam. I don't know how you pronounce it. They used Ecam as the reference model. Um, so you'd run you'd run the experiment in Ecam, then you'd run it in Icon, and you'd compare the results. And it wasn't that the results are supposed to be identical because there's fundamental differences between those two models, but the differences should be explicable in terms of how the dynamical cores are different. So you've got the kind of you've got you've got this continuous reference solution for for what's supposed to happen in this model. Once you've kind of gone through all of that, then the, they were doing. In fact, uh, the year before I got there, they were doing aquaplanet tests, remove all the oceans just to sorry, move all the all the 
continents just to a uh, full ocean model and see if that behaves in sensible ways, then start to couple in the land surface and so on. And then you start doing uh, hindcasts. So um, run it over the 20th century and see if you can reproduce um, observed warming for known forcings and so on. So you're kind of walking through this simplest tests to more complex tests over a series of years. So this is a multi-year operation to, to go through all of this process to get the correct model. Um, oh, I should have had this slide earlier. This is why I was talking about this a little bit earlier. This notion then that with all the models, you set up every change to the model as a hypothesis test. So you start out with, okay, here's something the model's getting wrong. We know it's getting wrong. Kind of the whole community talks about it. Uh, let's develop a hypothesis for why the model's getting that thing wrong and make a change to the model that we think either will correct it completely, or usually that's impossible, but make the model a little better on that one thing that we're focusing on run an experiment with a baseline. The baseline might just be the previous version of the model, but you've got your, your, your baseline case, your experimental case, interpret the results, and then there's always a peer review process before that gets accepted back into a new baseline of the model, or, you know, didn't work, so go back, try another hypothesis. That's, that's the basic scientific process, right? Imagine if Microsoft approached code development in that way. You're not allowed to change the code in the Microsoft products unless you set up a scientific experiment with a hypothesis stated up front of what your change is gonna do <laughs> and then put it through peer review after you've, uh, after you've run the test. Um, yeah. Uh, so here's another layer of the, the Swiss cheese and I talk about this in a, a little bit in the book. Um, acknowledging the errors. So um, that, NASA case study, I said, when that um, uh, spacecraft was on its way to Mars, they didn't acknowledge any of the errors. They realized something was going wrong. They didn't acknowledge them. What's unusual about the climate science community, not only they acknowledge the errors, they publish them. So here's another story from Hamburg um, with ECAM, um, the version of ECAM that was submitted for the CMIP-5 um, uh, model into comparison project had several very significant errors in it. One relates to these melt pools on the sea ice. So what they'd realized before CMIP-5 was that uh, their model, actually it was, it was true of all of the models in CMIP-3, that none of them were getting the rate of melting of um, Arctic sea ice uh, as fast as it was actually observed to be happening. So they were all kind of not quite getting how fast that ice is melting under um, uh, things like the 20th century run. And one of the hypotheses for why, so that previous diagram I showed you, one of the hypotheses why the model's getting that wrong is that it's not ab ab adequately capturing the effect of these melt pools on the ice. So when the ice starts to melt, you get these ponds forming on the surface of the ice. And that immediately changes the albedo of the ice. So it kicks off a little feedback loop. So the, the ice under the ponds will melt faster than the ice that's still white. And um, melt ponds are too small to capture in the model, they're, they're tiny compared to the, the grid, so you can't directly simulate them. So this is a parameterization in the model. And there was a very, very simple parameterization in the model that's basically just same melt pond under the same temperature condition, no matter what. But one thing we know is that melt ponds behave differently on old ice versus new, new ice. Old ice, multi-year multi ice tends to be a lot thicker. And so melt ponds develop differently. So what they've done for the CMIP-5 version of ECAM is put in a new parameterization scheme for the melt ponds that was supposed to give a better representation of how the ice melts, better representation of how melt ponds actually work and therefore um, capture that melting process better. Submitted all of their runs to CMIP repository and afterwards realized that in all of those runs, that new parameterization scheme had been turned off. <laughs> so. So it wasn't actually in the model in all the runs they submitted to IPCC. What do they do? They don't quietly push it under the rug. They publish a paper that describes not just what the error was, but then they went and did a whole bunch of experiments to say, okay, we fixed the bug. Does fixing the bug change anything else about the climatology of the model that might affect any conclusions that have been drawn about ECAM in, in the literature in the CMIP-5 process? And basically what they showed in all those experiments is 
for, for virtually everything else to do with the climate of planet Earth, it makes no difference at all. It does get very slightly the warming of the ice a little better, sorry, the melting of the ice a little better. It doesn't fully uh, get up to where uh, 20th century observed uh, melting actually was. It gets them closer. So basically what they showed in that paper was, yes, that you know, uh, fixing that error did give them what they expected it to give them in the first place, and it wouldn't have affected any of the other results in the CMIP5 repository. It's all la laid out there in a published paper. Brilliant. This is an important slice of Swiss cheese. The community acknowledges its errors. All right. Then I get philosophical. Um, so what does correctness actually mean? And um, I'm sure most of you know that famous paper from 1992 or by Naomi Oreskes, uh, uh, if I remember the title of the paper, Verification, Validation, and uh, Confirmation, oh. I think, of Climate Models, in which she basically says, we, we get these terms wrong. Actually, the software community uses verification and validation in a very different way from the English language meanings anyway. And the software community is actually confused about the difference between verification and validation. And you see it in published papers. Um, when I was at NASA, I would argue with people to say, forget trying to define verification and validation as two different things. The whole point is that there's a systemic set of activities that you do to establish verification and validation of your software. And don't worry about the distinction. Anyway, people always worry about the distinction. So what Oreskes argues in that paper is that you cannot verify a climate model because a climate model, and in fact, any scientific model is a, is a simplification of the real world. So there's no, no such thing as a climate model being true. And that's the root of the word verification is, is truth. You can never say it's true. It's not true. It's a simplification. It does not match the real world, and it does not match the real world for important reasons. Wouldn't be usable uh, if it matched the real world. <laughs> um, so right now, we all know about Karl Popper, um, who, who basically kind of set the scene for 20th century philosophy of science by saying scientists don't prove their theories to be true. They attempt to disprove them. And in fact, for, for Popper, the idea of is it scientific is, is there a route to refuting the theory? Is there a test that in principle would refute this theory? And if you can't think of any such test, it's not a scientific theory. So, so, so to Popper, that was the, the crucial notion of what makes something scientific, this, this idea that in principle you could refute it, and then you run the experiments to see if you really did refute it. Unfortunately, <laughs> strict interpretation of Popper's idea doesn't get us anywhere because every scientific theory pretty much has been refuted in one form or another. So the classic example is Newton's laws. Um, Newton's laws were refuted by Einstein in his theory of relativity. So um, and one of the ways this plays out is um, there, were, there were observed anomalies in the orbit of Mercury around the sun that Newton's laws cannot explain. And it wasn't until Einstein came along with his theory of re relativity that perfectly explained those anomalies. And I don't know enough about orbital mechanics to tell you exactly what the anomalies were, but basically Einstein came along and, and explained them. So what that means is Newton is wrong, Einstein is right. What should we do? Throw out Newton's theory. It's been refuted according to Popper. We don't do that. We do not throw out theories because they have problems. Same with models. We don't throw out models because they have problems matching the real world. So it's back to that quote by George Box, which I use several times in the, in the book. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And the same is true of scientific theories. All scientific theories are wrong, but some are useful. That, that quote is perhaps less popular. <laughs> I, have to, I have to defend that a little bit more. Anyway, so what I focus on instead is a later philosopher. Actually, um, Lakatos was um, one of Popper's students for a while, uh, learned a lot from Popper, and eventually realized doesn't agree with Popper's approach to philosophy. He said, in all of the scientific work I've observed, what you see is a core body of theory that's immune to refutation. It's established scientific theory, and nobody in that research community is going to attempt to refute it. They just accept it as true. And then what they have is this protective layer around it of kind of ancillary hypotheses that tell you how that theory is connected to the real world. 
And when, when the theory doesn't explain something, you don't change the theory, you change those ancillary hypotheses. You change how you're applying the theory to the world. Um, so in terms of Newton's, uh, Newton's laws, um, the way that plays out is we say, look, Newton's, work, Newton's laws work most of the time, and here's all the places that they work. Here's how you take Newton's laws and you turn them into calculations for orbital mechanics for planets. And here are all the circumstances under which that works, and here are the places where it's going to get you into trouble because you're at, the, uh, at a scale where uh, relativity matters, for example. And so you've adjusted the ancillary hypotheses that connect the, the theory to the data. You don't change the theory. You don't throw out the theory. And so Lakatos says, OK, then how do we know if it's scientific if you're not using Popper's approach for uh, refutation? And he says it's wrong to think about it scientific, something being scientific at the level of an individual theory. You have to focus on a, a program of research. And if that program of research is continuing to progress, by adjusting those ancillary hypotheses and therefore able to make more and more correct predictions over time, that's a scientific program of research. If it's regressing, if it's able to make fewer and fewer correct predictions as it tinkers with its ancillary hypotheses, then it's not scientific. Okay, and for him, that's what being scientific meant. It wasn't at the level of an individual theory, it's at the level of a whole program of study. Okay, why is that important? Because that's exactly what we do with climate models. What's a climate model? It's a set of core theory, like the dynamic, a lot of the work in the dynamical core, for example, and the basic radiation code that we just know is correct. and We're never going to fix it. What we do is we fix the parameterizations. So the parameterization schemes in the model are effectively Lakatos's protective shell that protect the core of the model. And it's the, it's the, uh, parameterization schemes where we know there's an empirical component and we adjust those. And, and as long as then we're continuing to make good predictions at the models and uh, more and more correct predictions, we're still being scientific. It doesn't matter that we're not really probing on a continuous basis those core theories. What matters is that by going through that process of adjusting those parameterizations, coming out with better and better models and, and making correct predictions, we're still being scientific. Um, here's another paper by Christian Jacob, um, which basically says the same thing of what I've observed. There's this cycle of, you know, you take the model, you apply it in various cases, um, weather, weather prediction, seasonal forecasting, climate forecasting, and so on. Uh, you do an overall assessment. You might do some model tuning, and we'll get to model tuning in a little bit. But more interestingly, there's this loop by which we do these process studies. We go out and observe in the real world, we collect more data about the process that where the model doesn't match, and we use that to design model improvements and put those back into the model. So there's this continual cycle by multiple communities to find out the model weaknesses, collect more data from the real world, think about how to improve the representation of that process in the model, and feed that back into a model improvement. Um, shall I talk about model tuning? Uh, very, maybe very quickly. Model tuning is done nearly everywhere. There's some controversy about whether it should be done. Um, and for those of you that don't know what model tuning is, here's one very quick exa example. Um, and this is the GFDL model. So the gray lines here are the CMIP5 ensemble, and the black is the observation. So that's the Hadcrut surface temperature data. So this is um, surface temperature anomaly, uh, actually, uh, yeah, two meters above the ground, basically surface temperature. Um, and the, the version of the GFDL model that's in the CMIP5 repository is the one there shown in green. As you can see, particularly over the end of that period, it's one of the coolest models. It's, it's too cool compared to the rest of the ensemble and compared to the observational data. What do you do about that? Well, you tune the model to get better 20th century performance. In this case, they've tweaked the, one of the parameters for um, cloud, actually it's ice crystals forming in clouds, where you know there's so much uncertainty in, in the exact uh, microphysics of, of cloud and ice formation. And they've tweaked it in two, two ways, one push it in one direction, one push it in the other direction. And they show just by changing this one parameter, you can push the simulation up 
to almost exactly match the mean of the ensemble and the observations, or you can push it in the other direction and make it even worse. So one, one single parameter in the model can determine whether you're, yeah, we're basically getting the 20th century right, or no, we're way off, we're too cool. Um, the problem with model tuning is it takes a huge amount of work to first of all, isolate parameters that would do that for you, and then to do all the runs over and over again to do that. So you can't tune every parameter in the model. There's, there's thousands of them. Um, you can maybe at best tune a handful where we have the most uncertainty. And then there's the question of what do we tune to? Um, and this paper here uh, talks about uh, the art and science of climate model tuning basically says, in most of the climate model labs, they only tune basically to two things. One is reproduce the 20th century um, warming, observed warming from the known forcings. And the other is to get the top of the air, top of the atmosphere energy balance right. And, and that's pretty much the only things that, that um, uh, climate models are tuned to. Um, another layer of the Swiss cheese is relying on ensembles rather than individual model runs. So uh, increasingly, now that we have the computational power to do this, you don't use a single deterministic run of a model. You use ensembles with varied, inter varied initial conditions um, to give you the uncertainty spread in the model, because we know um, the ability to, re to reproduce observations depends to some extent on what your start state is. And different start states, especially with multi-year multi cycles like ENSO, um, use the wrong start state, and of course, you're not going to quite get uh, the pattern of how that plays out over time. Um, we can come back to that. All right, so according to Lakatos, then, we're being scientific if we're making correct predictions. So then I spend a piece of this chapter talking about all the successful predictions that climate modelers have made over the years, starting from the very early work in the 1950s, um, actually, this one's not a model prediction. Maybe this doesn't belong there, but I, it, it, it blew my mind when I saw it. So this is a prediction from, oh gosh, now I've forgotten. Um, see, when I have PowerPoint, I have my notes here and I can, I can cheat. Um, whose work is this? Uh, I can look in the book. Um, it's, the ocean, it's the oceanographers who first realized that the uptake of carbon in the surface waters of the ocean was much slower than everybody thought because the over ocean overturning circulation pattern is much slower than everybody thought. So in other words, the, um, um, in the 1950s, there was this big uh, 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 debate that, you know, well, carbon emissions don't matter because the ocean will just absorb them. And then several papers published in the same year demonstrated, nope, that's not gonna work. And in one of those papers, they published this paper. So the black you can see on here is the, the diagram from that paper, photocopied directly from the paper, which is why it's all uh, uh, juddery, where they used their analysis of the ocean waters to project future changes of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And I've overlaid on that um, the Keeling curve uh, as to what actually happened. So um, the top curve there is they said, this is what we expect to see from burning of fossil fuels if the trends continue. And here's we, the, the portion of that that we expect to stay in the atmosphere. And beautiful, it was spot on. Um, really good prediction. All right, let's talk about model predictions because that's really what we're focusing on. So here is um, Sekiro Manabi's work in 1967. I said he was the first person to get that vertical structure of the atmosphere right and therefore do plausible uh, model studies of um, things like um, warming for double CO2 with the correct greenhouse effect in the model. Um, this is uh, um, a couple of diagrams out of his paper showing, he, he was the crucial insight in his paper. He showed if the warming is from the sun, let's say the, the solar constant changes, you get uniform warming throughout the height of the atmosphere. So basically the whole curve just shifts. If it's warming from the greenhouse effect, you get warming in the lower atmosphere, you can just about see it there, and substantial cooling in the upper atmosphere. And that's the footprint of greenhouse gas warming. Nobody realized this at the time. This was the first, per, first paper to show that you would get that inversion. You get cooling in the stratosphere, warming in the troposphere, and it took till about the year 2000 before we had adequate satellite measures 
to actually realize that that is correct. That is exactly what we've observed. Warming in the, in the lower atmosphere, cooling in the upper atmosphere. So a prediction made uh, more than 30 years before we had the measurements to actually demonstrate that that was true. Um, Manabi also then went on to run his model um, to do uh, a, a, a basically um, a projection for climate change. And his actually his run is really hard to see on this chart. It's the pale blue. You can see it just stopping. I'm not allowed to touch this, right? You can see it just stopping there in the year 2000. And the black, of course, is observations. He's spot on. So this is a model run in 1967, 68, published in 1970 where he was able to predict almost exactly the warming that we would get over the remainder of the 20th century. Um, in fact, all the other runs on here were, I would call them correct predictions, except for one, and that's Rassel and Schneider. People know about the story about Rassel and Schneider's model? Okay, they didn't have the stratosphere in their model. They cut off the atmosphere too low. So there's no stratosphere in that model. Well, of course, it's not getting the right result. It's not capturing the full greenhouse effect. So, and actually, uh, Schneider realized a few years after that, that was a huge mistake in their model, fix that, and, and then um, uh, they were able to produce correct predictions after that. So, all right, there's a whole history of correct predictions from these climate models. Um, here's Jim Hansen's 1988 predictions compared to reality. Oh, and of course, the big problem here is the forcing is not what actually happened. So the forcings that they use to drive these models are not what happened in reality. The, the most interesting thing I see on here, um, reading up about these, is one of the big things that happened in the early 1990s. Um, where's my observations? Observations are in blue. Um, early 1990s, that big drop was a volcano. What was a volcano in 1992? Um, Pinatubo, yeah, okay, good. Um, so that that you can see is Pinatubo. Pinatubo is not in Hansen's model. But interestingly, he realized volcanoes matter. And actually, he did put a volcano in his model in 1995. Know, in, actually, know. not in the black run, but in the two dotted run. And it's almost the same as the drop from Pinatubo. He's just guessed the wrong year for when this volcano would go off. All right. But he's got the reaction to volcanoes correct. Beautiful, right? A correct prediction. Um, right. Last few minutes of the talk. Um, lovely saying. I, I believe this is attributed to the Swiss army. I have no idea if it's true or not. When the map and the territory disagree, believe the territory. Um, There are plenty of cases in climate science where when the models and the data disagree, it's the data that are wrong. And this is really important. OK, so here's an example. This is um, uh, one of the early uh, Hadley, uh, Hadcrut data sets of surface temperature. So on the top there, you've kind of got the raw uh, data for surface global surface temperature. And then underneath it are two um, multi-year cycles that are clearly in there. So what you do is you take that temperature set and you kind of want to extract the um, the climate change warming from that, a, a global a greenhouse warming. So you subtract ENSO and you subtract, I can't remember what Cowell is now. Uh, it's another one of those um, multi-year cycles. And what you get at the bottom is the signal after you've removed those cycles. And here we see in the year 1945, a really dramatic drop in temperatures. And the models don't reproduce that. So this is, this. by the way, this is an old story. This is from uh, early 2000s. None of the models would reproduce that drop in temperature in 19, 1945, given all the information that we knew about the forcings over the 20th century. And it was a big mystery. Why weren't the models able to capture that uh, observed drop in temperature? Uh, until uh, Thompson comes along and says, there's something wrong with the data. And uh, he went over to um, um, the UK on a sabbatical, um, looked at where this temperature is coming from. And he says, I think it's to do with ocean, ocean temperatures. And I think there's an error in how these data sets are being put together. Does the investigation, goes and asks all the people where this data came from and realizes, of course, that certainly for the early part of the 20th century, most of our data on ocean surface temperatures are taken from ships 
where they would do one of two things. They'd get a sailor to throw a bucket over the side, pull it up, stick a, stick a thermometer in it, record the temperature in the logbook with the location, and at the end of the journey, those logbooks would all be sent off and used to compile these data sets. Or you'd have a thermometer at the engine intakes and you'd measure the water coming in at the engine intakes, okay? What was happening is during the Second World War, over the course of the five years of the Second World War, British shipping went from completely dominant, the British Merchant Navy was completely dominant in shipping up to 1939, and it basically ground to a halt over the course of the war. So over the course of the war, most of the ships submitting these measurements are American ships. At the end of the war, that British uh, uh, shipping resumes and those ships go out again. The British ships were using buckets and the American ships were using the engine intakes. So it's a data bias problem because over the course of the war, we've got spurious warming because we're shifting entirely to these American shipping. And at the end of the war, you've got that sudden resumption of the British ships. Um, and if you correct for that, that anomaly disappears. So the models got it right and the data was wrong. And there's plenty more stories like that. Let me give you one more and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, there was a whole discussion in the climate science literature from about 2010 to about 2015 about the warming hiatus. Uh, newspapers loved this story. Global warming has stopped. The climate scientists are wrong. And if you take 1998 as your baseline year, 1998 was a, was a huge El Nino year, so the warmest year on record up to that point. And if you take that as your baseline, over the next 10 or 15 years, it kind of looks like warming did stop in the temperature records. And there's a whole set of papers, there's, there's like 50 papers published on the warming hi hiatus in that period of time, trying to understand why the models weren't capturing it. And... What was going on, of course, was the data was wrong. So there really only was one data set, and that's the Hadcrut um, 4 data set, was showing um, basically flat temperatures, global temperatures over that 15 year period from 1998. All the others showed some warming. What was happening is that Hadcrut had lots of missing data from the poles, and we know the poles are where we get the most warming anyway. And so their interpolation method to cover the poles was giving them a spurious uh, um, result of no warming over that period. When Hadcrut 5 was published, and this is kind of a representation of the Hadcrut 4 temperature or the Hadcrut 5, they used a different method to fill in the polar regions. And you can kind of straight away see it on the heat map here. It's a lot warmer uh, in those polar regions. And you can just about see the correction on there. We've got Hadcrut 4 in blue, and we've got Hadcrut 5 in red. It corrected, it results in a warmer signal over that period of time, and it means basically global warming did not stop over that period of time. It carried on, and it was the data that was wrong and the models that were right. Um, so I love these stories because the whole practice of data collection in this community is a massive exercise the, what we think of as raw observational data is not raw observational data. It's passed through all sorts of models itself. And there's plenty of opportunity for error to creep in on those. So when we start thinking about data as a ground truth to test the models, we're fooling ourselves. The errors might be in either. All right, I, I see I'm getting the signal, so it's time to stop. Um, all right, so... Um, I don't know if I imparted any wisdom, but you know, it's a good place to stop for Q&A. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience? I enjoyed the talk. I was wondering whether AI-based surrogate models have any hope for getting things right. <laughs> I hope we're gonna talk about that over the next two days. Um, so here's my worry. The AI models don't do any of the practices that I talked about this morning. So, for example, that careful sequence of, of uh, incremental testing, building up the model piece by piece and, and subjecting it to more and more rigorous testing. The AI models, certainly what I've seen, uh, especially if we're talking about Google and NVIDIA, their work on um, um, short-term and uh, medium-term weather forecasting, that's not what they do. 
what they do is they train the model on the data. And, and there's a whole problem about what data are we actually training the model on based on what I was just talking about? What are the problems in that data? And then they release a model and they show it, it has amazing skill, especially over this past year. It's been phenomenal, that growth in skill in those forecast models. But none of the practices that I described are being used. And that's really worrying. So how do we know those models are correct? Or not so much are they correct, but they've got full good forecasting skill. You can say, yeah, they're good, but are, are there cases where they're going to fail spectacularly that we don't know about yet? And they haven't been built up in that way. So I think it's a huge worry. And I know nothing about how to solve that problem, but it's a really important question. <laughs> Any other questions? None online. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Thanks. Oh, one question online. Uh, hello, am I coming through? Yes, absolutely. Uh, hi, so, yeah, I just had a, maybe, maybe uh, I, I don't know what to call it, um, but I was, I'm very, I've, I've seen this claim I remember this claim you've mentioned before this paper you wrote about um, how climate models have incredible, uh, lo incredibly low bug counts relative to other models. Yeah. And I, I know you kind of hedged a great, a large number of categories. And I think my comment surely falls in one of them. But I, I always wondered if our definition of bug is incredibly different from most other software projects. I mean, in particular, you know, we spend a lot of time fixing pointer bugs, you know, just things that kind of hit hit memory badly that 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 happen. But I think in climate, we would never really classify that as a bug. Like maybe we would find it and maybe we would fix it, maybe not. But it, it's sort of, I sort of wonder how, how can we possibly um, redefine that metric in a way that sort of puts us, that lets us compare ourselves to these other larger projects. Do you think there's any way to um, renormalize the, those statistics or change how we gather those statistics? Do you think maybe now that so many projects are tracked in GitHub that maybe we will see a shift in those kind of trends now that we're kind of getting larger users out of nowhere and more bugs and things like that? Yeah, actually, the last thing you said there, bigger user base, that I think will make a difference. Hard to say how that will, that will uh, project. But let me just say a little bit about how John did that study. So the operational definition of a bug that's used in the, the software literature on this when they're measuring defect density is that anything that needed to be fixed. If it didn't need to be fixed, it's not a bug. So what he's done is he's gone through essentially the GitHub repositories for those models. He got access to the entire change log for those models, all of the issue tracking system for those models. In open source software, that's all public anyway. Um, for, the, for those models, he got hold of it all. And what he's looking at is every change that was made to the code over that period of time. And then he's classified, is this a new feature or is it fixing an error? And if it's fixing an error, that's his definition of a bug. So basically, and this is how it's done in commercial software measurements as well. If it had to be fixed, it's an error. If it didn't have to be fixed, it's something else and it's not counted. So the metric he's applying in that sense is identical to what's being used in commercial software to do this kind of analysis. And that's interesting, but I don't think that entirely answers your question because this community uh, regards different things that need fixing. I think that's where you're getting at. There are different things that this community regards as, yes, we have to fix versus, no, we can live with that. We'll just ignore it. Um, and, and, I, and I think that does affect it. And so what I, I'd love to see some follow-up studies that really drill down to that and say, well, how different are our operational definitions of errors and what needs fixing? And how much does that explain some of these observations? Cool. Yeah, actually, I think what I'm more concerned about is that we might pat ourselves on the back and tell us what great yeah. software engineers we are. And yeah. then we're going to go around and talk to other people uh, in other disciplines and tell them how bad their code is. Yeah, I, I agree and completely. If we took our code and gave it to them, they might find an order of magnitude number more of problems. Yeah, in yeah, it's possible. And that's why basically half of that paper we spent describing why we didn't believe our own results. Um, 
<laughs> and and because we were for exactly that reason, what we didn't want to do was say, hey, yeah, we've cracked it. Um, what we want to say is what we wanted to say in that paper is here's a really interesting preliminary result. If it's true, it's really interesting, but we're not sure that we have enough data yet to to argue it is true. Okay, um, we're pretty much out of time. Right. I see Aaron's got his hand raised. Do you have a quick question, Aaron? I don't know how quick, but in in my mind, there's a distinction between. Uh, programming errors and modeling errors. I didn't see that distinction in your talk. Is that even a meaningful distinction for you? Um, yes, I think it is. Um, and um, so so when I talked about in that paper, we talked about acceptable imperfections. And, and in many cases, those are modeling errors. Um, although sometimes there might be software errors, but software errors that just aren't big enough uh, to cause a problem. Um, I, we, we didn't make that distinction in the paper, in that particular paper, largely because we were just applying that industry metric that says if it needed to be fixed, it was an error. And, and that kind of captures some of both kinds of the errors that you're talking about. And we, so we deliberately didn't make that distinction. Um, I think it is worth uh, a probe. I think it's a really interesting distinction, but I don't really have a lot to say about it because it's not one that we've, uh, that we've investigated in any depth. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to cut off questions here. Steve will be around all day today and tomorrow, and I'm sure would be happy to answer more questions. So our next speaker is Tom Kloon. He is from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Hello? Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. So I certainly don't even intend to impart any wisdom here. Um, I'm not even quite entirely sure exactly where I'm going with this talk. If nothing else, it's probably just a prod to myself to do better on this front. But I can tell my journey and maybe inspire others or more likely learn from others about how to avoid some of the problems that I'll be facing. Um, there we go. All right, so a bit of background and motivation. So I now work with a model called Geos, which some of you may know. It's a very highly configurable Earth system model, a little bit more on the weather end of the spectrum than the climate spectrum, but it certainly does things, dabbles a little bit in both directions. And I'm not going to even touch on the data assimilation side of this, which is an important part of the GMAO business, I'm really going to talk about from the model perspective. Uh, the architecture of the system is a hierarchical system of modular components built on top of ESMF. Um, basically, GEOS was completely rewritten from the ground up about 25, 20 years ago. Max Suarez, who's now retired, led an effort to sort of re just completely redo the way that the model was constructed and make it these little atomic pieces that we can build together to build different kinds of systems. And he pushed that very, very hard, and he was very, very successful in, design in making this happen. Um, the, the coupling works, and it's based upon using just a handful of standardized ESMF abstract data types. There's states, fields field bundles and geometries. There's a few other things out there, but if you capture those, you can basically describe the interfaces of all these components in a way that anybody else can understand what's going on. Each one of these components has an import state and an export state, which from a functional point of view, you can think of as the inputs and the outputs with some caveats. Um, and there's optionally an internal state for components. Uh, then the part that I want to bring into this picture is there's an infrastructure layer called Maple. It leverages ESMF to a large degree, but it allows us to intercept various things that the scientists are doing and enforce certain conventions before we actually drill down into the ESMF layer. So we sort of have a very high level mechanism to ensure that we all allocate the fields that people want, uh, the states. Uh, we um, form the connections between the components and we do automated checkpoint restart. Uh, this maple layer is supported by what we call the software infrastructure team. I'm the lead of the software infrastructure team. On a good day, we spend our time developing and maintaining maple, but uh, we also develop and maintain the CI tests that are used when we do GitHub pull requests, and we help scientists troubleshoot weird errors. So when I think about what gets me up in the morning, what brings me joy in my work, there's sort of this, this scale. Um, at the top, I like to write new code. It's really great. I, I have to show it to anybody yet. I can write it. I can have fun figuring out how, what's the best way to do this, okay? It's also not so bad to modify reasonably clean code, which usually means my own code, but I'll be fair. 
It's, it can be other people's code. Writing unit tests with the proper kind of interfaces, a unit test can be okay. It's not as much fun, but it can be useful. Um, debugging clean code. Okay, so I, I say my own code, but that's really not fair. Clean code. If somebody's got a really clean procedure and we find a bug, that's not so bad to debug. But then we get down to other categories. Debugging legacy code. And here the definition of legacy code is code that does not have tests that I pick up from Michael Feathers. Um, now it's really, really hard to know exactly what's wrong. And especially since this is probably typically not like a small subroutine with like four arguments, it's probably 100, 200 lines with 50 arguments. And finding a bug in there and knowing whether or not it broke something else just takes some joy away, even if I think I know what I'm doing. Um, sometimes you also have to modify. You're not trying to fix, you're just trying to wedge in a little more code into some very, very complicated thing. You're not sure you broke something else. And then where I spend way too much of my time these days, but it's not really what the talk's about, but it's humorous, is finding workarounds in other software. Sometimes you can't change the software. I mean, I find bugs in compilers all the time because I keep on pushing advanced features in Fortran. And you spend your time second guessing, well, what did the compiler probably do wrong here? So how could I change my code to make this work? How could I even try to figure out how to make a small reproducer instead of giving them the entire model, say it's broken, fix it. You know, they, they don't like that. Okay. So fortunately, as I'm coming into this, between the time I wrote the abstract and today, a couple of you know terrible stories crossed my path, and I've got people on my team working on these. Um, so this first one is a defect that you can see the imprint of domain decomposition. It's not an imprint of the grid, although this is a coarse decomposition, so you might see a little bit of the cube sphere there too, but you see these funny edges somewhere, and I don't have a laser pointer, probably for that can come point. You see a sort of a funny edge here. Um, yeah, anyways. Yeah, it's, it's probably not worth it. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So yeah, you can you can see a few of them there. The, up the top picture is quote right, and the bottom one's wrong. Um, but it's a very weak signal. It only shows up in some obscure uh, uh, quantities. I don't even know what ice water path means. Um, if you go try to look at this in temperature, for instance, you're just not going to see a signal there. Um, it's not in our default physics yet, but this is the new parameterization for the moist physics that we'd like to include in the model. And they can't because this, it doesn't, it's not that it produces bad results, it's that we just know it's wrong. So this goes back to verification versus validation. Forget validation, it's verification wrong. We're not gonna throw it into the system in this state. Okay, not to mention the fact it doesn't pass a layout regression tests because of this. So it's, it's, it's wrong in lots of ways that we care about. Um, lots of people have looked at this now. The scientists themselves, you know, figured it was a bug they did in their parameterization. They studied it for a while. They started roping in the best guy on my team for debugging. He worked on it for a while off and on. It got burned out, came back and helped me on another project, went and did some more. And then he went on a five-week vacation that he absolutely deserved, but it meant that no one was working on it again. Well, it became, a, then the head of the modeling said, this is important. We got to have somebody working on it. So I ramped up my second best debugging person and he's now working on it. The other guy is now back. And so he's going to have on his plate to help this guy. We don't know what's going on here. We, we really don't. It goes away with lots of different things. And so we, we think it's probably a compiler bug, not that that excuses us. We still have to find out why and work around it. This one's a little bit friendlier. This one came up a little bit after that. Here, the defect is simply that uh, we have we failed the layout regression tests. The problem is that we failed the layout regression test only at high resolution. Our CI tests currently are running at about 200 kilometer resolution. And this passed layout regression for months. And then somebody in my group that was trying to develop a new layer accidentally discovered this, thought it was something he had done. And by the time he boiled it down, he found it, you know, the models had this since release such and such several months ago. So of course the people on my team are saying, oh, there's a simple solution to this. We should just run our CI regression test at higher resolution. I'm like, no, that's not, that's not the answer here. There's always gonna be a resolution that you can't test. Let's find out what's wrong. And we're gonna learn something interesting, I think here. Here, the problem is these are just round off. And if you compare different layouts, the, where these little dots that are let round off different appear change, but they're roughly in the same region. So we know there's probably some physics process that's um, more active in these regions, but it's just round off. Again, I'm starting to think probably compiler bug here, but or, 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 or not even compiler bug here, maybe something very sensitive to memory layout where it does some optimization differently and causes uh, uh, order of operations, there's a cache or something to change, except that happens even with O0. All right, so those are motivating me, although at the end of the day, the testing I'm gonna talk about maybe doesn't address either one of these. Okay, so what are the tests we already do have? All right, so we do system tests, right? What do we do the system test? We take the whole system, we hit it with a hammer and see if it breaks, right? Um, does it build, does it run? These are great things. So scientists should have already done this before they do a push, a, a, a pull request into the system, but they don't always test with the other compiler. They don't always test with all the debugging flags. So this is something that we do to make sure that they're, you know, all those things work. G Fortune, Intel compile with and without debug. 
Then we check restart reproducibility. Can we run for a day, run for another day? And is that the same result as running for two days? Absolutely necessary. We don't let changes go in if that doesn't happen. And then there's layout reproducibility. Can we chop up the grid in two different ways and get the exact same results? Absolutely essential, usually trivial. Almost all of our code is column physics. It should trivially pass this capability. And yet the two bugs I just showed you a minute ago. But well, to be fair, one of them never made it through uh, uh, CI testing. Uh, and then of course we do regression testing. This is a little bit different. We don't fail a regression test. We don't fail a, a pull request because it doesn't get the same results as yesterday. That merely means that it gets a higher level of human review at another at another level. But we do tell whether or not it changed the results from yesterday. And that's not done through the GitHub. That's done with nightly regression scripts because that's more expensive to do all of those. What kind of things do we learn when the test, these kind of test fails? Well, not very much really, right? If it doesn't, if it crashes or it doesn't compile, you might get a line number out of file. But generally you just know that the results aren't what you wanted. It didn't give you uh, reproducibility. All right, all right, good luck, go find it. All right, uh, the pro of this kind of testing is that it's very good test coverage. It doesn't cover all the branches, but almost all of the code gets covered to some degree. And if we run multiple different configurations, you get better and better at the coverage. And it's relatively easy to maintain. If we're maintaining the ability for a person to be able to pick up the code and go run certain scenarios, maintaining the CI test to do that same thing is pretty easy. The bad, as I just mentioned, it doesn't really isolate the defects and it uses a fair bit of resources. So we don't even use regular free GitHub resources. We actually purchase some extra cycles from CircleCI so that we can run a little bit larger systems on a reliable basis. And we do have unit tests. Unit tests are great. Um, a unit test is something that tests basically a single procedure. You give it synthetic inputs and tell it what it should produce as an output and check to make sure that's what it did produce. Okay, when one of those tests fails, it's great. You know exactly which procedure failed. Maybe not where in that procedure, but you know that procedure that you were testing does not do what you expected it to do. Um, so it's great at isolating the defects. You know where it failed. It can run fast. If you're good at writing a unit tests, you can typically run thousands per second. So it's not a, compiling them takes a whole lot longer than running is basically what happens. The cons are, it's very hard to get good coverage, right? So I write unit testing as I develop our infrastructure layer most of the time. So the infrastructure new parts generally are well covered, but it's very hard to write unit tests for numerical code, very hard to write unit tests for parameterizations. I'm not pushing the scientists to go do that. They actually do have a few of them out there, but they've never really registered them in any sort of framework that we can actually produce in CI. So they generally have rotted and they're not useful after the fact. Um, and even if you did write unit tests for the kind of things, you have to maintain them. So it, it's hard for science that's changing to maintain the unit tests. All right, so that drives me to what I'd like to do beyond what we do today. And that's to have something where we do testing at the component level. And here we'd like to have some sort of standardized suite of tests that we can apply to every single component. We check that it's layout reproducible. We check to see whether or not it regresses to the same result that we got the day before. This sidesteps most of the weaknesses of system tests and unit tests. Um, collectively, if we're doing this for all of our components, then we've got very, very good coverage across the entire system. Uh, regression failures are at least now localized down to the component level, and we have something like 50 components, so that's a whole lot better than the whole system failing, uh, what, what you learn from that. And oops, sorry, it's resource efficient because we can just test those components that have changed, and oftentimes that means a smaller amount of data can be thrown at them. For the column physics, we can use very, very coarse grids. There's no reason to run anything other than a handful of columns to test the column physics. All right, so can we do something generically? Can we write something which will test these components in isolation and not have to modify it for each of the different components? So for starters, we're in good shape. All components have the same interface, great. Um, it should be, from that, we should be able to write a generic testing app. Right? It would expect some sort of initial import state. It would, it would also expect some sort of expected output state. It then runs the component and compares the export state that you got from the export state that you wanted and says, oh, these better be identical. And we can run it with different layouts and things like this. Okay. Well, how do we go and get these imports and exports? Well, you could go to the scientists developing their various different components and ask them to give, give you canonical imports and export states to be used for these kind of things. Um, some might respond in a useful way, but we can't rely on it and you'd have to maintain those over time. So we're not trying to pursue that. Instead, we're gonna try to capture these states from an actual execution of the full system. This puts it back under the control of my group where we can maintain these and if things get out of date, we can go update them ourselves. We're not reliant upon other people in order to maintain our testing capability. Um, we already have the ability to do state level checkpoint restarts, so it should be pretty straightforward to implement what I've described so far. Um, and the approach here is, is actually 
something that's been used in lots of tools over the years. Um, KGen is one from around here that I've used a few times down at the lower level Fortran interface. Um, we wanted to do this for a long time. Priority supports always get in the way. It's not the thing that's broken today. So, um, well, and I fortunately the spring an intern came along at a point where we were real interested in this, and she said, that, "Yeah, there'd be a project she wanted to work on," and so we went at it. Okay, so just to restate what I've said before, but a little bit more in pictures here. Uh, the gray bubble is designed to sort of suggest that a component is in isolation, and we know exactly what's going in and out of it. The component itself is run by its parent. We have this hierarchical system, right? So every given component is a child of some other component. That component runs it, but it does it by going through our infrastructure layer, and that gives us a lot of control. So the import state and the export state that get passed down to the child flow through the infrastructure layer, and that gives us the ability we can capture all of that before and after we run the component, send it to disk, um, and we have our database of results that we expect. So then we can write this generic driver and something went really funny here when it got converted. So those arrows didn't cross all over anything, but I don't think it's uh, terrible here. Uh, you have this generic driver sits upon this component now, not inside of the system, but now it's just all in, on its own. Maple reads the import from disk, runs the component, reads the expected import from disk and compares it to the found export state from disk and tells you what's changed. Okay, so in theory, this is quite straightforward. Um, just a very small number of changes we have to make in the system to make that possible. Now you might ask, what about for the non-leaf components? So for non-leaf components, um, we have our choice. I don't know why the diagram is not coming up here. Should be a picture here. Go all the way to the bottom. Okay, so yeah, some of the animations I did not go through very well. My apologies. Okay. Um, one possibility is just treat all the children as part of the component. With a hierarchical component, we can do that. In that sense, we could just simply ignore the issue. The problem there is when we get to very, very high level components, like we have a physics component that includes all of our different physics, it's practically a system. We're losing that locality that we're hoping to get out of the system. So the alternative, which is what I'd like to pursue, is we isolate the children. Ah, okay, at least that came through. We, each, we isolate the children, and instead, when we run component A, each of the children is then replayed as a mock data component. What I mean by that is we don't actually call that component. We just simply have the import and export. We only, we only need the export state from the child as it runs to feed in to pretend like that was the results that it modified in component A. All right. Um, there's another thing called callbacks, which is sort of a, a backdoor thing that we had ESMF add just for us. Um, same issues arise, but same approach. We want to try to maximize the locality we get out of this. All right, that's all great in theory, straightforward. If our components really look like I just described, we have this done, we'd be running it all the time. Okay, so this is the idealization, right? We have a component. It has an import at time n. We run the component, that's the function produces the export of that component at time t equal n plus one. Okay, great. But most of our components have an internal state. So that also has to be tracked and that changes as it runs. So we need to actually save the initial um, internal state and the final internal state. And if we have to then come check that final internal state, is it the one we actually expected when we save to run? That's fine, that still fits nicely within our framework, a minor tweak. Um, some of our components modify the import state. This is a bad thing we hope to fix in future versions, but there's a lot of shared data in order to avoid copies. So we have to actually track the import state before and after. Okay, fine, that's not one more thing. All of this is fine. Extending the machinery in this way is very straightforward. Well, then the problem is that the actual import state is not completely defined by the component itself, nor the export. Okay, I gotta go fast. Okay, so, ah, where did that go? So context matters. Some of the exports that we have in the model are optional. They're only allocated and computed if they've actually been wired into somebody else's imports. Well, when you run the component in isolation, it's not gonna have anybody using that export. So it's gonna say, I don't have that. So when the import state tries to read in, it's got nowhere to put that value for the comparison. Um, uh, some of our exports are re-exports from children. We have a way of bubbling things up. Well, the child doesn't have the specs for that though. It just says, oh, you've defined an export, I'll also add it to my state. Again, we don't have that information when we run the component in isolation. Um, some of our imports are, are elastic. We have a bundle of tracers. The component doesn't say what goes into that. It's the other components that register with Maple saying, I'd like to have this thing advected. That goes into the bundle. Uh, the parent component is allowed to modify the child's specs. It's allowed to come in and say, oh, you may have in your resource file said you wanted to run in this mode, but I'm gonna override you. I'm gonna make you run in this mode. Um, and there's IO. We're not about to intercept all of the IO and capture all that. So this is the stuff that makes this approach hard in practice, even though it's simple in principle. So where are we? So the intern nonetheless pursued this. We, some of this we anticipated, a lot we did not. The uh, intern was able to implement the very, very simple cases, make it all work. Uh, and 
Now we have to figure out where we're going to go from there. Um, what we hope to do is we're rewriting, rewriting Maple anyways for entirely different reasons. We're going to keep an eye on this. I'm going to try to see if we can isolate all these things that come into the component that control its state and capture that in a way that we can replay that as part of the regression testing framework itself. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions in the room or online? Oh, there is a question. Hi, Tom. Thanks for that really, really interesting talk. Uh, this sounds like a fantastic architecture. Um, so I was wondering about the kind of performance implications of this, because it, it, it involves you know, storing a lot to disk um, at the component interfaces. So how do you kind of do this in a way that, um, well, I guess the question is, does it scale well? And, and, and how do you kind of interface this with, with the idea of trying to get high performance runs? And yeah, how do you square that? Okay, so one of the things I didn't get to uh, uh, dive into here is most of these components are column physics. So even though we might run the system at, say, 50 kilometer resolution to capture the data, we can post facto um, distill just a handful of columns out of those components and use that modified data set to drive the component. Good. Might then trigger some of these other issues that I just talked about that we don't completely control. But in, we've demonstrated this already. We did, we, we did for like our... Um, a gravity wave drag component at the time, we ran it with some, you know, probably C24 resolution or something like this, and then just selected a four by four set of columns and actually use that as a reproducer. We want to get it, nice. anything bigger than yeah. about four by four columns is too big. We would like to get these data sets small enough to fit in our source repository so that they actually are there for CI to actually run. Um, this would not be the approach we would use for dynamics. For dynamics, it would have to have sort of a dedicated separate file we'd have to access somewhere else. We wouldn't want to put that into the source code. But we expect the tests themselves to run very, very quickly. Slow part will probably be, we still have to read some probably boundary conditions, initial conditions from um, elsewhere. Those will probably be at some expense. Okay, nice. So you kind of, oh. yeah, all right. I'll <laughs> Maybe you two can on. hook up later. Okay, yeah, thank you very nice. much, Tom. We're, we're running behind, so I'm going to keep going. Sorry. Um, the next speaker is uh, David Guibert, and he is from the Center for Excellence in Performance Programming from in Evidence, or at Evidence, sorry. At Evidence, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here in person to present you uh, what we, we did from the European Project Initiative. Uh, what we call HPCW. Uh, basically, it's a framework for reproducible uh, benchmarks for the weather and climate uh, community. Uh, next page. So basically, the outline for my presentation will be to introduce uh, what we, what, what is a benchmark uh, to give some definition and overview. Uh, then I will present uh, the framework itself. And uh, the more important part of the presentation will be the part three. Uh, I will give you some details about the uh, reproducibility workflow we have in this framework. And then I will conclude. So the first part is uh, what and why uh, we need a benchmark. So uh, basically, uh, benchmarks uh, enable to score things. Uh, like uh, clusters for the top 500 or grain 500 or IO 500. Uh, we can score CPU, GPU, interconnects, all these kind of things. Uh, we can also, uh, with benchmark, compare methods, numerical methods, hardware solutions like uh, ARM CPU versus Intel CPU or AMD CPU. And we can also compare uh, compiler with compiler optimization, etc. So for uh, us, benchmarks are good vehicles to collaborate inside the community, like what, uh, like the semi project, for example, in your community. But uh, for us, most importantly, is to also collaborate with technology providers, because once the benchmark has been defined by the community. In my team at the CPP, we can uh, use them and try to uh, focus what are the issues uh, inside the benchmark regarding the hardware and tell the provider to change things, for example. 
So that's why it's critical to have a benchmark with, within a community to impact on technologies and not just have cluster for HPL, for example. So uh, speaking, uh, speaking about HPL, uh, I think most of you uh, know it's a link pack uh, benchmark. Uh, it, it's used to, to score uh, clusters in the top 500 since uh, many years now, more than 30 years. Uh, but there is also other benchmark in HPC. Uh, we can use a stream to compute the poor, pure memory bandwidth. And we have also some other benchmark like SPCG for uh, conjugate gradient. It's more realistic uh, memory uh, benchmark for, for application. But uh, none of them are adequate or representative for the weather and climate community. So that's why we, we propose HPCW benchmark. So what uh, the, this acronym means, so it's High Performance Climate and Weather Benchmark. It has been developed in many European projects, ESCAPE, one, two, EasyWays, also one, two, and now three. So it's um, a set of relevant application uh, to, to model uh, what are the needs for the community in the sense of workloads. So uh, the M purpose of this benchmark is to have a tune a vehicle to collaborate with, as I said, the technology providers to influence their solution to fit what are your needs. So uh, what are inside HPCW? So currently we have nine models, uh, models and what we call dwarfs, which are uh, mini applications. So we have three uh, full models, so ICON, uh, developed at Vicarzi and uh, Max Planck Institute. We also have IFS, so a specific version for benchmark, which is inside RAPS. Uh, RAPS is for rapid uh, real uh, application for parallel systems. So it's used for, for tender to, to propose clusters uh, solutions. We also have uh, NEMO, which is an ocean uh, modeling uh, code. And we have uh, some dwarfs uh, coming from these uh, models or, or others. So, but we don't, we don't not have only uh, models uh, associated with them. We have uh, test cases. Uh, mainly, we have three test cases for, for scalability studies, for example. So we have a small test case which run on one node, medium on tens of nodes, and a big more than 100 of nodes. But to be sure that this runs and these test cases are running correctly, we have some verification procedure with automatic to ensure that uh, we don't make many mistakes on the platform or with the environment software. And uh, the benchmark uh, is used to, to, to score things, don't, to extract uh, some metrics. So we have procedure to uh, automatically uh, extract them, as we can see here. So we run on our cluster, which is a bull sequena cluster with uh, quite old now uh, IMD EPIC processors uh, with a classic interconnect. So the, the table on the on the right is automatically extracted by the benchmark. So here we have the name for the test cases, the revision of the benchmark and uh, the time to solution, for example, or the time uh, calculated by the application which sometimes is uh, less than the time to solution because there is some pre-processing uh, step, for example. So we have validated the uh, HPCW uh, on different uh, architecture, uh, AMD processor, as I tell, uh, ARM processors also. Uh, and when the models or the dwarfs uh, come with a GPU uh, implementation, we can also test this on the GPUs. And we have tested this on many uh, sites, uh, our internal clusters at ATOS or at DKRZ, SMWF or CSC uh, on Lumi. Uh, so uh, the framework, uh, what, uh, what are uh, inside the framework? So uh, I, um, I show you here uh, just uh, to fix mind uh, what we call inside HPCW, uh, what is a benchmark? So we need a code, of course, but it's not limited to the code. We also need a test case uh, to uh, run the code and ensure that uh, we got results. 
We also need some verification procedure, for example, uh, reference uh, output uh, files and uh, compute some uh, error uh, between the output files and the, this uh, reference files. And we need also some uh, scaling metrics uh, to, to, to score things. So, and of course, uh, the, these metrics are the outputs of the benchmark on a specific uh, cluster. So these metrics will be allow to compare uh, hardware, for example, uh, technology, uh, provider technology, but also uh, software tax, uh, like uh, library optimization, compiler, as I said, uh, also compiler flags, uh, et cetera. So uh, having these four, uh, four things inside the benchmark is not uh, sufficient uh, to ensure reproducibility. Uh, we have to fix things. Uh, for example, we have a lot of specificity in each uh, of those uh, items. Uh, the code, uh, we have different versions with different optimization or numerical methods. We have a specific configuration. Uh, we activate some, uh, some configuration on ICE, for example, as I uh, said before. And, but there is also uh, the code itself is not uh, sufficient. Uh, it depends on uh, external libraries. So if we change these externals, uh, maybe we will get uh, different results. So for the test case, we have the input files also, uh, which can be compatible or not with the current uh, version of the code. And we need also some, uh, sometimes the reference output files to, for the verification procedure. And the metrics can be the most uh, evident one, which is the time to solution, but we can also compute the, the flops, uh, for example, or the energy to solution, uh, et cetera. <coughs> so in the next uh, slides, I will present the technical choices we, we choose to, to get some reproducibility inside HPC W. So, um, yeah. Let me uh, present what we need uh, for the framework. So each weather and climate models come with its own uh, built models and with uh, different needs for, for external tools like library, et cetera. Uh, if we uh, provide a benchmark uh, framework, uh, we want to just tell we want to activate a model, for, ex for example, to build the model with uh, its dependency. We just want to tell then once I have built the model, I want to bench the model and verify that the model is running correctly. And then I want to uh, have the results, the, the time to the solution. So we want something that is uh, simple, easy to use, to maintain, but also to extend if we want to, to add more models inside it. But the more important thing is that we want uh, this framework to be uh, independent to where it runs, so to be agnostic to the, to the build system of the model itself, but also to the cluster environment or to the job scheduling system uh, where we will run the, the models, the test cases of the models. And we want to customize this because uh, as a technology provider or an HPC expert like myself, we want to uh, adapt or uh, test our changes, uh, the influence they have on the performance. Uh, so we may want to change the compilers, the optimization flags uh, at all the levels inside this uh, framework. Uh, so of course, uh, many uh, build frameworks already exist, so we don't have to reinvent the, the wheel here. Uh, I will present uh, what uh, we, we study to be a good uh, opportunity to use in HPCW. So uh, HPCW uh, began in uh, 2019, so at this time, uh, CMEC was... Uh, a good uh, framework of source. Uh, SPAC was relatively new, uh, but there is also some other build framework like uh, Nix, which is a functional uh, package manager, which is uh, computes the, its outputs uh, as regarding its inputs. So it's kind of pure uh, package manager, but there is some others. Uh, and as I said, we, we build the models, but we also uh, bench the, the test cases. So we need a bench framework. So some of ones already exist. So there is C-Test, which come with uh, CMEC. Uh, it's a bench framework from uh, C-Test. Uh, and there is some initiative at uh, Ulish or CSCS, uh, like uh, UBA or Reframe. So what we, we choose for, for HPCW is to use uh, CMEC, uh, like it was used in a VTT or 
par view, uh, a super build approach. So it is able to compile the model itself, but also uh, its dependencies. So it was the first choice we made in uh, the early development of HPCW. And uh, with the version two of HPCW, we also introduced some uh, SPAC recipes uh, because there is a lot of attraction uh, between the SPAC and there is a lot of recipe on how to compile libraries and the dependency uh, inside the SPAC. So this uh, kind of development has been supported inside HPCW during uh, EasyWay's uh, European project. And for the bench part of the framework, so how we will run the, the test cases, we use a C test, a classical approach with a CMEC with some shell script for automatic shell extraction. Uh, so here's a big picture for HPCW. So as I said, we have a minimum requirements for, for HPCW, only CMEC and maybe Python if you want to use a stack recipe. So here is a, a chart of uh, in orange, you have uh, the models uh, themselves and all the dependencies, uh, the dependency of the dependencies on the graph uh, you can show here. And uh, you have some limitation here uh, for wraps. We have a quite old version, uh, so we need a Python 2 if we use uh, the CMEC recipe, so it will become a nightmare to install that it is deprecated since a few years now. But if we use the SPAC, it's uh, already there, so we don't have anything to, to install uh, by yourself. So the repository part, uh, the main part, uh, sorry, uh, I put here some, uh, some commands, some codes, but uh, I think tools are important to, to ensure what we are doing and to redo what we have done. So here is uh, the simple usage of uh, HPCW with the full uh, CMake approach, so like what it was at the beginning of the framework. So the, there is a three uh, main uh, files uh, listed here, so you can uh, see them here, here, or, uh, or at the end here. Uh, so basically, we have to capture what uh, we define in our uh, environment to to um, to be sure that uh, once we we use the framework we will be able to reduce the same thing. So we put the cell environment into a file and we put uh, there also uh, which module file will be loaded, for example. Uh, for the CMake part, uh, we have the same kind of file, uh, what is called a toolchain. Uh, we put here uh, all the variables that are needed by the CMake uh, program. And then we have our uh, analyze with uh, is the cell script we, we, we develop to, to report automatically the metrics. And uh, what uh, can be done in the second line here is that we also have wraps how to run uh, the test cases on each uh, scheduler. So we have uh, some kind of script that still uh, for uh, this benchmark, we will use, uh, for example, uh, 10 nodes with this uh, the MPI distribution uh, with the GPU uh, or not. Uh, so to put things uh, more simpler, I don't talk about the input files uh, for the test cases because it can be uh, several giga or terabyte of data to be downloaded. So for now, we have uh, two approaches. The first one and the simpler one is to manually download them, but we provide the checksum sums to verify that you have the right input files. And we have also some experimental support for what is called the CMake external data. So CMake is able to automatically uh, download the data from uh, FTP server, for example. And we can also use some kind of tool with uh, are using the same idea, which are called Data Lab or GitAnnex. Uh, they are used in the neurodata science uh, community. So if I have a few minutes left. So if we use the CMake recipes, uh, we have one step uh, to do uh, before uh, using HPCW. So you, you have to configure your SPAC environment. Uh, I will show you in the next slide. And uh, just uh, you just have to add one option to the framework that you will use now, not the recipe to build the model inside the CMake, but to use what is already provided by the system. So it's the same uh, workflow as before, just that you have one step uh, before calling the, the benchmark. So for those of you uh, that don't know SPAC, uh, it's a package manager uh, uh, 
uh, used uh, to in many uh, HPC sites uh, because it's uh, allowed to build and uh, install a scientific uh, application uh, stack. And uh, the, the, the great idea be behind Spike is that the package are parameterized using specification. So you, you can tell which option you want on which package. So uh, I put here a link to the good documentation of, uh, of this part. And the uh, second great idea behind uh, Spike is that uh, you can uh, isolate uh, uh, your software stack inside the environment uh, to group together a set of uh, specification of package you want uh, to build, but also to rebuild or deploy uh, this exactly the same environment on another site. So yeah, I have put some uh, illustration. So you define which specification, which package you want to install, and then uh, you concretize the, the, the graph I show you uh, earlier. And uh, with this, uh, lock file, uh, which has uh, the dependency uh, blocked, uh, you can reproduce your uh, environment. So uh, a big word about containers. Uh, why we don't need containers? Uh, because uh, someone needs to build containers. And uh, most of the time, the binary are not optimized inside them. Uh, if, for example, if you want to use the ARM uh, uh, vector instruction, uh, it won't work uh, anywhere. So you have to rebuild uh, your uh, your container image uh, to be reproducible uh, uh, when you change uh, the, the size. So to conclude, um, uh, the technology provider need uh, trusted metrics to reproduce uh, what they get on their uh, platforms. To, to have the trusted metrics, you need reproducibility, and reproducibility needs uh, trusted tools. So with SPCW, we, we, we aim to provide uh, for the climate and uh, weather community a bunch of models uh, that we can uh, easily deploy on many uh, HPC sites to, to bench them and also to have some uh, table to compare uh, those metrics uh, regarding the site or the, the platform. Um, and the, the last item is that we, we are open for, for collaboration. If you want to add or deploy uh, this uh, framework uh, on your on your site, and uh, we are currently in EasyOS three uh, developing uh, extracting what is private inside the framework to to provide an open source version of of it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah, you mentioned the benchmark framework will test for both CPU and GPU. Do you have the code in two different versions, one for CPU, one for GPU, or you have the same code can test both? You, we have the, the same code for both, and it's just one option we activate to tell, for example, for ICON, we, we want the GPU version of ICON or the CPU version of ICON. Yeah, the second question, since we are also developing the benchmark code, um, how extensible for the framework to include other test cases? For example, I see most of your cases for component level. Um, how do you can how easy it is if we want to test it in with fully coupled multiple component models or a machine learning models? You really, for for icon, uh, I think we already have a couple version uh, of it. Uh, basically, uh, with the CMEC uh, super build approach, we defined uh, how to we compile the model. So if it's a, comp uh, a coupled version of a model, we may have two uh, executables to, to compile. And then we define how to run the test case. And in that, in that file, we just tell we use this executable, this executable, and we specify the number of CPU, uh, etc. So it's just a way to compile uh, the executables and then to define how to run. But it's it's generally one one file uh, to to modify. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop us here. I have a few quick announcements after we thank David. Um. The first one is um, there's break right now. You have about 25 minutes. There's food out there. Um, men's restrooms downstairs to the left, women's downstairs to the right. 
all gender upstairs to the left or just wander around until you see a restroom sign. Uh, the second thing is that I just wanna remind everyone that the last 40 minutes of the day today are open discussion. So if you did have a question and I didn't get to call on you, um, there'll be plenty of time at the end of today to question speakers or maybe you just thought of a question after they finished. Anyway, okay, um, enjoy your break. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So our next talk is on correctness challenges in HBC and ML. And um, there'll be two speakers, Ganesh Gopalakrishnan and then Harvey Dam. So, Yeah, it is okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here at this center that I never saw physically. And uh, this gives me a chance to um, basically walk about, uh, talk about correctness uh, in several aspects that uh, impinge on what we do. Uh, my student, Harvey Dam, has uh, been in the group uh, uh, co-advised with another uh, professor, Aditya. So he's into machine learning more and uh, uh, he has uh, written a paper. Uh, it was actually presented in Rwanda, uh, your favorite place. Uh, yes, uh, Dan will rise. So yeah, so we even have a C Chesum Rwanda that we named in one of the co-author papers. Anyway, so this is one of the things that he will deep dive into. Okay, so I don't want to be too presumptuous here because these are very large topics. Uh, HBC is uh, vast and ML is vast. So I would like to be a little bit more precise in terms of what we might want to get across. And clearly there are uh, working definitions, uh, examples of what HPC might mean. Um, correctness in HPC could be taken in to various levels. I'll try to give you a certain snapshot of how I would like to portray correctness and uh, like feedback on that because this is actually a diagram I'm using in a, dra in a report uh, to come out soon. So I appreciate feedback. And then similarly for ML, there is an uh, uh, encompassing definition. So what we tried in this paper that uh, Harvey will talk about halfway is how do we address certain aspects of uh, correctness in the ML space and how does it impinge on science? Okay, so just to tell you the story quickly, uh, I'm really going to deep dive into the bleeding edge of HPC where new components, uh, especially GPUs, accelerators, other components are going to be used and what are some of the dangers waiting. Uh, and how do we ward off those dangers uh, sufficiently fast enough? And I'll talk about uh, issues that are, we are dredging, deep dredging the execution space and finding, and nobody's talking about these issues. So it's better to be aware of them. And uh, that's the first uh, arrow that I'm pointing here. And similarly for ML, there are uh, many aspects of ML correctness. Uh, it's very nuanced as we all know. So long story short, the HPC aspect is nixing the nasty NANs. <laughs> uh, we really want to kill all those nasty first, uh, uh, NANs uh, that are going to foul up uh, your operation and uh, they exist in abundance and we better be aware. And the Harvey talk essentially is fixing the fairness for Paul, if you like that way, because fairness and uh, so his uh, talk will be a short tail about the long tail, the long tail distributions and what, what happens when you have rarely represented uh, inputs in that space. Uh, the third thing that is a lurking danger, I really, really enjoyed this paper. It's a stunningly uh, executed case study. There are hardware bit flips at that level. And this is uh, written by Google engineers who tell us uh, how they are actually combating hardware bit flips and how hardware bit flips are turning to NANs and infinities very soon. And what are the telltale symptoms and how they do uh, re-execution? This is not at all my work, but uh, these are the directions that they tell us that what we are digging uh, is uh, just the beginning of a dirt pile that we need to get through. Okay, so this is a diagram that uh, uh, six of us, or uh, yeah, six of us recently helped NSF and DOE organize a workshop on correctness in HPC, uh, scientific computing, and uh, F Florida. 
And uh, we are writing a report. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't include many of the wonderful speakers here because we only could invite so many and we were bandwidth limited. But subsequently, I have shown the report to Alison and I would be happy to send it around because the report is not fully done yet and uh, getting some more input would be useful. So there's somebody said, I need a diagram. Okay, so this is my best attempt at uh, HPC correctness stack. And I don't feel genuinely comfortable because I don't work in most of the spaces, but yeah, so there is a certain informal problem description. I heard it today and uh, comes a rigorous formal uh, problem formulation. There's a gap here. Uh, you... Then comes uh, traceable, uh, you need to have a mathematical formulation. You know, how do you model heat flow? There are many mathematical formalisms. You need to choose one. And uh, the model has to be tractable enough. Model approximations, uh, algorithmic approximations. Finally comes the numerical and parallel code. Okay, so this seems to be more or less right, but uh, please edit and uh, change or add a layer if you like, uh, we'll see. So I'm really going to be focused on this layer because this seems to be where some of the high performance HPC is heading in the uh, wake of uh, Denard scaling ending and uh, the bleeding edge performance of HPC is not scaling as high as it used to be. Performance is not doubling anymore in uh, two years. It may barely double every six years, but that time frame <clears throat> may dilate. Uh, sorry if my voice is like this. Uh, I was in a situation, sorry, I'm not making this up, but I was screaming at a uh, herd of dairy cow for five minutes. And I'll tell you why it happened. <laughs> and uh, this is something I didn't plan for. And my, okay, that's for the evening, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> And that's why I need tea also. So this is one diagram that uh, uh, we put together in a, a report, a, a paper that we are all, uh, six of us funded by DOE uh, wrote, saying, what are the lurking challenges of uh, uh, heterogeneity? Heterogeneous computing uh, invites all these interlocked issues. Uh, this was Ignatius' uh, nice uh, diagram. He's amazing in drawing uh, these things. And uh, this is Ang Lee's uh, portrayal of how GPU uh, te uh, technology has been marching. Ang Lee is at PNNL, Ignacio at Livermore. Uh, this is an, a stack. This is a slew of uh, uh, experiences we've been having in our group. So we actually are testing GPUs uh, in their floating point modalities. Uh, long, the latest results we have are uh, we have reverse engineered some of the binary semantics of NVIDIA because there's no other way to uh, analyze such codes. And we also have studied AMD and uh, AMD matrix accelerators and the NVIDIA tensor cores and know some of the differences in their rounding behavior. So these are all things we need to know uh, because some code out there might uh, get to be affected by these. So I won't have all the details, but ask me if you want later some of these. Okay, so the, finally we decided to focus on NANDs and infinities because they are smoking guns, which you really cannot argue away. Uh, floating point rounding error, yeah, you can argue uh, based on the situation. <clears throat> so Alison has told me many stories of FMA biting her code. That's a great story, but it's not biting hard enough. If it further generates NANs and infinities, we have to be scared. So what we want to do is know where a NAN is getting born. Uh, let's say square root of a negative number. Uh, some of the computational units propagate it, and some of them kill it. So you may not even see it in the functional the final output. So you need to know that there was a NAN. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll tell you what these kills mean. It is a nasty surprise. And there was a talk by on uh, from the end of pro, pro, the project name on LAPAC. And Jim Dimmel has written a wonderful tech report on the problems of uh, NANs and infinities. And uh, it's a shocking detail uh, he has compiled on LAPAC uh, reproducibility. So the basically, we need to trace this in the execution of GPUs, which don't have uh, traps. So your NAND codes are di di displayed, but you better pick it up during execution. You don't have an interrupt you can set up. AMD says they set up, but we have tried to turn, turn that on. That doesn't happen. And, so, and then some of the NVIDIA libraries are closed source. So we had uh, a collaboration with Tarsia, who is at PNNL, where uh, one of the routines was uh, dying because of the NANDs. The solver is giving solutions are full of NANDs. And so she suggested diagonal boosting because this is an actual API function built into the solver. So presumably the solver designers had anticipated trouble in terms of uh, uh, whatever uh, maladies the matrices suffered. So we could multiply the matrix diagonal by constant and lo and behold, the NAND went away. So these are all band-aids one has to use, it seems. 
So this is, uh, this is one reason why you, know, you have to be afraid of NANs because uh, NAN equal to uh, anything is false. So it kills the entire true path. So the true path may have all the garbage you don't observe. Uh, that is uh, clear as to what the dangers are. So this is an HPDC paper uh, this year, which uh, is accompanied by a tool and uh, highly encourage you to use the tool and uh, tell us what we need to do. So long story short, this is a binary instrumentation based tool based on a binary, binary instrumenter called NVBit that NVIDIA has released. And we have known how to perfect it, not perfect, but uh, use it cleverly to be fast enough. Binary instrumentation is seldom fast, but we made it uh, fast enough. And we ran uh, 100, uh, 151 HPC and many ML programs in their own data set. We didn't make up the data set and uh, there we detected 27 previously unreported exceptions and ends. And this is why I'm saying that ex experts don't seem to be really aware of what they're computing with. And some of these include HPCG and S3D and so on. And uh, then we tried to fix it because we had no clue how to fix it. So we tried a source available, yes or no, partial. Um, how to fix, et cetera. So that detail is in the paper. Uh, that's the NAND story on how we might be able to use binary instrumentation and find out, uh, now we can fuzz the inputs and maybe expand the space of behaviors and uh, see the difference between the exception flows and all that. That's where our work is going. And now we are, and this is, this is a tool architecture. I won't get uh, too much into it, but, but there is a detector which quickly tells whether there's an exception generated in an internal module. And if you really care about where it is happening, how it is flowing, it does detailed instruction level tracking of uh, uh, which instruction generated and propagated. Uh, so that is available. And <clears throat> what we did is, Julia has a great language and we happen to, uh, uh, my students know it. So now we are thinking of Julia calling GPUs. And in Julia, we can do the tracking kind of uh, more effortlessly. So we want to build a full stack uh, uh, history of how the Julia calls went. This is shallow water simulation, I think, and how the GPUs uh, then subsequently picked up the computation and generated its own NANs. And then we want to show a full display. So this tool is also available. You can just say using flow tracker and then write some Julia code. The tool is slow, but uh, it is functional. We want to improve it. Okay, so this is a point at which I would uh, segue into uh, 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 move on to Harvey's talk. When you come here, Harvey, yeah, uh, quickly talk. So, the, so we really know that AI is happening around HPC. And uh, this is a report that uh, we just saw recently. And uh, they are all taking uh, many standard looking benchmarks and looking at uh, accuracy scores. So there seems to be ML oriented correctness which can now start impacting science. So this is the story I would like Harvey to tell and uh, Harvey take it away. Yeah. All right. Uh, so now we're, what happened? Okay, so now we're in my part. Um, I'll talk about correctness in machine learning and uh, sorry if, a lot of this is review for a lot of you who do machine learning, uh, but okay. Uh, so correctness is not just about loss functions, you know, uh, not just about accuracy, but we also want our models to generalize well and be robust to uh, unexpected situations and also be fair if it matters. And we also want all the HPC correctness characteristics that, uh, Ganesh talked about. So common loss functions, you've probably seen all these before, cross entropy loss for classification. If you have two classes, you can use F score, usually you use F1, if you think recall is just as important as precision, or you can change it to F2, F half, if you think otherwise. And for regression, you have these common uh, loss functions, mean squared error, mean absolute error, mean squared error, uh, you would use if you're assuming your errors are normally distributed and mean absolute error, uh, you might use if you think the cost of loss is linear, like if you're doing some finance. And then there are mixtures of those two, like the Huber loss. Uh, reward functions are also kind of like loss functions, but they tend not to be bound 
so loss functions, you usually have like a zero loss where you're aiming at. With rewards, uh, let's say you have a trading agent, they, they can lose all the money in the universe or they can win all the money in the universe. So it's just like kind of unbounded. But sometimes you uh, don't have a natural loss signal that a reward signal that you can observe. And so maybe you wanna learn your own loss function, which you do in reinforcement learning with human feedback, which you might know is behind chat GPT. Okay, so with robustness, you have different uh, measures of robustness, different class, different uh, characterizations of robustness. So one is margins. If you have a classifier, you have the difference between uh, the correct logic in the classifier and the next highest. And of course that can be negative if you're wrong. You probably wanna use the softmax, so it's actually a probability distribution. And then uh, besides the logits, you can have margins in the parameter space and the input space, and they characterize different kinds of robustness, like to parameter perturbations or to input perturbations, uh, and also to hardware attacks, like if the hardware attacks a parameter such as with a row hammer or deep hammer. Uh, as for regression, the robustness is less straightforward to characterize. You can use the coefficient of determination, which sort of captures the variance in the data. Uh, you, all, you could also look at the gradient magnitude. So the lower the magnitude, <coughs> an indication of uh, more or less robustness is an indication of uh, more robustness. And then oftentimes, if you're doing regression, you'll have a downstream decision, like a downstream classification. So if you squish those two together, you might actually be able to make up a margin, just like in a classic. Um, and then there's adver adversarial and out of distribution robustness, which is... Uh, Robustness to input attacks, parameter attacks, hardware attacks. And I think the best way to measure that is just to do those attacks and see how you do. Um, you could also use the margin, but it's better to uh, do those attacks and and just classify, uh, give give yourself like a loss value on those uh, in those attack situations. So what can you do? Augmentation, adversarial training, as I said, and human in the loop, um, such as with RLHF. Okay, so fairness, maybe um, climate scientists don't care about fairness because maybe they don't often make decisions that affect people, or maybe they do, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, okay, uh, but um, fairness is, uh, concern in general machine learning. So there are different, at least like 70 ways of measuring fairness. And here are just three, you can glance at them. There are different mitigation strategies, like uh, just reweighing different examples based on their frequency, uh, trying to project your data into uh, a space that obscures the sensitive features or you also can use an adversary to try to detect whether your model's being unfair and hit them against each other. And uh, of course, when you aim for fairness, you're probably gonna sacrifice some performance on the traditional accuracy measures that I went over before. Okay. Um, I'm gonna just skip over this and get into one piece of work that I've done understanding the effect of the long tail. Okay, so um, basically when you prune a neural network, zero some parameters and remove them, you simplify it. And this could cause some differences in the way that it classifies things. And we have some way of encouraging the compressed model to conform to the original model. Sorry, I'm just reading through this stuff. We have this 
matrix of influence, which is the difference between training with some example and without some example. And basically the question we had was, is there a difference between the compressed and uncompressed models uh, with respect to the amount that a uh, test example is influenced? And the answer we got was sometimes depending on the loss function that we used. And sometimes it was significant um, with particularly loss functions that include some alignment between the logits. And you can talk to me later about this if you want. I'm also going to supercomputing. So uh, that's the end of my part. It's key takeaways. We have different kinds of correctness. There's no free lunch. You have to choose a model that's appropriate for your application. When you perturb a model, the correctness characteristics change and it would be nice if your model were interpretable and it doesn't take forever. Okay, so now I'll step out and we'll go back to you, Ganesh. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. I also wanna mention that Ganesh will be on the panel tomorrow so you can drill him when he's on the panel if you have questions for him. Is, do we have any questions? No questions? Okay, thank you. Okay. So the next speaker is actually online. Morning guys, or evening. I'm just gonna turn on my camera for one second. You see me, so you, you see who's talking to you and then I'm gonna turn it off back so that we maximize the bandwidth. Okay, yes, well, I forgot to actually introduce you. This is Valerio Perdua, and he is from um, University of Reading and NCAS CMS, and he has the next talk. And Paul, do I need to do something to get... Oh, he's going to share his screen. Yeah, I'm going to try to share the screen. If it doesn't work, then I'll uh, I'll have to ask you guys um, to uh, to put it up from the uh, from the server. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for the introduction. Thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, give you guys a talk in here. I'm gonna turn off the camera so I can actually share the screen and go, go through the awkward few minutes of, oh, it's not working. Let's have a look. You cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing, right? Let's try again. Uh, the sh screen sharing seems to be disabled. Don't stop the sharing. Do you want me to stop the sharing on the screen? I think that's the problem. If that, that screws up the whole thing. Okay. Let me try again. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, entire screen. There we go. Let's have a look at this. Let's see. Can you guys see the other uh, presentation now? Yeah, that looks like yeah, it works. Cool. Maybe it's going to slide slideshow mode. Start from the first slide. I guess everything's all right. All right. If there's any issue, just interrupt me, please. I'll shut up and, and see if there's any any solution from my side. All right. So yeah, I mean, uh, thanks very much for the uh, the introduction. Um, this is a uh, collaborative uh, presentation with uh, with my friend and colleague uh, Bo Amdela from uh, eScience Center uh, in the Netherlands, and we're both representing the larger uh, ESMVL tool technical uh, lead team. Um, ESMVL tool <clears throat> is the Earth System Modeling Evaluation tool. And I'm going to tell you a few things about how we do our testing and what are the main challenges with regards to testing in, uh, in such a fairly complex scientific software um, ecosystem. So a couple of words about ESMVL tool. I mean, I think kind of says it all. It's a, it's a tool that allows the user to evaluate Earth system model. So it uses um, 
it, it takes as input um, uh, CMIP like data, whether it be CMIP data or um, observations uh, formatted in uh, CMOR standards um, or OPS from IPS or whatnot. So, um, and it takes this data and then it runs a number of diagnostics uh, that the user wants. Um, or the user can come over and uh, uh, produce their own diagnostic and contribute to the uh, uh, to the community uh, because ESML tool is a massively community driven uh, software tool um, and uh, we rely on scientists coming over and saying I want I want to see these plots I want to see these I want to get these numbers out of my data and we say well. That's great. You can you can use our framework, and you can produce your own diagnostic, and then we'll ingest it uh, as uh, part of the uh, the uh, standard library. So, as such, there's a whole lot of uh, developers. We have uh, about 200 developers, and uh, most of them are scientists. Uh, we have a small group of uh, um, software engineers, dedicated software engineers. I'm one of them. Bow is one of them. Is uh, has a few more uh, that work on the uh, both the scientific side, but their focus is mostly the uh, the technical and uh, optimization and deployment and you know all these uh, all these technical things. And you can I posted a bunch of links there. We have you know, a link for documentation, link for uh, the GitHub uh, repository, and we have a swanky YouTube video as of recently because uh, CMIP seven uh, has come along, and uh, uh, they're like, well, we should. It's, the ESML tool is the, the tool of choice uh, for a model evaluation, model data evaluation uh, for CMIP 7. So they made a the fancy video. So this is how it looks in, uh, in a schematic view. Um, um, initially, um, there were just a few mod modules of these, and they're all bundled together into uh, an amalgamation of software. So we managed to uh, disentangle the computational, heavy computational side um, of the tool um, away from the scientific diagnostics metrics um, and all these um, science producing elements of the, of the tool. So we have the ESML core, which is, and I'll show you in the next one what uh, the, the, the proper separation between uh, these two modules are, is, um, the ESML core is the computational uh, engine of the tool, and then you have the tool uh, that actually runs the uh, scientific uh, analysis, the diagnostics. So yeah, um, inherently and generally speaking, uh, scientific software tools and, and software packages um, usually come with uh, everything thrown into one bucket. So you you do the computations, but the pre-analysis um, or the data reduction um, in the same package or nearby the same package that the the science analysis, scientific analysis is done. Uh, this is how ESML tool was initially as well. It was just a bunch of, uh, of scripts into one big package. Uh, so we decided to split um, the computational engine away from the the, uh, the actual uh, um, bit that does the science, the, uh, the tool itself, the, uh, the diagnostics and, and, and so on. So this is why now we have the ESML tool, which is produced, uh, which is um, contributed to mostly by, by scientists. And then we have the ESML core that is doing uh, highly optimized uh, computations before the actual diagnostics run. So this produces um, a funny um, way of testing things. And because tool itself has a lot of code, um, has a lot of um, contributions, scientific contributions, um, it is uh, written in a number of languages. So it's not just one single uh, coding language, programming language. It's, uh, it's mostly Python, but we have NCL, we have R, we have Julia diagnostics in there. We're trying to support whatever the, uh, the scientist is comfortable uh, or the group of scientists are com is comfortable uh, writing code into. We don't, we don't set standards in terms of oh, we support only one single language. So we're trying to accommodate. But that gives us you know, a new set of headaches. 
Um, and then the core itself, uh, ESML core, um, is pure Python, uh, fairly compact code base, um, but it has to be extremely well streamlined, uh, optimized. Uh, it has to be uh, portable. Um, it has to, you know, support the latest Python's, the latest, you know, uh, trends in software development and so on. So there's two types of um, of testing that we're doing. Obviously, because the complexity is high. I mean, look at it. I think it's a B29 uh, Super Fortress um, uh, control panel, the, the cockpit in there. Uh, there's a lot of um, buttons and knobs and, and levers in the configuration, initial configuration, and then you have a whole bunch of data complexity, and then you have, you have a whole bunch of uh, functionality, and it's massive complexity that it comes with it. Um, so testing is, is paramount, but the way the testing is done, it has to be done in two different ways, depending if you're if you're looking at testing ESML core, the core, the computational core, or tool, the, the scientific bit. So for core, um, the testing has to be um, Comprehensive, diverse. You know, this is you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like politic, politics words here, but um, uh, it really has to be. Uh, we also support uh, a number of um, operating systems, so it's um, you know, Linux and uh, and uh, Mac OS X. Latest Python versions currently supporting three and a half because we're we're, we're just about to get uh, support for Python three twelve. Um, and um, the um, the tests for core they range from uh, the core system test. For instance, the um, the environment, the software, the dependency environment um, it has to be as stable as possible. So we repeatedly create the uh, uh, the environment in the testing uh, infrastructure. Uh, well, we create it nightly. Um, and then we we detect every time um, a dependency or a dependency of the dependency has conflicts, um, and we do we do this for the two operating systems that we support plus the uh, uh, each of the three or four Python versions that uh, that we have. Um, we also have backup uh, in case everything goes completely bazooka. Um, we we rely we, we we fall back onto conda log files, which are yeah I forgot to mention. So the the environment is uh, maintained by conda mamba. Uh, Anaconda is the uh, the package manager um, that we use, but we sold the environment with mamba because conda is extremely slow. So mamba is a C uh, C based solver uh, has a C based uh, solver integrated. Uh, so if something goes um, Bad, then we um, uh, we rely on the conda log files that actually freeze the environment at, at any given time. Um, and of course, um, since we deploy our, our package on conda forge on pipeline or not, we test the uh, the Python package uh, building, and we test we have Docker containers as well that we build regularly, uh, nightly as well, and we see their their functionality. And then you know. Unit tests, integration tests, regression tests, all these things um, all in uh, in their code style as well. Um, and um, yeah, documentation testing, obviously, as well. Um, one thing that we're doing is we're, we're testing our testing. So that we, we're testing the coverage. Um, we, we use code call for that. So we, uh, for, for the SML core, that has to be as, as covered as much as possible. We have 93% coverage. We're also testing the performance of our tests. So we're looking at uh, which are the slowest ones, which are the, uh, the ones that uh, churn as much with the, the more me uh, memory and, and CPU and one else. And then we, we red flag and we fix those tests. So this is an example of the, uh, uh, this is GitHub um, Actions. We use both GitHub Actions and Circle CI for testing. Um, and this is just one of the very many GitHub actions that we uh, we have for you know on, on the left you see the, uh, the the OSs and the Python versions, and Circle um, and Cozy for uh, for coding uh, coding styles. For Tool is a bit of a different situation because um, Tool the SML tools uh, main output is um, scientific so plots, numbers. Um, uh, files can uh, 
statistics and so on. Um, and the developers that work on these and contribute towards uh, these, they are mostly scientists. They're not technic necessarily technically oriented, and I'm a little bit contentious here, but it's, yeah. Um, so we're trying to see um, how best we can uh, ask them to test their contributions so that we don't uh, force them to do something that they don't know how to do uh, or spend a lot of time you know, teaching them how to do these things. So uh, it's mostly, um, at the developer's point of view, <clears throat> minimal testing, but we have to get uh, tests done after the, uh, you know, their contributions are uh, in a pull request. Um, so we're looking at um, how the, the output, the generated output varies, or if there's any breakages in terms of, uh, you know, their, the, the certain diagnostic produces completely crazy numbers or plots differ massively or different little just because some axis changed the color. So we have we have automated tools for this. Um, but again, this is, um, the emphasis is um, on the quality of the output rather than the quality of the code um, or the optimization of the code. Uh, so ultimately we're producing scientific results and these have to be tested, uh, but we don't, care as much as in the uh, computational engine for correctness of, uh, sorry, for, for um, optimization and for um, speed um, and the style of the code is written. Um, and a few more, I think this is the second to last slide. Um, so we are trying to be as fair as possible, fair in the, the fair framework that is. So uh, um, our software, uh, releases are all on Zenodo. Uh, we're using Docker containers that we store on, on Docker Hub. Um, the, um, uh, the tool produces records, provenance records, so that you can actually backtrack um, and repeat analysis, uh, you know, like a way back machine um, with different past versions um, of the, both the data and the software itself. Um, and this is the last slide. Um, conclusions, I mean, yes, yeah, so I've been on about how modular this thing is. It's, it's a modular uh, tool, um, testing for both quality of the code and quality of the output and the performance of the code and the analysis. Um, and yes, obviously the, uh, the FAIR the fair framework, framework. And that's me, thank you very much. And I think I am just about Perfect on time. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Valerio? No questions? Oh, we have. Uh, thanks, Larry. Good talk. I was. It seemed like you definitely Cheers. are testing. Thanks. Uh, you're definitely uh, testing like the core ESM Val core. But uh, I mean, it seems like you do get a lot of contributions from scientists. And I mean, how do you or do you test that? Do you test all of it with the same kind of rigor? Do you test none of it? Like, how do you manage? Uh, um, how do you manage checking that the science code that's being given is correct, or do you just assume, hope that the developer thinks it's correct. Oh, well, that's a very good question. And it's something that I should have actually mentioned. So the actual validity of the science that comes in rather than the, the code itself and the, uh, the output. Um, we have a scientific uh, team that checks uh, both based on uh, previously published papers. So this is a definite must be, must be there. It has to, uh, you know, that diagnostic that, you know, user X is coming over, the developer X is coming over with. It has to be published, it has to be recognized as something that people are using and are, you know, it's, it's, it's correct. Uh, but also checking, uh, even if the thing has been published, uh, and obviously it's in the paper, uh, in a scientific paper, they're also checking from a scientific point of view, again, the way it, that, that diagnostic that was published or whatever that magic that was published is implemented in the code. Because there could be, I mean, it could, there could be issues. 
So they're both good uh, at software, these guys, uh, decently very good at, at software, but they're also scientists, so they know their, their, their stuff. I, I don't know any science. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move to the next speaker. Cheers. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Balwinder Singh, and he's from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So. Um, so this is an aerosol physics model, and we often call it MAM4, and uh, this exists in both E3SM model as well as CESM, our system models. And uh, the task here is to port that code over to, uh, uh, to use C++ and COCOS. And uh, so this, is a, this, is this code is written in Fortran, so we are porting it to C++ and COCOS. And uh, I, I'm going to discuss just the testing approach that we took to make sure that the port is valid and it is producing uh, the correct answers or um, exactly the same answers as the Fortran version. So you see a list of my co-authors or team members here. This is really a teamwork. Um, and uh, this, this project was on an accelerated timeline. So we worked really closely uh, and the tools that I'm going to talk about here, they were pretty much conceived during that one year. So there was a great feedback cycles cycle between the team members and uh, uh, then, we, uh, then we came up with all these tools that I'm going to discuss here. Uh, so how... Oh, okay. Like click. Click. Oh, okay. Cool. Thanks. So um, this project is part of a bigger project. It's called Eagles, and Eagles is led by Polun Ma at uh, PNL, and um, um, and this project aims to improve the aerosol physics, and they have made a tremendous progress in last few years. Uh, but here I'm just going to touch on the last piece of this project, which is modernizing the software that uh, that MAM4 is written in so that we can run it under GPUs on uh, exascale machines. So uh, the that part is in this red uh, circle here. Um, and if we zoom into that um, that circle, so we have this blue box, which is MAM4, which is a Fortran version, which exists in E3, E3SM version two or E3SM's atmospheric model version two, which is EAM version two. And uh, the goal here is to get it to the green box, which is MAM4XX, which is a C++ version of MAM4. And, uh, it, and, it, it, should, and it will exist in a newer version of uh, E3SM, which is the C++ version of E3SM atmospheric model. This model is also written from scratch. And uh, so, so the goal here is to make MAM4XX work under EAMXX. And to that end, so uh, another thing, um, MAM4 in E3SM version two is a low res model. It is supposed to run at 100 kilometer resolution. It can run at finer resolutions, but uh, that's the default resolution. And in uh, when we move to the MAM4XX in EMXX, the target resolution is three kilometer. So this is a cloud resolving scale. So that's our goal to make the uh, to provide EMXX the prognostic aerosol physics capability. Uh, to that end, uh, we thought or we broke this uh, process into three categories or three steps. So the first is refactoring the Fortran code. Uh, there are so many ways to refactor the code. Um, and literally when you write a code and you can go look at the code after a week and you find ways to refactor the code. So there is no end to refactoring the code. You can do that over and over again, and it's a good practice. You should, we should do it more often than we do it currently. Um, and uh, so for us, the goal was to get it prepared for C++ code. So that was the goal for refactoring. 
And uh, the next task is porting to C++ and Cocos. This is another complicated task and a team of experts did this. And uh, the last step is to integrate into EmacsX. And that step is still going on. We are still working on, we are on a tight uh, timeline. So we are supposed to get it done by next month sometime. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and uh, okay, so, so I will uh, cover what we did in refactoring. Um, so the main task is to get it prepared for C++ Cocos. So for that, we converted all long subroutines. Those who know the code, um, they know like there are pretty long subroutines exist in CESM, E3SM codes. So we broke it to multiple short subroutines. And the reason why, because it is much easier to take a look at the code. It is much easier to port the code when, when there are only 10 lines of code that needs to be ported. It is much easier to test the code, debug the code if you run into problems. So that helps a lot. So we broke it and while doing that, we cleaned the code, we simplified the code and idly uh, a subroutine should do only one task, but and then the driver codes will of course call those uh, low level subroutines. And uh, we cleaned up the code, simplified it. Uh, now the code, uh, is easy to read, but uh, uh, but again, our goal was to prepare it for C++ Cocos. So that's that's the uh, that's why we went through all these steps, and we ended up rewriting a lot of code because we removed all pretty much all the repeated code, and uh, we uh, we created subroutines so that we can call those again and again. That makes the code more maintainable. And if we want to change the code, there is only a few places to change the code. Uh, you don't have to like go hunt for all the places where the code is repeated. So that that's kind of nice. And uh, uh, we removed a lot of dead code. Untested code is not trustable. We don't know whether it will run. We don't know whether the answers will be right. So we just removed everything which was not tested, which was not, uh, uh, which was not called or invoked in our configurations, model configurations. And the question often comes like when you refactor the code, how many lines did you end up removing? And uh, we removed a lot of code, like we removed over 100K lines of the code. And uh, there was, that means there was a lot of dead code sitting around, uh, which was never invoked. And uh, the final and minus initial version has over 100K lines of code removed. Uh, however, the final version has a lot of boilerplate as well. When you break a long subroutines into multiple short subroutines, you have to declare data types. It takes extra space, extra code. So that is also included in the final version. So we ended up removing a lot of code uh, and it is a lot satisfying to remove the code. And then you look at the code, it's more clean, easy to read, easy to go through. And of course, if the code is easy to read, easy to go through, then there is a less possibility of bugs. And if there are bugs, then we can relatively easily catch them. And the philosophy here that we adopted was is true refactor. So we want to port the code as is. So if we find bugs, we don't fix those bugs, but we make a note that there, is, there exists a bug, we'll fix it later. And this is done so that the so that we can move really quickly. Rather than fixing the bug, then we have to ask, ask the experts whether the results make sense. That's a, uh, that's a cycle which we didn't want to go through. So we just um, refactored everything uh, as is. And as I said, we removed all the dead code and all the non-MAM4, which is a four more version of uh, the aerosol physics code. Remo we removed all of that code because that has never been tested. Like we don't test MAM7 version of the code, there is a MAM9 version of the code, which is, which is never tested. And, uh, and if you wanna get that code back, we can easily do that because it is already, uh, like everything is tracked under Git. And uh, the philosophy was like, the results should stay bit for bit identical before refactor and after refactor. So for that, we, used uh, this approach where uh, before starting the refactor, we created a baseline that is like set in stone, we won't change it. And then uh, we start refactoring and uh, before even touching the code, we will run a test to make sure that the baseline, if the test is producing exactly the same answers as a baseline, we do it using a very short running simple test on a very coarse resolution so that test is run very quickly 
and we are really we really quickly get the answer. And again, this is this refactoring is not done in a box model. This is done in full E3SM model with a very coarse resolution. And there were quick compilation and run sessions. We created some special scripts which will compile the model really quickly and run it under two minutes. And uh, so these were like quick cycles. We were checking in the changes to Git frequently so that if something goes wrong, we can easily come back and fix that. And uh, after the refactoring is done for a process, we would run a whole suite of tests to make sure that we didn't change anything. So that would include with different number of MPI tasks, different number of threads, like all uh, restarts and everything. We would test everything. Um, so that we, so that just to make sure that we didn't change anything accidentally. And uh, so after we refactor the code, the next step is to provide the code to C++ team so that they can port the code. However, we just, we also need to make sure that the port is producing the correct answers. And to that end, we uh, conceived this method where uh, we would provide validation data to C++ team. And uh, this is all done in under E3SM model, like in a course resolution. So what we do here is we extract the column data for each small subroutine. So we did it for like pretty every subroutine that uh, we put that we refactored, and we would extract the data for each column, and uh, not for each column, but for many columns because it's kind of hard to do it for each column. Uh, but in the model has, we built this software infrastructure where we can extract the data uh, for each subroutine. We capture the input, we capture the output for the from the Fortran codes or subroutines. And then once we capture the input from the Fortran, we provide the same input to the C++ code and we expect the same output. And then we match the output. And uh, if the output looks identical, then we say, okay, this is the correct code. And there is another method we also did, which I'll go through uh, to make sure that we are covering all pieces of the code in a subroutine. And the subroutines are pretty small. So it, it's very easy to see whether we have 100% code coverage or not. And we were using tools as well to make sure that uh, code coverage is 100%. And this infrastructure, I will, I will um, go through what we did in uh, in the next slide, but I just want to emphasize one more point that uh, when you talk about two different models using two different languages built with two different coding architectures, we need something so that two models can talk to each other. So data produced by one model can be read by data produced by another model. And for that, we use, we heavily use this Skywalker tool, which was developed by Jeff Johnson in the previous version of previous phase of Eagles. And so we output the data in this format. C++ can easily read this the same data uh, in this format and give us the output. And this tool can also check the output and give us plots and everything. And this infrastructure we built within E3SM and it is flexible and extensible. We can extract massive amount of data for this and uh, any column, any time step, any level. and this is also very easy to use. You you just need to run one script, and it uh, and by providing the um, the signature of the subroutine, so which means all the inputs and outputs of the subroutine. If you mention that, it will automatically generate the instrument code, and we can we just need to run the model, and it will produce the data. Uh, so this is a very simple schematic just to show like what we do under the hood. Uh, so so what? So there is this Fortran code, C++ code. The code is not doing anything. It's a very simple code. Um, so what we do is we capture the input by adding some okay. instrument code in the Fortran code. And uh, that instrument code is auto-generated. So we don't need to do anything. It automatically go to the right place. And we capture the input and we provide the same input to the C++ code. And uh, of course we expect the same output. And uh, after that we get plots like this uh, where we show like MAM4XX and uh, MAM4 are producing identical results. And we heavily rely on the Skywalker tool for this, uh, for making these comparisons. Another testing method uh, that we conceived during this project was generating synthetic data. So this is just generating random numbers. So we produce random numbers within some bounds and invoke both Fortran and C with the same random numbers and we expect the same output. 
So this doesn't mean to, uh, I mean, we these random random numbers can be anything within those bounds. And this gives gave us like uh, confidence in the code, code coverage. This is a great debugging tool. If the validation data produced by the previous scheme was not is not going to some if conditions, we can easily wrangle the input here to get to those if conditions to make sure every every piece of the code is executed. And this is also very easy to use. Uh, we have automated code generation scripts to generate um, the generate synthetic data, and Skywalker generate this uh, synthetic data. So this is a small schematic. Uh, same Fortran and C plus plus codes. Here we generate a driver code, and this driver code is also auto-generated by scripts. We just need to provide a signature of the subroutine, and it will produce this driver code, and we invoke both codes with the same input and expect the same output. And another thing I forgot to mention that during the refactor, we got rid of all the derived data types or structures in C++ language, uh, we call them. So all the subroutine signatures are primitive data types like reals, doubles, oh, sorry, reals or integers or characters. So that helped us a lot in these testing methods because generating drivers for uh, primitive data types are very trivial and generating valid validation data also very trivial for, um, for primitive data types. And um, for our repos, every code is checked into GitHub repos. So for the Fortran code, uh, I set up a very simple cron job, which would just run the test every morning. And uh, there is a web page which shows, uh, shows us whether the results are good or not. Uh, but for C++ Coco's uh, code, which is going to live uh, longer, uh, the Fortran refactor code will be abandoned pretty soon. Uh, but uh, for these codes, we have uh, GitHub Actions set up so that we run it every, uh, Every PR commit, we run the code on GPUs and CPUs to make sure that the code is working fine and producing the expected output. And uh, this is my last slide. So the next step, which we are working on now is the integration step and E3SM V2 and E3SM uh, EAM XX. They are two different, very different models. Uh, so the core architecture is different. Physics is also different. There is no support for low-res configurations in EMAXX. So these are some of the challenges we are going through. And But uh, uh, the testing for, for the integration part will heavily rely on physics-based testing, where we, we will add property tests for, based on first principles to make sure, sure that the processes are going in the right direction, producing the right answers based on the physics. And we will also be heavily using diagnostic tools. Um, and uh, uh, the next step is uh, to integrate the new features developed by Eagles project, new aerosol physics innovations. Uh, we would like to integrate those as well to uh, MAM4XX. So that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I see a lot of hands on that. I'm curious if you collected any statistics on the labor costs for this kind of effort. I'd be very interested in seeing to what extent this could be used to estimate similar efforts in other codes. Um, we did, uh, like my manager would know uh, who was managing the project. Uh, he would know like how much uh, lab like regarding that. But we were like, we really worked hard on this project in last year. So, um, so yeah, it does take intensive work and close collaboration between aerosol modelers, um, C++ experts, people who know the code. So it's a very collaborative effort. So often when, tra when translating between languages, there are architectural changes that are desirable, right? It's not just a matter of recording low level functions, but also redesigning software architecture. But it seems like that may have been challenging in your context where you're doing sort of these low level comparisons. So yeah. how did you think about that? Were you restricted in the kinds of changes you made? Um, were you happy with the results? Are there things that you didn't do because of the uh, process you had decided to follow? Yeah, it's uh, that's a great question. I, I think uh, we were on a, on a very aggressive timeline. So we were uh, we were to do this whole thing in one year. So there are like, while refactoring the code, we found many opportunities where we can fix things. We can uh, 
revisit the algorithms. Um, and also, so, so the, those are set for maybe next year uh, where we can go into the code and improve algorithms, improve things. And also regarding the architectures, also the architectures between two different codes are very different. We currently put, try to accommodate that, um, like so that we can, uh, so MAM4XX is, a, is also very different from MAM4 uh, in, in coding architecture. And we, we try to set it up such, so that we can make use of the parallelism provided by GPUs um, efficiently. So we had that, all those things in mind but we haven't checked for performance yet, so which we will do in this coming year. And uh, then we may revisit those sections to improve the performance of the code, yeah. So we have one online question from Jin San. Uh, when porting Fortran to C++, you may not get before bit answers in some cases. How do you check if the difference is ex expected and not caused by a code bug? Uh, that's a great question. So we were also, cautious about that because we are working on two different machines, two different compilers, completely different programming languages. So we did we did eyeball the plots and uh, there were many instances where the answers are exactly same. So we were also surprised by, by that, that the answers are very, very similar. So we didn't find, uh, so there were one or two instances where we did see res results diverging. And uh, the reason for that was a poor arithmetic, like divide by large numbers, things like that. And when we captured the full precision of the numbers, then those were also fixed. So we were getting really identical answers. So uh, we we were really cautious in the beginning, but toward and we, and we started building our confidence that okay, this method is working. So we just kept on going with that. So to answer the question, we were there were very minimal differences that we saw. Yeah, I want, uh, this is really nice work. Uh, I want to ask in the future, what is your vision to support the model? Um, if you have new development, will that go to your fortune and you go through all the process again and then to support GPU or you will focus on GPU? Or what is the plan for that? We are actually um, asking the developers to develop directly in C++. We don't want to go through this process. This is tedious. And, uh, but if there are cases where the developer or their development has already happened, then we will we may have to go through this process. But for any feature that is easy enough to directly code in C++, we are asking people just directly do that. And there are software developers who assist them with, uh, with the development. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm going to let you talk a lot. Okay, oh, yeah, okay. So the, the work that Bollander is doing is also similar to the EmacsX work that he referenced. And we went through a similar workflow, although we didn't use Skywalker, which was really cool. Um, but I would just to mention like the support for only GPUs. The the code that they're going towards would be the same as EmacsX would be in C++ Cocos, which has CPU support. So you would, so um, the code itself would be supportable both on CPUs and GPUs as long as it was in using the Cocos libraries. So yeah, so it wouldn't be strictly GPU support. And I suspect that MAM for XX will be in a similar place. She's gonna cut me off. We can talk later. <laughs> Okay, hey, thanks very much, Bellender. All right, we have um oh another run. Okay, our uh, next speaker is Abhishek Gopal. He's at ETH Zurich, and um, looks like this time I did a good job stopping the share, so we can start with Abhishek's talk. Um, hi everyone. It's uh it's about like eight p.m. in Zurich here. Um, nice to meet everyone remotely. So yeah, let me get. Uh, started very quickly. Um, okay, just some context and definitions. ICON was already introduced thanks to the keynote speaker, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, but yeah, what is initially a project by the German Weather Service and Max Planck Institute for Meteorology has now become like a big consortium. And exclaim the exclaim project at ETH Zurich. It's um, basically it's 
using the ICON model and it's leveraging some very recent uh, domain specific languages like grid tools uh, for Python, uh, which is a compiler uh, framework for weather and climate modeling. And uh, I'm gonna uh, provide a little more context about that uh, in the coming slides. And But before that, I would uh, want to thank all the list of contributors, and we have a huge team of uh, a lot of software engineers and domain scientists um, and everybody in between. Okay, so GT for Pi. Um, so just to keep things very simple, and uh, there's already Cocos introduced, which is also a kind of a domain-specific language, um, but in C++, uh, whereas GT for Pi is more a Python front end for the grid tools uh, library, which is also a domain specific language in um, in C++. So uh, the the top slide or the, the top figure shows uh, like um, a sample code in ICON to compute a horizontal divergence. And basically there is mapping from edges to cell centers. And that is the code that you're seeing on top. And uh, it's also uh, ported to GPUs using OpenACC. And so you'll see some OpenACC um, directives on top and around the loop. And uh, whereas something uh, like that would uh, be translated to Python and especially GD for Pi, simply as what you're seeing on the bottom using neighbor sum, um, then um, the first field times um, uh, the weight coefficients. So basically something like that um, written in Fortran, uh, we're not translating that to Python. And of course this talk is not going to be about why we do this and uh, how exactly this happens, um, but more about like what, um, uh, what are the development lines we have here in Exclaim and at ETH Zurich and how we're trying our best to like verify that. Okay, so um, just for background and here uh, I'll be specifically talking about the ICANN atmosphere model and it's not just an atmospheric model, it's, it's, it's very comprehensive, uh, but at least uh, the people I work with, when you talk about ICANN, we're talking ICANN A specifically. And so the uh, the boxes in blue um, that you see in blue are just all written in Fortran. And they leverage Fortran plus uh, different um, other technologies like OpenACC or MPI, OpenMP uh, to leverage like heterogeneous architectures. And, um, and then what we are doing here in, um, 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 at Xclaim, um, and what we call, or at least what, um, let me quickly check the chat. Uh, okay. Um, um, so what we're doing here is we're taking the die code that's written in Fortran, and we're basically replacing the stencil calls uh, with stencils that are uh, written in Python, um, and especially in GT for Pi. And so this is, uh, sort of our intermediate product that still is able to run the full atmospheric model, but it's like sort of a step change towards um, um, what comes in the next part, which is, uh, so we're also working on like an experimental uh, Python driver where all of the uh, the atmospheric driver is in Python and and also the, the die core is fully in Python. Whereas in the previous uh, approach, uh, what we do is the main code is in Fortran and the stencil library is in Python, but gt 4 pi takes the stencil, uh, the stencils and basically the end result is a code generated in C++. And the Fortran code links against a static library that was in, that is in C++. But whereas this, um, the rightmost image is uh, everything is uh, pure Python execution, but also um, it's executed directly on GPUs. And sort of the end goal eventually is for as many of these uh, modules to be in Python as possible. And again, ICANN is a big consortium wide effort, which means there are many modules to do radiation, uh, land modeling, um, 
and all that. And it'll take a lot of time for each of these components to be slowly ported to Python. But we don't expect that to happen like um, uh, in our first sort of uh, what we envision, I think. OK, so uh, the stack that we have here, um, um, so we have a huge team that is just uh, software engineers working on the gd 4 pi um, product. And they are software engineers with more of a software engineering background and some with more of a computational science background. But um, all the typical uh, software engineering DevOps that uh, one would see in many uh, modern um, um, software engineering teams, um, uh, we are able to make that happen in terms of unit integration, regression testing, and all that. And um, I think, like one of the previous talks mentioned, we also do a lot of code style checks using Flake 8 and all that. And um, everything is on GitHub. So we have a rigorous review process. Nothing goes into uh, the main branch without like a proper review. Uh, we also have code generation tests for when um, the stencil written in Python. Uh, that's eventually converted to a C++ code, at least in one um, in one type of uh, the model build, and that is also checked. So this is uh, we consider this like a level zero um, um, of this uh, stack, and then what we have is like a level one. Um, it's like a stencil wise comparison. So um, and I'll give an example of that in the next slide. And level two is uh, more like an, um, the perturbation growth test, which is what serves as a system test for us. And one of the problems in our approach is we're not able to ensure bit for bit reprodu re reproducibility. So we have to be a little more creative in terms of what we have. Um, so the first three op uh, the first three levels, I would say, are uh, very short term tests, and um, whereas uh, climate models also run longer term. So we have um, more medium term tests, um, which use more advanced stati statistical tests. And finally, level four, which I'm not really going to cover here, is what um, a domain scientists do, um, which is validation with observational data and intercomparison. So yeah, so this is the approach. So uh, one thing we have is like, we have like, a separation of concerns, um, which is enforced by using a domain specific language. In fact, that's like a feature um, so that domain scientists can focus more on using a descriptive um, uh, language to be able to write the physics in and not to worry about um, high, uh, writing the code uh, so that it's high, you know, uh, it's got high performance and all that. And software engineers are the ones who are who need to worry about what's going on in the back end. But that also presents like a challenge for verification because clearly there are some gaps between uh, how software engineers test their codes and uh, what's required for climate model tests. And this also goes back to, I think, the keynote talk where we're usually talking about um, in the traditional context, it's uh, software enge engineers are like, embedded in a climate modeling group, and they usually have a lot of domain knowledge. And whereas in this paradigm, there is a little bit of a deviation from that. And um, also, I want to mention quickly that the first uh, three methods maybe are fairly quick. And so we have them automated. And every time we have a change, we have a pull request on GitHub. Uh, we can just launch these tests, and it's it's fairly quick. It's a matter of an hour or something. OK, so I think some of the challenges I mentioned in uh, in the previous slide, and primarily it's that there are software engineers, there are domain scientists, and software, like, they're like people from all backgrounds. And there's not necessarily a lot of understanding of like um, how an atmospheric model should perform when you know things are correct and so on. So um, and so like at least um, how we're starting to see it is there might be a role for computational scientists or like folks with more numerical methods background to sort of identify like the missing gaps and um, come in and like uh, have better communication. And the other thing is like, um, again, there is um, 
because there's a software engineer domain science like sort of separation, maybe there's not like the best knowledge of like what method should be used at all times. Like maybe we got to go out and do some literature surveys and that's still something that we're like actively thinking about. But whatever the methods, they have to be at some level at least relatively cheap because we have a fast, uh, fast paced like development e effort. So it has to keep up with that. Um, and but also like sometimes the methods that are so simple that you put them in a CI, um, sometimes they can end up being misused because maybe we are not understanding the limitations of some tests. And again, uh, the other problem um, I think we typically face is, um, so we're working with the ICANN model, which is in Fortran. We can't just refactor it at will, um, uh, especially if you're comparing against it. Uh, we can't really refactor it so that it, it has bit for bit reproducibility or even like unit tests. So we kind of work with what we have there. Okay, so level one. So um, the model that um, I'll be talking about, at least for uh, this talk, uh, is the ICANN uh, with the GT for PyDICO. So essentially it's a full Fortran model. Um, and the only place uh, where you can actually see anything different is in these um, the DSL directives here. And so basically what is happening is, um, these um, directors around this Fortran loop uh, are added by the exclaim team um, to basically call this uh, GT for Pi stencil instead of this open AC, this Fortran plus open ACC loop here. And we have a preprocessor to make that happen. And uh, basically that lets us build the code in like two modes. Um, so in, in one mode, we can, like while the code is running, we can actually do an online stencil wise comparison between um, our version of the implementation versus the Fortran plus uh, OpenACC. And uh, we we check for a tolerance condition. I mean, in many of the fields, the difference actually goes to zero, but not all of them. There are some ill conditioned problems there and um, like the relative errors can be high. Um, and yeah, so that's a separate topic, however. So that's like our level one verification, we would say. Um, and this is very useful when you're making any changes. This is like uh, usually our first level of indicators for um, when, when we messed up. And for the second level, uh, what we do is we use the substitution mode build uh, in which basically the Fortran loop is deleted and what is called is actually the, the GT for Pi version which is actually in a, a static library that you've compiled from uh, code generated C++ sources. Okay, so what do we do with, so this stencil by stencil comparison, and maybe we have like, let's say, um, uh, uh, like 120, 130 stencils or something, and they're all checked, uh, 130 stencils in the die core, uh, maybe tracer advection included, um, but after that, we still want to do an integration test where we combine, let's say, all of the physics, including the radiation, things like that. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we've been using for quite some time um, what we internally call a prop test uh, developed at Meteor Swiss. Um, basically, it's uh, like an uh, old school, like uh, introduce a perturbation, um, initial perturbation, and look at how much um, the uh, the initial perturbations grow uh, within some uh, 10 to 15 time steps. And while this has been very useful, like it's it's been quite useful in terms of uh, actual like development because um, uh, we have this test, it's very quick. Um, uh, all we need to do is uh, comment in GitHub, we just say, uh, launch Jenkins, uh, whatever machine we're running on, and then um, this test ends up running, and it's been in practice very useful. But uh, but also like looking at it more closely, there are issues which have long been highlighted, like in literature, like Rosinski and Williamson. Like the problem is the physical parameterization. Um, 
And as you can see, the black lines here, um, and maybe I'm, my plot is missing labels. Um, I'm sorry about that. So the black lines here are uh, the difference between the perturbed CPU runs uh, versus the unperturbed CPU reference. And uh, we take the CPU reference as, um, so the, the unperturbed CPU as our reference. And as you can see, it jumps by quite a few magnitudes in the first few time steps. And that makes our tests less useful, according to Rosinski and Williamson. And uh, the red lines um, and the orange lines you're seeing, they are like uh, the GT4Pi and the pure Fortran plus OpenACC runs. And this is more expected uh, behavior that um, uh, we'd like to see. The only problem with this test is these black lines should be much lower ideally, um, and they're not because of physics. We could of course run die core only test, uh, the Jablonowski Williamson test, for example, and they would be, uh, we could chain two tests together to like make it make more sense. So, um, but this thing is still a short term test. It's only the first 10, 20 time steps. Um, and this also requires us understanding that um, not all physics is going to kick in in the shot of an interval. So uh, we are also using more medium turn, turn tests. This is uh, more in-house at ETH Zurich. Um, uh, Christian Ziman and uh, Professor Shar um, have um, came up with the, this ensemble-based statistical method, which I don't feel qualified to talk about. But um, basically, um, in practice, what this translates to is um, we run, for example, the aqua planet model. Um, we um, run it for like uh, two weeks um, and usually take a course grid. And but for example, we it, it's pretty expensive, so it usually consumes about like sixty ensembles on CPU. So we usually take one of a course resolution model run so that it's pretty cheap. And first. Um, uh, we do 60 ensembles of CPU, and um, there is reference and control, and these are both CPU runs in our case. And using a statistical test that they came up with, like we have, uh, we can find out if uh, things get rejected or not, depending on the model's um, uh, internal variability. And then finally, we um, uh, compare with the ported code. Um, so for more details, I'm going to refer you to their paper. Um, so, and I think the next slide um, I want to, uh, next few slides, I think I want to walk um, us through like um, sort of an example scenario, like. Um, yeah, when... we just have a couple couple minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, so basically you're talking about the aqua planet simulation. Um, maybe I'll skip some of the complicating factors, but there are quite a few, I mean, Usually debugging, it's nice to have a step change, but here, like there are many things that are changing oh, at right. once. Uh, that's like um, sort of a consequence. Oh, like, um, yeah, so I'm gonna uh, um, maybe leave that for later, but like uh, one of the things that was going wrong for us was we were using the prop test uh, um, framework and um, basically perturbing the initial um, uh, density uh, and some of the other prognostic fields and like, and then we realized, uh, um, and this was, I think this was actually me, like in terms of the post hoc theorization, assuming a model is correct. And so prop test, maybe we're not doing the test correctly. And so um, first we started from a cold initialization and uh, the test was actually not very helpful there, but actually it was indicating a bug. Um, and then we tried with the spin-up period. And after that, the test actually started passing. So this blue line that you're seeing, that's the ported um, error growth. And this red line is the, the perturbed CPU. So this blue should be within the red. And we sort of wrongly assumed initially that oh, it's just the cold initialization that is a problem and we need to do a spin up. And also we didn't plot all the quantities of interest, which was again, a source of, uh, um, uh, you know, like sort of a, a mistake. 
so the first time we actually found out that there's a bug was with the Zaman test. And basically what these columns are showing, so the green is good, red is bad. Like uh, according to the statistical test, uh, green means the, the field has passed. So uh, we basically plot, um, like look at a lot of different variables. And what these plots are saying is that the CPU, um, some 20 CPU ensembles when compi compared against uh, 60 of itself, they pass. I mean, um, uh, accounting for the model's internal variability. But the OpenACC and the gd 4 pi they all fail. And I'm not going to talk about the last rectangle here. So we keep looking and then some old school debugging. We just plot different quantities. It turned out uh, the surface shortwave uh, upward flux was zero in GPU runs. And uh, and then sort of going back and forth, we first thought, okay, maybe it's just a bug in the diagnostic state, but the prognostic field is okay. And the Zeman test was maybe giving us a false positive, but that turned out not to be the case. Like more debugging finally um, uh, led us to find that, oh, there was, um, we switched to using the GPU version of a radiation library, EC that developed at ECMWF. And, but one of the interface code that we are using for like uh, computing albedo, we are using fixed albedo and that was imported to the GPU and that was feeding in. And so it had nothing to do with, let's say the exclaim uh, GD for pi porting efforts, but still it's an upstream error that we have to correct for. So once you found that- I think I'm gonna need to cut you off soon because yeah, we're, yeah. we're pretty oh, yeah. much over. I'll, I'm going to let, I hope you'll join us for the open discussion later and we can ask you questions then. Um, do you want to say just a couple last words? Yeah. So, um, yeah, happy to talk more about this in any open discussion, but yeah, sorry for running over time. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, it's time for the lunch break. Um, everyone should have their red ticket. That's how you pay the cashier in the cafeteria. If you're not from NCAR, feel free to follow someone who is from NCAR down to the cafeteria. Go out down the stairs to the right. Um, when you get in the line, you can choose the special of the day. If that doesn't look good to you, there's a salad bar or you can request they make you a sandwich or a burger. And like I said, the NCAR people can help you out and let us know if you have any questions, and we're going to start promptly at 1.10. Thank you. This, this room will not be locked. However, I personally am going to leave my stuff in it. So, it, yeah. All right. Welcome back. We'll continue with the afternoon session. Uh, we'll kick off with a keynote talk. Uh, Peter Dubin will be presenting the next keynote. Uh, he's the head of the Earth System Modeling section at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Previously, he served as a AI and machine learning coordinator at ECMWF and a university research fellow of the Royal Society. And um, his research focuses on machine learning, HPC, and predictability in weather and climate simulations. And prior to ECMWF, he completed his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Metrology and uh, worked as a postdoc at the University of Oxford. Peter, uh, take it away. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to the, the workshop. I, it, it, it sounds like really a very interesting, lovely workshop. I would have loved to be there. Unfortunately, we have our own hackathon actually at East Nobleff at the moment from the project that I'm coordinating, so I couldn't travel. And so it's eight o'clock at my in my time zone right now and to make things worse i also have a terrible cold so if um please bear with me if i'm not kind of as um as agile as i normally and should be and with these talks but i hope we still get through the slides and everything should be fine so i'm going to talk about earth system models of the future it's a very broad and wide topic i i admit um partly because i've seen that there were a lot of details talks already in the in the conference and i'm sure um, by a lot of experts that I couldn't beat in terms of the technology part, but um, partly also because I think at the moment um, it's really a bit of a critical moment for our system modeling in principle. So I'm normally not using this kind of wording, 
but I'm basically saying, um, and this is kind of one of the messages of the talk, that F-System modeling is currently really experiencing quite disruptive changes, offering great opportunities as well. And this is um, in particular true as well for kind of correctness um, and reproducibility. And therefore, I'm kind of going to start from the big picture, the really big picture. Um, many of you have probably seen this slide before. Um, it's it's kind of a standard slide that we'd like to show at least nobody F. So what you see here is um, the, the x-axis is, is a time kind of developing over decades, um, and the y-axis is a forecast accuracy that we have, um, had at ESNWF. And the different colors are different forecast lead times. Um, so for example, blue is um, three-day forecast, and then it's five-day, seven-day, and the, the yellow one is a 10-day forecast. And what you should see is that the numbers are going up and up and up and up in a steady increase. So basically, um, the, the whole field of uh, system modeling, weather in particular, has kind of increased in the, in the accuracy. Um, and climate also definitely kind of um, benefiting from the same um, from the same factors um, that the weather models benefited from, namely kind of higher resolution because they have more compute power, um, also more observations and also better models in principle. So um, this was kind of summarized um, from Peter Bauer as a quiet revolution in a paper that is heavily cited. And it's kind of basically the, the, um, the recognition that, that our models have been really kind of improving over time. For decades, and this kind of there has this kind of there has been the steady increase in principle. Um, so I told you before um, that one of the reasons is basically because we had more compute power and we had higher resolution, and that's kind of visualized in this plot on the left here. So what what's what's here now is basically the peak performance that we had on different supercomputers at ESNWF over time, and the y-axis is now the resolution of the models that we were working with at the time when we had the supercomputer. And on the diagonal, you basically see the features that are now resolved explicitly within our simulations. And what you see is basically, um, as we kind of reach into the exascale, which we kind of do at the moment, um, we kind of get into a range where we can go to kilometer scale models. And this means that we can basically resolve convection explicitly, um, at least deep convection, um, that we can also kind of resolve surface track more, much more explicitly. So we, we kind of expect that a lot of uncertainties are kind of going to be healed by the step to one kilometer. So more resolution, more skill, better representation topography and gravity wave tracks, explicitly representation of convection. Um, also for the ocean, obviously, um, as you kind of go from eddy permitting to eddy resolving simulations, um, you should also be able to represent the tide and the variability better and also the tides. And also eventually we will reach kind of the same resolution as satellite um, simulations in principle, which will also help then for um, data simulation. So great, fantastic. Kilometer scale models should really be doing the trick. And we kind of explore a lot of kilometer scale models at ESNWF in principle, and we actually also see the benefits that we, you would expect to see. So for example, this slide here is showing the surface wind speed. On the top, you see like two different resolutions, um, the 29, nine and 4.5 um, kilometer. And you see the satellite picture on the right for Medicaine, so like a, a cyclone in the Mediterranean area. And you can clearly see that the increased resolution is helping you to really represent the surface wind speed um, better. And also, you can have positive impact, for example, on waves. So um, on the bottom, you now see kind of a plot where the model and the observation of wave height is kind of compared. And you see as you increase resolution from top, from left to right, this kind of line is basically tilting further to the diagonal, which means that the model is kind of better in representing those scales. So everything fantastic. Kilometer scale models really should do the trick. Um, however, um, we also see um, that kind of a simple push to kilometer scale models to operation does not really just work out of the box. Um, so what I've brought you here is um, on the left side, a plot of the frequency of high precipitation events. So you have on the x-axis the frequency, on the y-axis, uh, sorry, on the y-axis the frequency, on the x-axis the precipitation. The black line here is the observations, and as you see, is kind of the, our current model simulations in nine kilometers are not not don't have enough precipitation events of the heavy precipitation events in the model. As we go to four kilometers, it's getting better, and as we kind of, um, but as we switch off. Um, deep convection primation, we kind of jump actually to the blue line here, which is then massively overestimating um, the precipitation fields. And okay. only if we really go to 1.5 kilometers, we kind of kind of slowly converging towards the observations. This does not mean that the four and a half meter, for example, cannot do the trick, but it does mean that it's not going to run out of the box. We need to do more work here. And the same is true if you look into the precipitation, the zonal mean fields um, that you have in those simulations. So here, the, the black and the gray lines are the observations. Um, you basically you should compare the, the 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 other lines against the black line here, um, and again the the purple line is the nine kilometer simulation as we have in our models. And if you switch off convection for four and a half kilometers, you basically get something which really doesn't look too good because you have basically too much precipitation in the tropics. 
so the 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 um the, the story here really is um the kilometer scale models really should help quite a lot but they're not going to run out of the box and unfortunately um it's getting even worse if you think about compute power and data in particular so obviously we want to um, push those models as fast as possible um, as we have living in a, in, a, in a changing climate and we really want to kind of serve the society with the best possible predictions for both weather and climate. Um, but if you think about the compute power that you actually require to go from nine kilometers used in operations to one kilometer, you're talking about a factor of like nine cubed and that's 729. Um, even if Moore's law would still be working well, this would basically take you something like 18 years. So it's um, we're far away um, from the one kilometer simulations if we're doing business as usual. And on the other hand, um, oh, sorry, that, that has different different um, different uh, reasons. You all, uh, many of you will know this, I'm sure. And um, one of them is that you basically have to parallelize more. You have to run kind of hundreds of thousands of um, processes in parallel. Normally, the hardware is going to get more heterogeneous. CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, maybe even ASICs. You really have to think about like how to build the perfect hardware for your model as kind of most law is breaking down. And also machine learning has a very strong impact on hardware development with kind of high flop rates and low precision. Um, for the data, it's a similar picture. It's um, looking quite bad if you be, um, look at the, 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 the broad picture. So in a nine kilometer simulation, we have six and a half million points. In the horizontal, we have 137 levels and 10 variables. So that basically this means that our operational model right now has something like 9 billion um, prognostic variables in the model, which is something like half a terabyte if you store it. And if you now go to one kilometer, you end up with a single snapshot of the model being 20 terabyte. And um, this is really a problem. This basically means that kind of we, we, um, if we run like a, a year of simulations, for example, it's, it's literally impossible as a technology right now to store all the data um, as you would want to do, basically. So there's, um, the summary of this slide here is, um, is also like, a, 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 as much as it's not kind of just going to work out of the box for the model development um, on the previous slide, it's also going to be a huge effort um, kind of to do something like this for two kilometer scale on the hardware and data side. Um, this is the plot again that I showed you before, but now I also kind of put in the sustained performance on the top. Um, so basically the, the performance that we were actually able to work with for our application, the IFS. And what you see is kind of the, the sustained performing, for performance is obviously kind of increasing, that's nice, but the, the ratio of sustained versus peak performance is really going down. We started from something like two, and now we're down to a couple of percent. Um, I don't even want to know what the value, value now is on GPUs um, on exascale machines. It's probably a, a fraction of a percent, I guess. So this means that we're not going to, we're, 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 we're basically not really making very good use of our high-performance computers. Um, and what this basically means is that we need to have a lot of efforts to kind of get better there. And this is why we kind of um, have called for what we call the digital, digital revolution at some point. So we've published a paper basically kind of outlining how our system models would need to change to kind of make this possible, the step change in, um, in resolution to one kilometer. And this is kind of um, coming from all sorts of different, 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 different ways of doing this. <coughs> Excuse me. One of them is that you look into different numerical methods, you look into machine learning as well, you look into domain specific um, languages, but also you look into heterogeneous processing and memory um, architectures and all these kind of things. And this is a lot of effort. It's nothing that basically the business as usual, as usual could do for you. So therefore, um, we kind of called for quite a big project in, in Europe, which is Destination Earth. And the um, Destination Earth is kind of following the buzzword at the moment to kind of um, claim that they want to build the digital twins. And what you see here is basically the Earth um, simulation on the left, observation on the right. And the idea is that in a, as you go to kilometer scale simulations, you basically are able to um, to to have produce simulations that are so realistic that are difficult to kind of really distinguish even by domain scientists. And you kind of can basically argue that these simulations are so good that you can use them as digital laboratory and kind of make kind of try uh, try out different things and reduce, for example, the rainforest in the tropics and stuff like this and and see what's going to happen. A bit of buzzword bingo, but it basically helped definitely as well kind of to secure um, quite, a, quite a significant fraction of, of resources to kind of make the step towards kilometer scale models. And what do we do at ESNWF in particular? We are developing what we call the Destination Earth, um, en um, Destination Earth engine. And the idea here is that we basically kind of um, um, tackle all these kind of really major problems that we have in high performance computing, um, in IO and data workflows and software management and controlling workflows and visualization. I just kind of put in a couple of keywords here um, to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking into. Basically the idea is to kind of really push 
halve the, the different kind of problematic parts of the model and then go to a one kilometer and then also support the community to kind of um, follow sword. Okay, um, this is the, 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 the beautiful slide that I have to show you before I'm kind of moving on um, from kilometer scale modelings. Um, so this, these are simulations that we performed in the project called Next Gems. And what you see here is kind of that we kind of increase resolution of the ocean model and the sea ice model um, so much that we can now re really represent the, the cracks in the sea ice in the Arctic. Obviously, the, the, the standard vorticity field that um, should look good. But also here on the right, you see um, um, a, sim a simulation from next gems where you basically have the, the wind gusts on the surface, and you don't really introduce the topography in those in those plots. It basically just comes out from the field as you kind of interact with the, with the surface in principle, and you see all those kind of nice patterns of kind of interactions with islands and all these kind of things. So everything's great. Um, global models will be improving the realism of the simulation significantly, and they are also now becoming a so these simulations here are now only running a couple of weeks, but they're actually running for years and um, hopefully next year also for a decade. So it's kind of really that, that the Destination Earth project and NextGems and others have really also helped kind of to make those simulations um, viable um, for the community. And also obviously the, the push to GPUs and larger co computers. So that's great. Um, that's a digital version. I haven't talked about machine learning yet, and obviously I need to talk about machine learning. Um, what's happening here? Um, Basically, the situation was a while ago that we kind of really looked into different machine learning applications in different areas. Um, we try to understand our um, improve our understanding with machine learning simulations. We also try to speed up simulations in principle. We try to kind of improve models, and we also try to kind of combine different communities with each other. So, if you have, for example, a health data set over London, it's kind of good um, to it's, it's quite easy to compare it against the weather data if it's long enough, and really to kind of also get something going, even though um, you don't really know the, <laughs> excuse me, the perfect representation of the, the link between, for example, a health data set and weather. However, the weather and climate modeling centers have mostly kind of explored the hybrid space, and meaning that they basically were combining models, conventional models. And a lot of the centers actually missed the train of the kind of more, um, the, the more uh, more more strong basically idea of really replace the entire model by machine learning. So, as much as GD, um, GPT, for example, or some sort of um, machine learning competitions were kind of basically overthrown by by machine learning tools, um, we also have to do the, think about the same thing in weather and climate. And I'm sure many of you have, for example, seen the the approach by ForecastNet. So this is a, a snapshot of a talk by Jensen Wang at the GDC conference. Where it's basically showing like um, how high performance computing has changed over the years, and he says that there's a couple of um, revolutions. One of them is accelerated computing. One of them is to scale up and out, and the other one is now machine learning. And it's given the example why this is the case. Um, why are the forecast net, which is basically a machine learning model, trying um, to improve predictions? So um, this was a while ago, and we still kind of continue to ignore this to some extent and basically said like, okay, um, these models are really interesting. We'll learn more about machine learning, um, but many in the community didn't really think it's going to make a, make a, a real push towards like operations, for example. And this has changed. Um, and one of the reasons is basically the Graphcast paper. So that's a, um, a paper by Google and DeepMind where they're basically showing now um, the plot on the left. What you see here is that the, the lead time in days um, from, from one to 15, uh, sorry, to, from, from one to 10 for forecasts. And on the y-axis, you have different um, uh, different model fields at different kind of vertical levels and pressure. And whenever this field is, and um, this figure is blue, this means that the Google Deep Mind model is better than the deterministic prediction of IFS. So our in-house um, operational for weather forecast. It's not quite true for ensembles yet, but in principle, it's really fair to say that these machine learning models beat deterministic forecast scores. I mean, basically all quantities they want to. And that's quite something. That basically means um, <laughs> quite a lot to what, how we do numerical weather predictions in principle, right? Um, it is true that those models not necessarily work the same way as conventional models. So in a conventional model, you have a three-dimensional representation <laughs> of the atmosphere that is kind of consistent over time. It's physically consistent. You can start it whenever, and it's going to be, give you like a, a physically consistent results, even if you run it for years. Where those models here are kind of different, they, for example, use very large time steps. Um, they also train for root mean square errors, which basically means that they're smearing out over time. So this is one example here. On the left, you see era five from zero hours to 74, 72 hours of the truth for one uh, global field. And on the right side of the Ryan Keisler paper, you see the machine learning solution, and you see that it's kind of smeared out over time. 
So what does it actually mean for numerical weather prediction? At the beginning, again, the whole community was fairly kind of conservative and fairly basically said like, yeah, it's not really a physical model. So it's probably not going to be extremely um, well tuned. And, and there are there are all sorts of questions that were coming up. For example, can those models extrapolate um, if they're running into a different climate mode? Can they represent extreme events in particular if they are smearing out structures? Can they learn uncertainties and like an ensemble simulation? Can they be trained maybe even from observations and then basically also replacing data simulation? And also can they represent like physical consistency? So how good are these models actually? Um, and I just kind of summarized a little bit um, on this slide. I will come back to this later on, but basically what the models at the moment can and cannot do is um, that the conventional models um, uh, so, so many people now claim that, that the machine learning models will soon um, replace conventional models entirely because they're kind of beating them in forecast scores. That's not quite true, I think. Um, so it, I'm, 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 quite re I'm really convinced that conventional models will continue to be there and be surviving. Um, also because you want to look into the physical consistency, but also um, because you, you really also need those models in, in cases something uh, totally di different was happening, like for example, in a volcano eruption um, somewhere in Sicily or something like this. You will need those conventional models, whatever comes. Um, within the next couple of years, however, most of the weather predictions that people are actually using will probably come from machine learning models. And um, this is not only true, I mean, this doesn't only include like pure machine learning models, but it also includes, for example, post-processing of machine learning models or models that are run from the conventional analysis and these kind of things. And I think we as a community need to really kind of live with this fact. Um, so if you start your mobile probably and you have an Android phone and you go to um, a Google weather, weather forecast, as far as I know, this kind of is going to already include some kind of now casting from machine learning. So it's basically already the case that a lot of people are using machine learned forecast um, on a daily basis. Um, machine learning will be the perfect glue between models and observations. So it's really great to have this tool, even if you kind of just come from the conventional part because you can really um, relate all the different data sets to each other. Um, I strongly believe that still this kind of digital revolution is not for sake. I mean, you, you really need those model simulations to generate training data sets and kind of to really make sure that you um, can, can, can do the best out of, um, out of the data that you have. Um, oops. And also, um, I think what a lot of people are also underestimating is that these models will eventually also be useful for climate project projection. That's quite a statement. So the general idea is that if you have weather model simulations, for example, they they're fine because they don't really have to. They're, they're living. They're, they're calculating weather patterns that are seen today. Um, whereas in climate simulations, you basically have weather patterns that haven't been ever been observed, like for example, ice-free Arctic or something like this. And then we basically need to think about how, what these models can do, because we all know that deep learning models typically can't extrapolate. So how, how would this possible work? But I don't think it's going to be, um, I, I don't think we should kind of just live with this as a truth. And there's good reason to believe that, that these models will also kind of um, change their habit in, in, in this direction a little bit. Um, just to give you one example, this is um, a work by, by the Google team of Stefan Hoyer. And what they do is they take a dynamical core um, of a conventional model and kind of basically train a neural network to, to learn the physics, the entire physics package. And with those um, with, with this configuration, they are able to kind of run AMIP configuration simulations um, with a neural, but basically with a machine learned model. And that's quite spectacular. And also the results are quite spectacular in a sense that they actually kind of perform extremely well for, for example, tropical cyclones. Um, so the, the top is the observations, the middle is a neural, a neural model, and the, the bottom is, is kind of one of the leading um, global weather prediction models. And you see um, the, the, the frequency is better in the machine learning model. And also in terms of biases, for example, for precipitation, these models are really getting there. Um, I don't want to put down X field here at all. I just wanted to make the statement basically that um, you, you really, um, it, it's not, not just a sad thing that we can um, only run 20 year simulation, for example, with the, with the conventional model. And the same is also true for global mean temperature. Basically, the biases are kind of quite nicely um, represented in the machine learning model. OK, um, so that was, um, and, and also, I mean, there's a, the latest push in, in machine learning to kind of learn big models and also what we call foundation models that do like um, um, semi-supervised learning and representation learning. Um, this is also going to help to build more um, generic models that are actually kind of more consistent if you if you change the underlying data set. So, so there's more to come, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. I'm not saying I'm 100% I'm sure, but I'm saying there's more to come. So that's just let this one 
sink in. And now um, I was talked to, to talk about correctness and reproducibility. And after this kind of very high level overview, um, I'm sure Alison is already getting nervous because you want me to talk about correctness and reproducibility. Um, but I, I needed this introduction basically to make the following kind of statements in my talk. So what I wanted to say, show you is <laughs> sorry, that we basically have changed the work mode um, of kind of weather and climate modeling quite a lot um, in, the, in the recent decades, basically. So in 2010, when I kind of was a PhD student, um, it was possible that there was a single scientist as an institute um, and, and they would really understand the entire Earth system model. Um, you could go to someone and ask him about the wave model and they would know every line of the code and then you could ask the same person about convection and they would still know it. It's kind of already then there, the number was not very large, but there, there were people who were able to do this. Um, the codes were like 100 lines, 100,000 lines of photon code. Um, the, the codes were shared via tables and the data was stored locally, so kind of far away from what we do today. Um, and the models were running on CPUs and everyone was happy because most law was still working. Then there came this kind of digital revolution idea and people like Tim Palmer basically said, like, we really need like a critical mass of efforts to kind of make sure that this, the, 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 the scaling to one kilometer is going to work. So what he was always um, comparing our, the, our efforts with the, with the um, um, Airbus A380, which is kind of a huge plane that was developed by a lot of countries in, in Europe um, within the Airbus consortium together. And Tim was arguing that you should basically do the same thing and working together for like getting to the one kilometer scale. And then there was a digital revolution that pushed this quite heavily. And I'm really happy about the, the progress that, that we made with kilometer scale model. And Tim was right um, in that sense that you kind of needed big projects to kind of push this forward. However, it changed the modes of working in a sense that now a single scientist cannot understand the Earth system model anymore. So I don't know anyone. Um, if there's, I'm the head of the Earth system modeling section, I should probably know everything, but I don't. Um, and it's it's really um, that kind of the, the, this, these tools have been extremely have been become so so complex um, that it's kind of really also difficult to update them in the future. You need a team of software developers nowadays to actually kind of port those models to the genius hardware. We have, we have heard a lot of technical talks already today. Um, I'm sure you believe me there. Um, the models start now to run on GPUs and we could be better, but we're getting there. Um, however, most law is basically dying and the data is stored locally, still a lot of the data, but the meta information at least is kind of available online for simulations and then some of the data sets are kind of also getting online. And then there's also um, a really, really nice development towards online code repositories um, that are used for basically control quality and share model code. And I'm sure you all, you all know how to do um, basically um, you use, use code repositories nowadays. Um, this plot on the right, top right is basically just in, um, a sketch of what people do in newly supercomputing centers and how they view like how a supercomputer will look like in the future. And they basically have like all sorts of different um, hardware combined in this. So they have a uh, a GPU cluster, they have um, CPU clusters, they even talk about quantum computing and stuff like this. So basically the shape of supercomputers is going to change. It's not going to be this kind of, or at least I believe, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but the, the supercomputers, as far as I hear from the, the people developing those, um, they're going to be more heterogeneous. There's not going to be this monolithic parts. They're going to be um, kind of con consistently developed from different components and, and people will have different hardware available on a, on a, on a single side. Like, for example, um, you have a newly supercomputing center. However, the work mode is again going to change. Um, and this time, really, the machine learning parts are coming in. Again, the kilometer scale modeling and the work mode of 2020 is not going to disappear. But the machine learning models really change the way we work. Um, so basically, now I can go to the hackathon um, that I'm, 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 I'm teaching um, this week. And I can ask a student who's kind of quite a bright student and, and ask him. Uh, to build like a machine learning model with a couple of thousands of lines of Python code based on the existing machine learning models and um, giving us GPU. And you can probably, within a very short period of time, build a model that is better um, than, than our conventional forecast model. That's quite something. This basically leads to the case that you have more like hundreds of models running in parallel and not just a couple of them. Um, and also the HPC is going to change and it's going to be federated and not kind of localized in, in the same way. And the data is also going to be federated. So the models are going to be much more flexible to run on different supercomputers and people will not even know where the data is going to store. And this is kind of illustrated here by, the, by a figure that I've stolen from NVIDIA, where they basically argue that in the future, the client will kind of get access to the data point, but, but there will be a lots of different adapters for the data and, and really the user doesn't know um, where the data is, 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 is stored. So another change of work mode, really. 
Um, how do we address this? Um, again, the example of Destination Earth and um, for what we do at the, um, the European Weather Center. Kind of if you kind of start from the idea that on the left, you basically have Earth system models and observations. In the middle, you have the impact sector basically using the information from the Earth system modeling. And then you have the local user. Um, at the moment, it's kind of still one way. So we basically have simulations that we are scheduling and running, and then the impact sector is going to use them. And the user is basically going to profit in the end, but it's a one-way street. And with Destination Earth, the hope is that you kind of change this um, to also kind of make the user and the impact sector more interactive. So you basically bring the user in, they should be able to really um, kind of start simulations um, for a specific um, event that is happening, for example. If it's, it's a local extreme event, for example, they should be able to say, okay, we want to have an additional global model simulation at higher resolution and these kind of things. Also within the global model simulations, the local one at even higher resolution and so on and so forth. So it should be more interactive in principle in the future, which again means that the models are need to be much, much more um, dynamic in a sense that it's not just kind of uh, one person be able to run the model on a specific computer. It's really the community who should be able to run on different machines. And this should basically help us to also kind of reach this kind of very high resolution. Um, well, or within Destination Earth, we're really kind of pushing the resolution here as well. Okay, um, reproducibility, there's a lot of room for pessimism if you kind of, kind of consider everything that I've just said. Um, so I'll just give you one example. In 2020, the IFS basically was able to run on, on our local machine in production mode, everything was fine. The machine was kind of built for the model really. Um, but it was difficult to kind of still port the model to other computers and be kind of spending a lot of effort even then um, to kind of do this. In 2024, next year, we're basically hoping that we will be able to run semi-operational predictions <laughs> on UHPC supercomputers with IFS within Destination Earth. And it doesn't matter which machine it is. It shouldn't be matter whether it's an AMD machine in Lumi or whether it's an NVIDIA machine in Leonardo. Um, the user shouldn't really know um, where the model is starting to run. And um, all of you working on reproducibility can probably see that this is going to be quite a challenge. So it's nothing. It's not going to be easy to do something like this, and a lot of things can go wrong. Um, it's also true that a lot of the high-end models, kind of, to get this portability, use often kind of different tools for like different different components, right? I mean, we're investing a lot into domain-specific languages, but in the end, for example, for the spectral transform that we have, it is really tough to kind of build one code base that can run on AMD and NVIDIA at the same time. It's not impossible, but um, just kind of this breadth of the different approaches that we have around um, is, is, is just tricky and it's going to be tricky for a while. And then machine learning really adds a new dimension of complexity or several new dimensions actually. So um, just think about people in the future getting pre-trained models from, from, um, from, from online and kind of retraining them locally and then sharing them again and stuff like this to make something like this reproducible is, is really, 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 really difficult. And I would probably say impossible. Um, so the use of um, retrained problems models and pre-trained models is going to be really a, a challenge for re reproducibility. Then things like transfer learning, um, people will use a model learning in one data set and then relearning it on another and yet another, and then the new data is coming in and stuff like this. So that's also going to be pain. Um, foundation models um, basically tend to, there's a trend at the moment in other areas where people build bigger and bigger machine learning models that are then reused for several purposes. So again, people are using basically a chain of models, one, one pre-trained foundation model, and then a local model for their specific application and so on and so forth. And then there's also um, the need of to keep track of the data set itself. Um, and, and also not only the data set, but also the data manipulation. So a lot of the models are, for example, working with your five data. That's fantastic, cool. Um, but they do local um, manipulation of the data to kind of prepare them for their machine learning tasks. So it's a lot of pain points here and a lot of new dimensions that we haven't really had before. What way can we do machine learning in principle? The best way to do it um, for reprodu reproducibility is to define um, a benchmark data set. So a benchmark data set is basically a problem statement. And then you also publish the data online. You kind of pro provide Jupyter and Python notebooks for the user to work with um, that they can reproduce exactly what you've done, for example, in the paper. Um, you have a reference machine learning solution to, that the people can work with, and then they can change it and kind of really make a um, quantitative um, comparison because they also have the evaluation metrics and diagnostics. And if it's a good benchmark, you would also have a computational um, information about this. And once you've done this, basically people can use your benchmark and they can uh, um, forget about a lot of uh, the, um, a lot of the, the problems that you have to reproduce them, and they should really be able to kind of uh, compare, make a quantitative comparison against your work. And that's something um, that we thought about quite quite a lot um, in, in, in recent years. And we came up um, with 
with a paper where we tried to basically describe um, where you would need those benchmark data sets. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but every, basically every single of those boxes would need something like a benchmark data set to really kind of solve um, solve the issue of of making making the approaches reproducible in the different areas. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done here, and it's actually really hard to build those benchmark data sets. Um, there are a couple of approaches. So the Milestone project, that's a, the same project that is keeping me busy this week um, with the hackathon. We kind of, for example, develop those benchmark data sets for six application areas publish them and i think it's working well in the sense that also the community is really picking it up um and really kind of starting to develop around those benchmark data sets. and then by no means the only person i'm sure there are a lot of people in the room also working on benchmark data sets just um bare level overview one of them is um weather bench and um, so the one of them the benchmark data, set, data sets that were kind of quite influential were was a bit um, uh, <coughs> sorry a data set called weather bench that was really kind of trying to, to build a benchmark for these global machine learning weather forecast models. And it worked well in a sense that the community actually um, picked up the challenge. Um, it didn't work extremely well because people started to build up their own data sets, but they really kind of learned or they, they really kind of followed the, the procedures about the diagnostic at least. And now um, recently we have published a new data sets and um, which is WeatherBench 2. And again, um, this is kind of quite, quite some effort and um, interestingly, you will basically see um, that this is a paper that was um, mainly really, really done by um, Stefan Rast and um, Stefan Hoyer, but you also see contributions from the European Weather Center here, and that's not by chance. So what basically happened was that um, the, the big technology companies are building um, extremely nice um, machine learning models for the future, but as I told you before, it's really, really difficult to understand actually how good those models are. And it's not only for us difficult and for the user, but also for, for companies like Google. So, um, we had a lot of discussions and then we um, about like how to evaluate those models um, between the different companies and ESNBDF, whether it's NVIDIA, Huawei, Google, we all basically talk to each other because it's something that needs to be done by the community. It's not something that you can basically just say like, okay, um, if I if I heal this loss function, everything is going to be fine. Um, everyone will believe me because people are, 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 are scared of kind of unphysical models in principle. And you really need to show um, that the models are kind of really doing something useful. And that's a community effort. That's nothing that you can do alone, even if you're a technology company. So what we've done at ESNBF, for example, because obviously it's it's really at the core of our um, of our of our um, mission that we kind of develop the best possible models for medium range weather predictions, like a couple of days into the future. We have looked into those models quite in detail. And we, for example, have published here a paper where we kind of took one of those machine learning models, the Pango weather model from Huawei, um, and we're running it in-house, and we really made an extremely detailed analysis of what the model can and cannot do. And the results are, were actually kind of quite surprising in the sense that the models are performing quite well. Um, it's not just the mean scores that are kind of doing well, but it's actually also doing well for other things, including a lot of the extreme events. Um, what we've also done is we basically took three of the models, um, ForecastNet from NVIDIA, um, Graphcast from Google, and Pangu Weather from Huawei, and we are now running them daily. And if you go to our webpage, you will basically see, um, you, will, you will be able to click through the weather forecasts of today into the future using those three models. And um, this was quite a lot of effort. Why did we do this? Because we really need to understand what those models can and cannot do. And you need the community to look into. So I was talking to kind of users of those of, of weather predictions today in the hackathon, and they basically told me that they're already looking into um, these, these forecasts and they learn a lot of things. And, and it's really important to get this feedback from the community nowadays. We also have kind of built our own model um, so far. So I think two and a half weeks ago or so, we published the first simulation, um, the first results from the AIFS, which is kind of the machine learning model of the IFS now, also for medium range and still deterministics. But, we are definitely also developing in, into this direction now. Um, this is just to prove that it's just too simple to say that these models cannot do extremes. It's it's absolutely clear that they they these models are not very good, for example, in the wind speeds of tropical cyclones and um, because they're smearing out and stuff like this, but the tracks are, for example, very good. And also if you think, for example, for cold spells, the models are actually very good. Um, so this is a, um, a forecast for um, a severe cold um, spell in Finland so what you what you well, the measurements is kind of this little dot down here and the climatology is a red one so it was really an extreme cold event and what you see the blue one is the ensemble as it kind of progressed in time the conventional ensemble and you can see that kind of a couple of uh, at some point the ensemble picked up that there's going to be cold um cold weather and then kind of stayed stayed at this kind of cold area but the machine learning models for example the cn dot here actually picked the signal up 
earlier. Um, so it's not that, that that just because the models are smearing out, they actually um, would not be able to kind of really learn extreme events in general. And this is interesting. This is nothing that you can get from the scores. This is nothing that you can even get from just looking at a single forecast. You really need someone who knows forecasts to look into this to kind of find these kind of special events, for example. So um, basically, the big question, why was this approach of global machine learning models so successful? And the, the main answer really is um, because the data set was there. And you can get the um, ERA-5 reanalysis data from Copernicus um, that we developed at ESNWF online. And this is basically the data that is used to kind of build those model, model simulations. And it allows you not only to kind of um, to, to get it for free and from the web, but you also um, have the weather bench, for example, as a benchmark data set that really tells you what, what the model could and should and should not be able to do. <coughs> um, so open benchmark data sets are really needed to allow for a quantitative um, comparison. Um, and on the other hand, and I'm pretty sure, as I said before, the kilometer scale models will also make a difference here in the future because um, a lot of the training data set will, will come from kilometer scale simulations because observations are typically not good enough um, in a lot of different aspects. Some aspects, there's no problem. If you're interested in, in view potential height of five and hectopascal, that's not a big deal. If you're interested in um, precipitation or topography, um, I'm pretty sure that kilometer scale models will find this place. So reproducibility, there's actually also a lot of room for optimism. Um, so as you all no, um, but please, yeah, just take a second to reflect on this. And um, we're really getting better with Git standards and CI testing and all these kind of things. And also this push to, to domain specific languages really helps to unify models and um, in the sense that that we can run them on different hardware from, from one code base, for example, and so on and so forth. Um, many more data sets are nowadays open. Um, and this is going to an extent where a lot of journals are really also requiring you to publish open data and open source code up to a point that it's getting annoying for us at ESNWF, for example, because we can't publish our IFS code with a paper. So we really have had difficulties in the past to publish papers about IFS anymore because we can't publish the source code. And that's, we can, we can get angry about this, but in principle, it's a good thing. Um, then most machine learning models and training data sets are published with the papers. Um, in particular, the machine learning community is actually really good in doing this. Um, for example, those those three tech companies that I mentioned a number of times now, they all have published now their data and all have pu published now um, the, the forecast model and how they train. So it's really something something worth mentioning, I guess. Um, bitwise reproducibility may not be that important anymore as well in the sense that um, the same way that we analyze the machine learning models, like I showed you before with Brother Bench 2, in the same way um, we will also learn how to kind of evaluate the, the, the forecast model in, in principle. So to really go through this idea of, of not having a physical model may actually also help the community to kind of really understand the differences between different model simulations better. And then compute and data handling will hopefully be more unified as we approach federated data and computing. So if we, for example, go for Destination Earth for the same model is running on three very different supercomputers, we need to kind of um, unify this, this process and we need to kind of spend more effort really to unify it than, than if you would just run it on our own machine. So hopefully the models will actually get better. Um, I'll close with just one one call to action to some extent. Um, so if you really want to check the correctness of your model, I strongly believe that we need to do more with kind of automated tools in principle. And I know that, that this is also nothing new to um, to all of you. Um, you have seen this in the past, but kind of we have one paper where we kind of look into a reduced numerical precision. So the idea is to take the, the uh, radiation scheme of, of our model and then try to work with half precision as much as possible. And as you do so, you will get all sorts of problems because on all sorts of funny lines, you'll get a problem that you wouldn't even recognize. And um, what, what we did in this paper is basically that we went from a deterministic run of our scheme to something like an ensemble simulation. It's not a proper ensemble in a sense that it's kind of really representing the uncertainties, but it's kind of based on, an, on perturbations that are growing in a nonlinear model. And as you do so, so you can basically compare a reduced, emission, reduced position simulation, for example, against the ensemble, um, this means that if you are lucky, you will find um, the, the range where the deterministic run is outside of the ensemble and you will know that there's an error. If you're unlucky, um, the model will kind of just jump back into the distribution. So what you re should really do is kind of compare ensembles of um, the reduced position and the double position simulation. And then you will know when you have a statistical difference. And the great thing is now that you, this, is can, this can be done automatically. So you can basically really um, build tools that can do this for every single line of code. You propagate the entire ensemble through the model in Fortran um, and then you basically will be able to um, to detect the specific line where you kind of start to, to separate from each other. And the same is true um, 
if you kind of think about the dynamic ranges of numbers, so you have a lot of parameters here from the, the radiation scheme, and you have the double position simulation, and this is kind of just the, the, um, the distribution of the, the number ranges that you had. And by looking into this, um, this, this number range that you kind of diagnosed with an automatic tool, you will be able to understand where um, you kind of just cutting the number range, um, which is kind of problematic, and where the number range is probably OK, because it's just kind of going to win close, close to 0, for example. OK, um, so what's our aim today? Um, so what, what are we heading towards in a community, and what do we want? Um, I think we should really think about more like um, putting data sets and reanalysis data and observations and all these kind of things really um, together in a form that we can all access as open data and federated data storage. That's really important. And also that we have next to it federated computing that people can work with. And this basically needs a lot of work on uniform APIs for data sets, for example. It also needs uniform packages and so on and so forth. So it basically needs a little bit of a centralized approach as well. Um, there would be, imagine if there would be conventional models um, and machine learning models that can just be used out of the box. So um, everyone can start those models and kind of test them and, and not just the, the modeling centers like ESNWF would do this, but it's kind of, you could on demand, for example, let a destination Earth simulation run. All these tools will be scalable and easy to use. You can use them on a laptop, but you can also use them on a supercomputer. And they're also kind of following various computing languages. And again, I mean, we're doing massive strides and kind of kind of forming one computing language into the other, into the other. Um, <laughs> tools like GT4Pi, for example, are really interesting here. Tools like Loki and other um, Cyclone, the main specific languages are really interesting to do this. So there's a lot of development right now. Then imagine there would be off-the-shelf tools to interpret physical reasoning, for example, and unsupervised machine learning for domain scientists and kind of would really make it easy to also bring domain scientists into machine learning. And also that you have off-the-shelf machine learning solution for a lot of things like, for example, um, downscaling or something like this. You would not really need to kind of start a new research project for three years, but you basically would know how to do it because people have done it before in a similar application. And if you do this, you need to fight complexity and diversity of software with centralized infrastructure to some extent. And you basically need to centralize a lot of efforts and norms. And here, I think really that the big projects um, that I suggest, like Destination Earth, and um, also NVIDIA's project Earth2, for example, and also um, the initiative E for kind of climate models in principle, may really kind of help the community to kind of get together and kind of have this critical mass for infrastructure development in principle. Uh, one last point I want to make is, um, as you do so, you also kind of spawn a little bit of a risk in a sense that um, we we now have to work together with with Google and with DeepMind and and um, Nvidia and other companies, and that's something new for the community, right? The community is used to be public um, and with weather centers and climate centers, and they're de developing their models and running them, and just suddenly um, the technology companies are also coming in, and this also means that we kind of need to kind of change our workflow a little bit. And we kind of try to discuss um, how this, what, what this means in, in this paper that we also have recently published. Um, but again, it's really also about um, protocols again and standards that you would need to kind of set up for the data sets. So last slide, um, what have you learned? I just showed you that we had the quiet revolution at some point, but it's kind of finishing in that sense that we ne now need to make the stat change really to kilometer scale models. And to do this is a huge effort and we need the digital revolution for this. However, we're getting on quite well in a sense that like really projects like Destination Earth are really helping us to kind of push the limits here and we're doing well. But then suddenly also the machine learning resolution came in. And this basically means that we're going to be shaking up quite uh, uh, once more in a sense that a PhD student can actually run a very good model. Um, and to, for this to be successful, data needs to be open and easy to use and um, to make progress. And then there's also the next steps that are coming. Um, and I'm quite optimistic in principle that the models will be better, tools will be easier and the data and HPC will be federated. And for this to really work out extremely well, we need kind of infrastructure um, projects that are kind of really helping us to unify our systems. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for a very interesting talk. Questions for Peter. Online questions? Let's thank, thank again. And then I'll move on to the next talk.
our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Michael Koblenz from Department of Computer Science, UC San Diego. How about now? Okay. Okay. So, um, so this is primarily actually Lisa's project. I'm going to defer to her for the hard questions. Um, okay. So, um, let me just first talk a little bit about uh, my perspective and our perspective, right? So, you know, um, you know, I come from a background of programming languages, software engineering, and human-computer interaction. So, the research question that we think about in my group is how we can help people write uh, software more effectively, right? So, I'm interested in a wide variety of different kinds of uh, people writing different kinds of software. Um, of course, climate change is one of the major issues of our time, so I became interested, interested in this question. Uh, and so I'm coming at this from a programming languages and tools lens, right? So I want to know how we can equip scientists who are writing software to be more effective at writing the software that they're trying to write. Um, so I want to give a little bit of context regarding programming languages researchers, uh, right? So programming languages researchers are maybe different from software engineering researchers in some ways. Um, so software engineering researchers are interested in a variety of things, but programming languages researchers, um, in many cases, are interested in mathematical proof, right? So proving that programs are correct, uh, and then we can talk about what the, what does correct mean and what kind of specification do you have and what can you express in the specification. Um, maybe also proving that programs don't have specific classes of bugs, right? It may be impossible to prove uh, correctness in general, but maybe there are specific classes of bugs that we can rule out. Of course, we don't want uh, any particular kinds of bugs in our software. Uh, but then maybe we also want to make it easy to, to, for people to reason about programs. So what does reason mean? You know, people, uh, we want people to be able to come to correct conclusions about the behavior and performance of their, so their software. And then finally, of course, we want software to run efficiently, so faster and consuming less energy. Um, so you know, my perspective is about people, right? So I want to know what we can do to make people more effective. And so you know, I want to know what we should tell scientists about how to engineer software successfully. Uh, so, you know, one possibility is maybe we should hand them software engineering textbooks. So there are all these textbooks here, and maybe if they absorb the lessons of software engineering uh, that were, you know, uh, uh, have been found useful in industry, then uh, maybe the world would be better. But it turns out, as probably you all already know, you know, scientists are actually different from software engineers in a variety of ways, right? So, um, so there's a variety of reasons why software engineering research maybe does not apply directly to scientists, right? So software engineers... In many cases assume that scientists, that, 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 that excuse me, that, that people, people, people who are writing software has, have extensive training in programming. Um, they assume that software engineers uh, care about software, right? That the artifacts they create are like uh, sort of primary to their mission. Um, and also that they typically work in large teams to build important artifacts over a, a long period of time. Uh, and this is not the case in a variety of kinds of scientific programming, right? So in many cases, the software is actually secondary, right? The results or the papers are actually with the important part. Uh, the programming background of scientists can be kind of inconsistent, right? I can't tell you what programming background a scientist has in advance uh, and possibly minimal, right? Maybe they have a background in physics and they want to write some software and they learn sort of barely what they need to know to get the job done, uh, but maybe not as much as we would like them to, to know. And in many cases, they work on uh, small projects, right? So uh, in contrast with the climate models that we've been talking about, a lot of scientists work with very small code bases, you know, maybe even less than 10,000 lines of code. But these code bases may leverage earlier projects, right? So it's not the case that these are one-off one um, projects. Uh, they may uh, you know, be important over a long period of time. Um, 
but it doesn't really fit the model that software engineering researchers kind of assume um, software development looks like. So we interviewed 25 scientists about the practices that they uh, use and the challenges that they encounter to try to understand what practices tend to lead to more effective uh, software engineering in the context of science. Uh, so we used uh, techniques fr uh, from, a, uh, from uh, grounded theory, um, which is a method from uh, actually sociology to analyze the transcripts of these interviews. And so, so this is qualitative research, right? The goal is actually to form hypotheses um, and to come up with some sort of theory that we hypothesize um, has uh, some relationship with reality, right? Uh, and, and in particular, the goal is to identify opportunities for tool development and for, for uh, recommendations that we can give people how to be more effective. So we recruited 20 scientists and five support staff across a wide variety of different scientific disciplines. So these are probably different from a lot of people uh, that we've heard about today, right? These are scientists um, you know, in uh, you know, oceanography and linguistics and math and geosciences, uh, bioinformatics, wide variety of different kinds of fields. Uh, by and large, these are not people who are building climate models, but some of these people are consumers of climate models, right? They take the outputs and then they want to run Python code or MATLAB code or R code to analyze the results and then come to some conclusions. Um, you know, since we're trying to pr produce tools that will be relevant to a wide variety of different kinds of scientists, that's why we were fairly broad in our focus. Uh, but they're fairly experienced, right? Most of these people, you know, have PhDs, they have, you know, many years of experience. So we wanted to know, you know, what challenges they had uh, and what they typically do. So um, for the rest of this talk, I'll focus on what we found. We identified six factors that, that seem to relate to efficacy. Um, so, and, and in particular, we identified this kind of positive feedback loop here, right? So if you think of efficacy kind of here in the middle, um, we found that you know, people who, who feel they're effective feel more confident, right? And, and if you feel more, more confident about your skills, you may feel that more education will help you be even more effective. So these people tended to get more education, which led to more technical skills. And of course, technical skills are directly relevant to efficacy. But in addition, uh, the software engineering practices that people used led both directly to efficacy and also to a more collaborative atmosphere. Right? And if you have a more collaborative atmosphere, then you have resources to use, right? You can have people you can go ask for help. You can give back to the community by, by giving help to other people. Uh, so this collaborative atmosphere is really critical for people feeling effective. Um, now you can ask, well, what kind of um, technologies should we provide people? And the, or our proposal here is that we should be providing technologies that pr provide a gradual learning curve, right? So the idea is with a little bit of effort, you can achieve a small uh, amount of gain as opposed to having to make a large uh, investment up front in order to achieve a large benefit. So I'm kind of got, going to go through each of these areas in turn. So let's first talk about software engineering practices. Um, we talked a lot today about testing. What we saw among these scientists is that testing was often kind of ad hoc and visualization based. So, you know, for example, nine people tried unit tests uh, and most of those found it really futile because it wasn't clear what the units were. Um, so they would do things like, you know, they would run their code and then they would look at a visualization. They would kind of eyeball a visualization. Oh yeah, okay, that's kind of what I expected. Okay, we must be, we must be good. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, verification today. Uh, so from a programming languages perspective, when people say verification, what they usually mean is formal verification, um, which means not testing, but actually writing formal proofs. Um, and not just formal proofs, but proofs that can be checked by a computer. So we can be really sure that actually the proof corresponds with the code that is actually being run. Um, here, you know, people are trying to do, in some cases, unit tests, and even that doesn't seem to be effective. Uh, version control, you know, we recommend version control, but you know, people typically use version control for collaboration, right? So sometimes with ad hoc methods like emailing files back and forth or, you know, file one dot C, file two dot C, okay, maybe not dot C, right? Uh, it's kind of, kind of gets to be very hard to maintain. Um, one participant said, well, before starting to use version control, well, six months pass, and you realize that some analysis that you have done before, okay, that's actually sort of useful. Uh, and then if you have to rewrite it every time, it can get quite annoying. Right, so they weren't using version control, so they didn't have access to the code that they wrote six months ago. It's gone. Uh, we didn't see structured processes. You know, people talk about agile development and other kinds of process-based techniques, and we we didn't see that. People seem to sort of do whatever they want to do. Um, two of the twenty scientists were in ongoing collaborations with multiple programmers, so this suggests that a lot of programmers actually work either 
either on their own or kind of like a student and an advisor working together, as opposed to a large scale development effort with a big team. So it seems like there's a lot of opportunities here, right? The, the books that I showed at the beginning do not really address these kinds of situations, right? So, and there's a big gap between what we're telling people they should do if, we, if they look in a book and what seems to actually be the truth on the ground. The collaborative atmosphere is really important. So six of the participants worked on projects that were uh, either uh, that were alone plus an advisor. Uh, one uh, student said, well, I asked my advisor, can I do Python? He was like, well, you can do whatever, but I can only help you in MATLAB. Well, I'm going to need help. So I decided to do it in MATLAB. Um, there's also reliance on tech support. So some of the people we talked to worked at supercomputing centers. So they have technical professionals there who can help the scientists with their code. And the scientists really needed that kind of resource, right? They weren't able to appropriately level, leverage the HPC systems without help. Uh, on the other hand, the, the tech support people give advice according to the skills that they think, think the scientists have, right? So they would say, well, you know, I would like to give you this advice, but here's the advice that I think you can handle right now, <laughs> right? So there's kind of a gap there. Um, finally, you know, the sense of belonging to a community is really important for engaging in a community. But scientists really don't identify as software engineers. So if we tell them, hey, you know, please just use Stack Overflow, which is full of software engineers, maybe that's not actually a good solution. Right? Maybe we need communities in which people feel engaged and feel like they're, they're full mm -hmm. members. Self-confidence is a really interesting theme. Um, there's a theory called motivation theory that says if your goal in achieving something is performance, that is achieving some goal, and not some kind of intellectual fulfillment, then self-confidence motivates learning. So on the other hand, if you fail, then that may demotivate learning, right? If you are not able to achieve something, why bother learning more? You're not going to be able to achieve it anyway. So participant 21 said, well, bash is a little bit stressful sometimes. I accidentally used a recursive chmod on my personal computer, and I locked myself out of it. There's so much power over your actual system. Right? So you can really get yourself in trouble. Um, the same participant uh, typically waits for a job to finish rather than learning how to parallelize the job. At first, I thought it was going to be really easy. Well, I haven't used it yet. I know it exists and it'll be helpful, right? But they're kind of not sure that if they put in the time, they're really going to master this skill. 17 out of the 20 scientists reported some kind of apprehension or anxiety about programming. 18 reported guilt over, over not following software engineering guidelines. I probably should be doing that, but you know, I haven't had a reason to. So let's talk about education. 15 scientists reported that lack of education is a primary problem. Just to be clear, these are mostly like highly educated people, right? Um, 10 of them had taken programming classes, but they felt like they weren't actually enough to give them the background that they needed. Um, there are workshops like the software carpentry workshops, which people reported as being very helpful, but the workshops tend to be too shallow. So I want someone to actually explain to me fundamentally what Python is and how it works and what is an environment and what is it doing on the back end and also what is Anaconda? Um, so this low self-confidence might lead to a desire for more formal education as opposed to informal education, right? If you're not sure you can learn on your own, maybe you're not going to go like sit on YouTube and try to figure things out. Maybe you want to take a class. But, you know, the, the computer science classes that we offer are not really a good match, right? You can't tell people, oh, just go take a class on data structures and you'll be good, right? That's not a good match. Um, so some key technical skills, aside from the domain-specific skills that are relevant to individual domains, um, a lot of people had trouble with data management. You know, how do you actually get to the data? How do you read the data from this file in some funny file format? Um, how do you predict how much memory and storage this program is going to use? Right, I run it on my laptop, it goes overnight. Okay, if I give it another day, will it be done, or will it take another year to finish? Right, I, I don't know. All I know is it's not done yet. Um, a lot of people use these visualization libraries. Uh, this person, I think, this is a physicist. Or histogram libraries are lovingly created. A little bit too much religion is involved in creating histogram libraries. So, you know, how can we design visualization libraries that appeal to a wide variety of different kinds of people uh, across domains? Uh, the gradual learning curve, it seems like it is very important. So what you, you want here is a small effort in learning to result in some sort of small reward. Um, in reality, in many cases, a small effort is not really rewarded. Instead, you need a large effort in order to get a large reward, right? So. Uh, some examples of this, right? If you're using a, a, a GUI interface to use a high-performance computing system, and now you realize that you know the GUI doesn't express all the things you want to express, so maybe you're going to use a command line system instead. Well, okay, but now you got to learn Bash, and also avoid doing a recursive chmod, right? 
Um, if you're using Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, and then you want to use a traditional programming environment, well, now you've got to learn a whole IDE, and you've got to learn a debugger, and you've got to learn how to, again, maybe run things on the command line. It's a whole learning group, right? You can't just like take a gradual step toward running, running things in a traditional way. Uh, likewise, local to high performance computing systems, right? You know, maybe you, you write a script, but write a Python script locally, and it's great, except now you want to use it with 100 times as much data. And you can't just like run it on the supercomputer. I mean, it has super in the name, but <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Um, in contrast, you know, Resnick has this model of low floors, high ceilings, and wide walls. So the idea here is that a low floor represents sort of a low barrier to entry, right? You want many different kinds of people with many different kinds of background to be able to easily start using the tools. And then a high ceiling, meaning you can accomplish uh, anything you want to accomplish uh, after you've sort of gotten past the learning curve. And then wide walls, meaning you can accomplish a wide variety of different kinds of tasks within the same system. You don't need to learn a new system uh, just to accomplish a slightly different task. So here's the vision that we're kind of laying out, right? Uh, we want to develop languages and tools that afford a gradual progression from a small scale analysis on your laptop to complex software development that maybe runs on a supercomputing system or on the, in the cloud. Um, we want to develop and validate scientific software engineering practices and tools, right? We don't want to just tell people like, here's the book about what worked at Google. So, you know, good luck with that, right? We want to actually show people, um, here are some practices that have been shown to be effective of your empirical methods among scientists. And therefore we think that if you use these methods, you too will benefit. Uh, we wanna facilitate gradual learning via low commitment formal education, right? So people want formal education, but they're not gonna sign up for a one semester or multi-semester you know, course sequence, right? So how can we give people um, sort of small dose education that meets their needs and we structure that. So some programming languages uh, ideas that we, we think are worth considering, and I'm hoping to discuss with all of you as the, the, the workshop continues, is whether, you know, for example, functional programming might be a good match, right? Can we make a functional programming language that sort of looks a little bit like Python? Maybe it's actually a closer match to the paper is the math that people are doing anyway. Uh, maybe shared state is not as big a deal if we can sort of figure out how to control it. Uh, maybe we can do automatic parallelization for particular kinds of programs that people are trying to run. Maybe we can do automatic resource estimation. There's technology for this in the programming language literature. So we can predict how long things will take and how much memory they need. And then high performance, right? So uh, you know, maybe we don't want to allow, or maybe we don't want to have garbage collection be the, be the default. Um, maybe we want to sort of use um, techniques from things like Rust, where we can make run, things run very fast. So you know, in conclusion, really appropriating software engineering practices and tools has led to a lot of guilt and challenges engaging between the scientific and software engineering communities. But these practices may not be appropriate anyway. So uh, our argument is that we should be designing tools and, pra and, and uh, practices that are centered around gradual adoption and which we can show make scientists much more effective. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, thanks. That's an interesting study. Um, so one of the things that I that surprised me when I first started uh, talking to climate scientists about their practices, um, particularly I discovered this at the UK Met Office, but I've seen it elsewhere. And that is they're very, very skeptical about picking up any new software engineering tools. Not so much for the reasons that you've described, although all the reasons you've described are relevant, but because any tool they pick up, they want to know is there for the long term. So they're not going to pick up commercial software where the company might disappear next year and not yeah. be able to support it. They won't even pick up open source tools unless there's already a very demonstrated community keeping that, uh, keeping that open source tool alive. So they're very judicious about which tools and which practices they pick up. So there's an intentionality to it. And I don't know if you saw that in the interviews that you did. So the, the participants that we had were mostly doing sort of smaller scale development, right? So this is mostly like a student and an advisor working on a project for, you know, a year or two or six, right? right. And we're not so much talking about these large scale climate models that, 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 that you saw at the Met Office. Um, so I think the set of concerns may be a little bit different. Um, you know, how often, like, I'm not sure that the PhD students are thinking like in 20 years, will my Python code still run? Which, I mean, that's a, that's a real problem. Uh, they should, they should. Um, so, but, but I think a lot of the, a lot of the, um, 
the arguments that we're making are for practices that we don't we haven't yet identified, but which are lighter weight, right? So if you said like keep using Fortran, but can you like at least like have a backlog and use an agile process? You know, you don't have to commit for the next twenty years to use agile, right? You could do it this week, and okay, that didn't work. I'm gonna try something different. So I think different kinds of tools have different levels of commitment required. Uh, I had a question about the uh, ideas you listed. Uh, one of them was uh, functional programming. So, uh, I, I don't have any practical uh, you know, experience with it, but my understanding is it's very inefficient. So did you, uh, you know, envision it being actually used in computations or maybe more like a prototyping capacity? Yeah, so whether it's efficient depends on the details. Um, it's like, I mean, Python is very inefficient too, but people are using Python, right? So, um, so functional programming languages can actually be extremely efficient if you use them appropriately. Um, and, and that's sort of why I had this caveat about maybe we don't want garbage collection, right? So like, that's, it's like the, the, one of the typical major performance costs in functional languages is that you end up with a lot of garbage. Um, so my proposal is let's take some ownership ideas from Rust and get some uh, compiler control over the garbage so that we can actually reason statically about memory allocation and avoid, because memory allocation is extremely expensive. But if we can reason about that statically, maybe we can really keep that cost down. So like if you look at Rust, very efficient. Let's think again. Oh, there's one. Uh, we have time. Uh, so to follow up maybe on the the, the answer to Steve's question. Um, so if I understand correctly, one of the goals of this would be in the context of helping, say, like a grad student who's working with an advisor um, move into better software engineering practices and sort of make that barrier of entry lower. Um, so maybe one thing to consider, if that's the, in case, the, the case that you're going for, is how we best set that grad student up for one of these big projects when they graduate, right? Because presumably their goal would be to graduate and maybe join a giant climate center like NCAR or DOE or any of the other ones represented here. Um, and then they would find themselves working with say some kind of software that has to have longevity or maybe something like C++ or Julia or something like that. So um, yeah, I wonder if you have given that any consideration. So I guess I think about sort of right sizing techniques and tools. So the tools that are appropriate for the student with their advisor might not be the right tools that they should use when they're in a large setting. Um, and I, I mean, I don't, I don't think the solution is just assume that everything is big. I think the solution is figure out what is needed in each case and, and build the right thing, right? So it's like, you know, some people use C, so therefore everything should be in C. Well, no, I mean, there's a variety of different tools in different places. Um, and I don't think we can predict today, you know, what language a particular person will need in 10 years. I mean, things change very fast, but maybe Julia is the thing, I don't know. Um, so I think we're better off focusing on what's gonna make people effective in doing their work right now. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, one comment and one question. The comment is that um, I work quite a lot in the Pangeo community with um, these Python libraries intended to analyze large amounts of scientific data. So we basically, and there's a lot of crossover between our kind of ethos and a lot of the things that you said in this talk. We kind of simplify the problem by only looking at the analysis part. Like we're not trying, you're not, you're not running the climate model using Pangeo tools, but you are analyzing potentially terabytes of the data output. Um, but there's a lot of crossover stuff like using the same tools sort of regardless of the scale or lowering the barrier to entry. We make it very easy to open like a wide range of file types into the same data structure. Um, or the ideas of like low floors and wide walls, like the wide walls encompass like multiple different types of science. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, I guess one question I have in your presentation is why, why is this some of the solutions you proposed involve jumping to other languages or creating new programming languages? Like, it's not obvious to me that the correct way, to, so there's like big disadvantages to writing your own programming language. You could write something really powerful like Julia and it not necessarily, like it's not obvious that like people will use Julia in the future at all. Um, how much of the answer to these questions do you think involves like creating a new programming language from scratch? And how much do you think depends on like tooling and education on top of existing programming languages? You know, there's so much we don't know about the relationship between programming language design and 
effectiveness in writing software. Um, so, you know, I think we need to explore that space and figure out, I mean, these are, you know, key tools that people use every day in their, in their professional lives. And so, you know, I think it's really unfortunate that we are not addressing kind of the foundational aspects of, um, of our software engineering, uh, uh workflows, right. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of literature that says that basically static types are better, right? Both for finding errors and for finding document and, and for providing documentation, documentation that is known to actually match the, you know, the implementation, right? Because there's a type checker that actually checks that. Um, and yet Python is dynamically typed, right? So either there are more papers to write showing what, in what special cases dynamically typed languages are better, or we need to get off Python. Um, and I don't know which it is. Maybe, maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, so, so people say, look, why are you designing new languages? Nobody's going to use your language. And my answer is, well, maybe, but new languages do get created. New languages do get adopted, right? People are using Rust. People are using Python and Python is relatively new, right? In the scope of Fortran, right? Um, so, you know, I don't know that I can, I can design the language that everybody's going to use in 10 or 20 years, but somebody will. And I want them to be on a solid foundation so that they can do, make, make good design choices. Let's think again. So our next speaker is remote. Um, Marshall, can you try uh, sharing your screen? Uh, yeah, I can't quite do it yet. Oh, there we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble. Um, I can open let up me... your slides if you prefer. So. No, no. I think I know the problem. Just, just give me one moment. Mm -hmm. Apologize for that. How is that? Yep. Now oh, we can see it. Thanks. So uh, okay. our next speaker is Marshall Ward from Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab at NOAA. Marshall, take it away. Thank you. Sorry for the resizing there. And I'm sorry it started on a random slide. <laughs> OK. All right, here we go. Um, uh, hi. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, the Marshall, typical. Yeah, you only see right? half of your slides. Oh my gosh, uh, that's crazy. I know I had this all perfectly set up, and then everything fell apart. I guess that's that's the joy, right? I'm gonna stop and restart. How's that? Better, thanks. Okay, and I won't I won't fuss with it this time. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go over um, the typical uh, MOM6 development cycle. Uh, this is uh, MOM6. It's a Fortran Ocean model. Um, uh, I'm going over um, the work that really um, Bob Hallberg and Alistair Adcroft at GFDL had kind of uh, initially set out, and I came in and implemented parts of it, and maybe contributed here and there, but um, this is uh, the somewhat um, tortuous process in which we we con consider contributions to the model. Um, I thought I'd start with some eye candy uh, just to show what MOM6 can do. Um, this is just a very high res simulation. Um, the, the main thing to take from this here is um, that the model is operating on a lot of different length and time scales. There are very fast waves. There are even faster tsunamis flying around. And there's very slow, turbulent processes here. But in the end, we're talking big scales, little scales, fast scales, slow scales. And we have to kind of balance all of it. And um, making sure the model is able to replicate these simulations is one of our biggest challenges. 
So um, this is a very idealized run I did in MOM6. It's just a two-layer model. Um, I've mirrored it. But what I've done is on the right side, um, I lopped off the the double, the single, I turned the restart file into single precision and then popped it back in the model. And so what you're seeing is that um, pretty quickly the model deviates um, so that there's very strong order one differences. Not a surprise to anyone in the room, but it's just illustrating the point that um, what we have to deal with is even, even lopping off a single bit from one of our values will eventually propagate upward and create solutions that do not resemble each other. And physically, we come to terms with that in uh, various ways, but um, it makes testing extremely difficult. And so really, um, if we want to um, consider how to do proper uh, software testing, like the, a lot of the t uh, talks have been discussing today, um, it's really figuring out how to wrangle that um, chaos that we have to deal with and producing reproducible solutions. So um, I've kind of laid out what I think are three rules here. They, they overlap a fair bit, but um, I think at the very least in order to produce our simulations, we need to make sure our calculations are bit reproducible, meaning they have to be sort of robust enough in, in a sufficient number of scenarios that we all have to deal with in order to be bit reproducible. Um, on top of that, uh, we have to make sure we're policing our code in such a way that we don't change any solutions. We have uh, requirements to people to be bit reducible. Um, we can't always track every single um, solution. So we have to make sure that um, when, when we change the code that we don't change the answers unless it's intentional. And uh, finally, we have to think about um, not just ourselves, but others. So MOM6 is a community ocean model. Um, even though I'm going to describe primarily how we deal things with GFDL, we also have to think about how we change the code in such a way that we don't disrupt other, other groups using the code. So I'm going to kind of somewhat step through those ideas and how we deal with them through the talk. Um, I'm going to start first with the the um, writing bit, reproduce, bit reproducible expressions. And uh, the, the easiest one to understand is that um, order of operations is ambiguous. So if we add three numbers together, uh, we don't know the order in which they will be added. Um, the compiler is free to reorder those, in particular Fortran compiler is free to order those calculations in whatever it sees to its best advantage. Um, I put an example up here of a negligible 10 to the minus 16 plus one, minus one. And you can see from the second expression, it's ideally zero in a, in a, in a double precision calculation. Whereas in the second line here, um, it is equal to the original residual of 10 to the minus 16. And <clears throat> this calculation is not necessarily meant to represent something you'd actually do, but to kind of recognize that in place of that 10 to the minus 16 is going to be any number of numbers that have a residual of that value in there. And the point is, is it's easy to knock out those residuals depending on the order in which you add things. And so the, the way we deal with this is we basically explicitly require all parentheses around any sort of triad calculation like that. We don't allow three numbers to be added without parentheses. We, don't, we generally don't tr want three numbers to be multiplied without parentheses. But um, this is a requirement we have of the code. And I would say it makes the biggest contribution to maintaining that our code is reproducible. Um, a second example is that we don't allow, we, we have a problem whenever we try to use any kind of mathematical function like a transcendental, such as sine x. This was a real life example that we confronted on our model. Um, we, were, we use sine x to populate our Coriolis parameter very simple expression right there. Um, we had a system-wide update of our libc. And we found that they, quote, fixed a bug in their expression for sine of x, which flipped the final bit, gave us a different answer, and it led to changes in our solutions. So we suddenly had a big problem. And um, in this particular case, the way we would deal with it is we would we actually input the Coriolis parameter as an external forcing as a data input. But um, for cases where we don't, we saw these differences. And um, this is a real problem as well. We just discovered something in our bottom drag that involved um, transcendental functions. 
And uh, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. But um, the idea is that we essentially, we say, try not to use these, please. And if you have to use them, have, we, need a, we need a plan in place to track where those numbers are coming from and how to manage differences. Um, a, a third case is um, order of summation. So Fortran provides this very lovely intrinsic called sum that will add up your numbers for you. However, just like in the first example I showed, we don't know the order in which that sum happens. And top of this, um, so we can't use this. Uh, in the similar problem with um, reduction operations in MPI. So MPI sum sums up the things over the ranks. We don't know the order. Um, so various people have ways of dealing with that second example. But um, in this first case, um, how would you do the sums locally? Well, you could use parentheses, like I said, but you would suffer severe um, cumulant errors because imagine adding up a whole bunch of numbers that are too small, much smaller than the, uh, the 10 to the minus 16. But then when you add them all up, they, they eventually become a contribution to the main value. So what basically you cannot use the sum operator in MOM6. So how do we deal with it? Well, we introduce something we call a, a reproducing sum which is actually um, an extended fixed precision operation. What's actually going on is we do the summations over about six integers, and then we they each represent different powers of two to the n, and then we have operations to sum them up. So that provides us a method of doing a global summation. So um, there are other rules that I won't go over in terms of a bit reproducibility, but we have these rules. Um, supposing that you do get some code together and you follow those rules or don't, the net general process is you would submit it to our repository. You would go through an automated verification test, which I'll describe in a minute. Then you would go through a review process that a human being would actually check and make sure it's correct to the best of their ability. And then finally, we have a regression testing that is unique to our lab that we, it's a, we run it on our production machines. We, again, we make sure no answers change. And then um, assuming all those pass, we merge it in. If at any stage any of those fail, we send it back to the beginning and we say, please fix the following. So this is a glance of our um, CI, our automated system. Uh, I won't go, this is just a schematic. There are more bubbles in the actual one and I won't go over all of them, but we do some various compilation tests. And then we have a series of micro tests that like, we call TCs that represent very, very small versions of production codes that we then, um, subject to a variety of tests here. I, I've listed some in the bubbles here, the initialization rotation. I'll go over them in a minute. But um, this is how we verify our answers. So what does it mean to verify? Well, we have uh, we use those reproducing sums that I mentioned before to compute uh, global energetics for each for the model. And it's because it's so high precision, it represents a constant tally of the state of the model to, to reduce down to a scalar. And so this lets us very quickly verify whether answers have changed from the code. And uh, it does happen. We do get a lot of changes from this sort of thing. And, and so that's what's showing in the first box here. In the second box, we also do a second set of tests with the diagnostics. We turn on every single diagnostic that we can with up to limits. There are some that cannot be turned on if certain settings are off. But um, we check the minimum value of that diagnostic, the maximum, the mean value, which uses the reproducing sum, and we count the bits. And when you kind of mash those four sort of measurements together, you can sort of put it all together that it's pretty much very difficult to ultimately change these fields and not catch it. So these have proven very effective in making sure that we catch any kind of changes in the code. Um, the, the, we have a bunch of standard tests. I won't go over them here because other talks have gone over them, but we sort of make sure the answers don't change. That's what I mean by local regression. Um, we do a little bit of parallel tests as we can on small machines. And then we do a restart test. <clears throat> and finally, we do some aggressive initialization. <clears throat> but the two tests I want to talk about that are more unique than MOM6 are related to the dimensions and the rotation. So the dimension testing um, is due to a feature that <clears throat> if you take your equations of motion and you scale them by their dimensional powers to these coefficients, uh, <clears throat> these power to coefficients, 
you should find that the actual um, equation in the model should not change. So in this case, um, the velocity, we scale as 2 to the L minus T, which is length over time. <clears throat> and if we make a similar change of 2 to the T for the time and 2 to the L minus 2T for the forcing, we should find that the equation is unchanged. And so if we can kind of go inside the code and rescale all of our inputs in the dimensionally consistent way, our forcings, our coefficients, and as long as that's been implemented properly, we should find that our answers do not change. And so that is, I, I won't explain it in detail here, but this is kind of the gist of it, how it works. And again, that's kind of a way we've kind of been able to introduce physical dimensionality into the code itself. Um, another test we do is the rotational testing. So this is a case where we're able to take the equations and if we rotate the fields and not just the fields, but the grids, but the um, input fields and everything, we should have kind of a scenario where we are running the model in a rotated form, but the equations of motion are acting on the old index. So what you kind of have is it's kind of more of an index rotation in that physically the model hasn't been turned. Everything is running in the, you know, you know, north used to be up that, you know, the first axis, but now north is the second axis. You know, no, nothing has changed. However, the equations themselves now use different indexes to verify themselves. And what you find is that it's a way of, so if you have a big complicated, say, pressure force in one direction, and then the pressure force in the, in the y direction, you're able to confirm that those two equations are consistently correct. And again, I can't, I don't have time to go over all the details and how it works, but that's sort of the gist of it. Um, <clears throat> assuming you've gotten all those changes incorrectly, um, we then um, will accept the code, but we require consistent, we require um, descriptive commit logs in our Git history. So we don't, we discourage people from just very putting very simple one line commits in. We really want people to explain why they changed the code rather than what they changed in the code. And so by keeping these long commit logs, we have a very detailed history of how the code has changed as well. And um, assuming all that's gone in, um, we finally take our code and put it through our regression system. So um, our regression system is it, it, it might, the box is probably like very similar to before, but it's, it's rather different. Now what we're doing is we're taking our code changes and compiling it on as many compilers as we have available. We, you know, we're using GNU and Intel and NVIDIA in our case. We're compiling it over as many models as we can, our, our ocean only, our coupled ice ocean, our coupled atmosphere. And then assuming they all build, we now run them through a, a somewhat large suite of 61 tests that we do. So these tests range from very small things like the second video I showed or a single column model all the way up to pretty much production um, ocean ice models um, up to 480 cores in our case. So this stage is a stage that can really only be done on our production machines. And so although it's somewhat automated, it is a manually triggered step. And finally, um, assuming all that's passed, we're still not done. So often what happens is um, when we're dealing with, you know, we have several users working on the code at once usually, what we often have is people branching at any time to do their development. And what we end up with is a pretty convoluted um, tree of history for the code. And while in some sense that's fine, um, it makes it extremely difficult to trace back and do um, uh, get a uh, re, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've, <laughs> I, I missed the word, but the, the gets, when you do the git slicing to go back and forth to find the problem. So it, me, it makes it very difficult to go back and trade bisect, git bisect, thank you. Uh, it makes it very difficult to actually figure out which one of these could have caused a potential um, regression in the code going back. So we have extremely aggressive rebasing policy at GFDL. So in fact, what we do is we take our history and we pretty much force every merge to be up to date, and we aggressively slap them all in together, and we create a linear history out of that nonlinear one that I showed. However, 
we can do that at our end, but this this would this would sort of break the third requirement that I had before, which is how do we respect other branches? So what we've done is we've sort of thrown together a Git consortium where we have multiple partners that all work together. And what we do is, although GFDL is allowed to aggressively manipulate its history as it sees fit, it is it has to be completely hands off on partner branches. So essentially this inner spoke of uh, eight bubbles that I have represent each of our partners that we work with on the code base. Um, users must go through partners. Users don't go to the middle spoke, which is main. And you're allowed to change history going into the wheel, if you like. But once you're in that spoke, you must respect the history of every single partner. So we do not rebase, we do not squash, we do not do anything. So, and that's show that's a sort of illustrated in this this final slide here. So I'm sort of showing that once we get to this point, we have to respect our partners' branches. So in this case, I'm showing to the right, GFTL may have, we actually have a subdivision within GFTL doing uh, ice shelf modeling. And so they work on a branch. We want to keep that branch for our purposes. So we don't squash that branch. That goes in our history, and then it goes into main. And that's how we ultimately get a code contribution into what is our main branch. And so um, summing up, I, I know I went through that very quickly, but summing up what we did, um, you know, we did, you know, if we follow certain syntax rules, we're able to achieve bit retrievability in our expressions. Um, if we go through our regression system, we are able to preserve answers and make sure that nothing changes, at least, you know, to the best of our ability. And finally, as long as we um, respect everyone's, our partners and everyone, when we go into this main hub of uh, code sharing, we're able to preserve the history of our of other groups. And uh, that that's I know I know I went a little over time. Uh, that's that's what I have. But thank you very much. Thank you, Marshall. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so if my understanding of history is correct, my understanding is that when IEEE 754 was finalized, the argument was not that you would produce correct answers via floating point, but instead that you'd, you'd be able to reason about and bound the errors. And so I'm curious why you're looking for a floating point equality, which we normally, I mean, we normally tell students, like, don't go for that because that's not reasonable, as opposed to uh, sort of bounding the errors so that you can reason about the, the correctness that way. Well, I, I think it's correct from a physical point of view. You should go for bounds. Um, but what we're trying to do is find a way to um, reproduce the very answers. So if we were to just have a tolerance, we would not be able to replicate that original flow in the um, second video I showed. Um, the only way to have um, reproducible answers and be able to create um, uh, testing that will let us verify them is to follow these reproducibility rules. Um, it's not a physical requirement. It's very much a software engineering requirement. Um, I don't know if that quite answers your question. So I, I guess I guess that gets but, but, but to me that that the, 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 the question I want to know is, is um, you know if you just if you just know that the new software gives the same result as the old software, that's only useful if you know that the old software was correct. So, so I guess why I'm, I'm wondering why you're comparing to the old software and not to some external, maybe expensive to evaluate, but easier to verify standard. Well, I guess we're trying to avoid the um, ad hoc visualization stage of um, you know, checking whether the answers have changed. Um, I mean, for one thing, it's a requirement from the forecasters. The forecasters require us to not change answers. so. To some degree, we don't have a choice, <laughs> um, but um, it's it's very much a development. It's just to make sure that we are able to automate the testing, verify the answers, and that um, what can happen is we can lose a step in the process, and we can lose our answers and never be able to get them back. You know, th this is these are these are real scenarios that happen to GFDL where. We lost the ability to say generate reproduce our topography. It had just tiny bits in the differences, and the flow the 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 solution was never the same. Um, it doesn't mean it was any less correct than the first one. 
It's just suddenly we were not able to re reproduce old answers from publishable results. So, I mean, that that's a big factor in this. Thank you. I was just going to chime in that there'll be a couple of talks tomorrow that kind of discuss this where you, you are comparing the new to the old. And it's not like you're saying the old one is correct and the new one is incorrect. The new one could be correct and the old one incorrect, but really what you want to know is if they're different and maybe that's in some statistical way or maybe it's in some bit for bit way, but there'll be several, several talks on that tomorrow. I will also chime in that we had a pretty big change in our AMOC transport recently due to a single bit change in a cosine function. So <laughs> it's it sometimes it's a it's a monkey wrench in development when it doesn't need to be. So, so uh, Marshall, nice talk. Um, uh, I also have a question about the bit reproducibility issue. So here you really are talking about expressions using the same compiler from one version to the next version differing even though they kept the expression the same? Uh, we don't actually require answers to be the same over compilers. No, we, right, no, we, so, we, so, so this is within yeah. the same compiler to right. somebody puts in a pull request that doesn't change an expression. You're requiring that expression to be written in a way that it preserves answers. But our experience is the expressions don't change unless you change the compiler. So I'm not sure what this is really protecting against in that sense. I understand the uh, summation and round off and this kind of stuff, but just the always requiring parens, what does that really protect you against? Um, it, it, it represents, I, I will say it does represent a higher ambition here that I'm, I'm skirting around. There is a higher ambition to produce platform independent answers here. Um, sometimes it's not just a matter of, um, of the compiler being the same and, you know, things not changing. It's, it's a matter of, um, th there, there's a second test here, which I didn't, I kind of glossed over. We have a debug mode and a repro mode. And the repro mode is the production build, which does use different flags from the debug mode. And historically at GFD, there is a requirement that the debug and repro give the same answers. So in our case, you, the, you know, the, we would have O2 optimization and repro and O0 and debug. We actually require those to be the same. So that, that's that's a primary motivation for for the parentheses in for, in one case. Um, others, I, I kind of agree with you. It's it's kind of a tough sell. Um, like I said, there is this hidden ambition to have platform independent answers as well. Um, we're currently doing some CPU to GPU porting and we're finding answers are staying the same because we follow these practices. That's proven a big help in debugging. Um, but I, I think you're right to some, to, I think you're right. Yeah, Marshall, I really liked the care you had taken for reproducibility. I would add to it saying that in the new code, you might actually introduce a new data race, in which case you catch that by having a tight control over reproducibility. So there is no real, yeah, so... Uh, I said it already. And there is no usable data race checker for GPUs, period. So we are in really bad territory. So you need to have some tight reproducibility. And I really like all the rotation and ideas like that. I never heard it before. Thank you. No, in fact, your presentation made me um, feel a little more hopeful about how we might deal with some of the GPU porting issues, You know, just knowing that there may be problems that it doesn't tell us about. All right, thanks, Marshall. Uh, seems like this will be one of the major topics we'll, we can talk about during the open discussion, but uh, yeah, I have to cut here and we'll have a 30 minute break and then we'll be back in 3.20. All right, our next speaker is David John Garnier from Computational and Information Systems Lab at NCAR. Take it away, DJ. Thank you. So today I'm gonna to talk about challenges in ensuring reproducibility for machine learning, weather model, training and deployment. Uh, Compared with, I think, the numerical modeling community, we have, in some ways, much less stringent uh, reproducibility, like especially on the bit by bit level. But there's still a lot of different components where we're interested in making sure our, our, our workflows are as consistent as possible and evaluating like how correct our models are. 
Uh, this is especially important now that we're in the process of taking a lot of kind of research level machine learning, weather and climate prediction problems and moving them toward operational systems. Uh, and, and in this process, we definitely found that the, a lot of the key differences between more static research settings where you're like have a fixed training set uh, and, and just a few models versus something where you're expected to like be bringing in real time data and maybe you're updating the model over time and dealing with a, a lot of the like operational time and software constraints uh, has uh, made, basically made us run into a, lot, a number of problems. One includes things like not not being able to reproduce the same model training predictions. Uh, maybe like you get some initially really good performance, but then when you run in real time, suddenly that level of accuracy drops for because of some compromise you had to make in the process. And then you get missing data, edge cases, all kinds of other weirdness that happens. Uh, and, and then your, your model fails spectacularly in some of those cases. So in this talk, I wanted to focus on some key challenges I've run into limiting reproducibility throughout the machine learning pipeline and talk about some ways we've addressed some of these challenges uh, and, and for a couple of particular machine learning weather and climate use cases. Uh, one project I'm going to talk about is related to uh, analyzing storm mode from convection allowing models. Uh, so the idea of a storm mode is that uh, we wanted, uh, forecasters are often interested in if if there's going to be thunderstorms on a given day, are there are they going to be supercell thunderstorms which tend to produce really big tornadoes and large hail? Or are they going to be like a, a linear storm which will produce uh, like straight line winds and and potentially heavy rain? Uh, or is it going to be some disorganized convection that that will be less of a threat in terms of major hazards? Uh, we, we tested a couple of approaches with this problem. One is uh, supervised learning, and another is a kind of a semi-supervised approach. Uh, and, and there are some advantages and disadvantages to both. And we have a paper on this uh, uh, that came out earlier this year. Um, so in terms of the reproducibility aspect of this problem, one of the first things we have to do is take our data from a convection line model and segment it. So basically identify the storms and kind of draw a box around them and track that over time. Um, we've uh, used an algorithm that has kind of evolved a little bit over the years. And, and one of the things we ran into is we initially ran this on, on, on one data set uh, to build our hand labeled, basically ground truth data for, for this uh, mode labeling problem. Uh, and then when we went to run this in a real time setting, we had found various bugs and made some other updates along the way. And then suddenly we want to say, oh, maybe we want to rerun like the new segmenting algorithm on the old data where we were getting different results. Um, and that's obviously a problem because then we can't match our hand labels to the storms. So we had a few choices with how to resolve this. One is uh, running the original hand label data through our models for evaluation and, and not retrain. So we're basically stuck with a fixed training set and that's all we can do uh, with that. Not ideal. Uh, we kind of ended up doing this for the purpose of the paper, but as an operational op option, it's not really all that great. Um, you could go through the challenging but doable method of, of uh, trying to do some matching uh, so, so you like look at the centroids and the areas of the storms, and and you you could eventually sync up everything. It would take some computational effort, but but it's doable. Um, the, another approach is to get try to get around the hand labeling problem as much as possible. This is where our semi supervised approach comes into play. Uh, basically, we want to use methods, both training and evaluation approaches that require minimal hand labeling. Uh, and and basically use features in the data and and try to keep the human out of the loop as much as possible. So we we in this problem we've kind of trained a few different modeling approaches. One is a fully connected neural network. One is a, a convolutional neural network, and one is this a convolutional neural network that takes that uh, pred makes predictions on a proxy task that that basically gives features that we can extract from the data that are relevant to storm mode, such as the area of the storm or the intensity of the storm. And then we feed, uh, we basically take the latent space, which is basically just you run through the neural network through various layers, and there basically whatever your input has been transformed into this long vector. Uh, we we take that vector and we feed it through a, a clustering algorithm, and with that clustering algorithm, we then look at which storms kind of are representative of each cluster, and by doing that, we can we we can look at a much smaller subset of storms and label on the cluster basis instead of on the individual storm basis. And that allows us to hand label a whole bunch of storms uh, without needing to go in and individually do that for each one. Uh, so uh, in our experience, it gives a similar ability to discriminate between the, the different modes. 
uh, without the need for hand labeling thousands of storms. And thus we can have use a much larger training set, or if we do train your segmentation algorithm, we can just redo that, that, that step instead of having to go back and hand, hand label everything from scratch. In terms of how do we evaluate this without hand, say hand labels and real time data, we can we can do other things like um, basically look uh, look at consistency among the predictions. So instead of say uh, you, you might be able to look at like other storm climatologies that people have done in the past and see do, do, how how do our algorithms compare? Are they identifying similar things in the similar places? And for the most part, we see they are. There are some differences between the algorithms, especially for things like linear storms versus disorganized storms. We see that the, the, the semi-supervised approach has, much, uh, has a lot more uh, linear storms than the, than the disorganized storms on an hour by hour basis, uh, and also more, more supercells. So, so the, the, there's some similarities, but also some inconsistencies between the algorithms. Uh, we can also look at where basically where the models are, agree, what storms do they agree on, and when they agree, they tend to be like kind of classic storms. We can see where they disagree. Uh, we can also look at, uh, matching our storms with uh, observed reports of different hazards, because all, after all, what we're interested in is, does this mode correspond to a certain hazard? So we can do this for each algorithm. We find that su the super predicted supercells tend to produce more hazards of all types than, than any of the other modes. Um, and we see some kind of similar distributions across the different models, although there, there is, again, some, some variation. Uh, so this approach doesn't just apply to storm mode. If there's other problems that you're running into that are uh, kind of require a lot of hand label data uh, instead of just focusing on things like accuracy or, or or only focusing on the set of data where you have hand labels, you can kind of bring in some physical understanding and, and build in evaluation met metrics that and consistency metrics that allow you to see do you get consistent results with different algorithmic choices. Uh, another way we we we, we like kind of enable reproducibility and consistency is also uh, generate developing interactive visualizations of our of our storm of our storm predictions. Uh, and so in this case, we have a real time storm pipeline that allows us to uh, basically take a real time model output, do our storm extraction, run our machine learning models on the on those storms, and then uh, basically save the data on onto the cloud where we can then put a static website that, that uses a lot of JavaScript to go download the data and uses the Plotly JavaScript platform to do interactive visualization. So you can zoom in, you can change the model, uh, you can see the probabilities and how they vary. Uh, you can kind of iterate through time, compare different runs. Uh, it, give, it gives you a lot of flexibility to, to, to kind of use this as like a forecast basis, also as a like model evaluation basis. So you can see like where, like at least visually what's going on. And from this data, you could also build other kinds of uh, uh, evaluation visualizations as well. Uh, changing tact a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about some other challenges on the machine learning data pipeline. There's a lot of work focused on like the machine learning algorithms themselves, but a lot of the like data issues can crop up well into the pre-processing side. So I mentioned the segmentation problem as one example. Uh, but another common thing you have to do with just about every machine, like if you're using any kind of neural network or, or support vector machines or anything that, that looks like a linear regression under the hood, is you have to scale your data, rescale your data from whatever range of values it has to either normalize it with mean zero standard deviation one or, or from scaling ranging from zero to one or something like that. Um, the problem with this is that you're doing this with floating point values. Uh, and and thus rescaling the values because it's they're technically discrete under the hood. Uh, this is a lot ends up being a lossy compression. So when you run this, uh, depending on the range of values you get, you may you you sometimes if you say do what I call this telephone experiment. So you 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 run it, run the forward pass and then the inverse transform of your of your scaling algorithm. You you'll you won't like completely recover the values with bit by bit precision. You, there will be some differences that are more than the kind kind of the floating point. Uh, like minimum floating point value. And this is uh, like potentially problematic in, in some circumstances because like, uh, especially if you have data that varies over large ranges or you're running on different machines or you're using different scaling algorithms, um, that this can be an issue. Uh, so one, there isn't really, I don't know necessarily a good way around this or how, how much of a sensitivity this is, uh, but, but given that a lot of the machine learning benchmarks are compiled on image data that ranges from zero to 255, and we're trying to apply this to climate model output where you have everything ranging from 
like values in the thousands to things like microphysics that range over like seven orders of magnitude uh, for some for some of the variables. Uh, you like like this is a um, like kind of how how you, how the small how the data behaves when you scale and unscale and feed it through the networks is, is a potential concern. Another issue is uh, like transferring scaling values between different systems. systems. That was weird. Uh, <laughs> um, so with with this, uh, if you use a like one of the most common machine learning packages is Scikit-Learn. Uh, the way it handles trans like saving out data is, uh, is by serializing it to a pickle file, which in in Python, like pickle files don't uh, they they store a representation of of the data in the thing, but they are not code independent. So if you take a pickle file from one version of Python to another, unless everything is exactly set up the same way, you you may not be able to load the file back in, or you may get different results. Um, so we have written a package called Bridge Scaler that attempts to, instead of saving everything out to a pickle file, we try to strip out some of the, the key components and save it to a JSON file. Uh, it doesn't completely solve all these issues, but at least it's more inspectable than a pickle file. Uh, and, and, uh, and we also built in a few other trans, like ways to transform for like group scaling or, or deep scaling. And we're also looking at distributed scaling so that say we have a bunch of different climate model files from, from different runs, instead of trying to load them all into memory, which may be impossible uh, to do to learn calculate our, our scaling coefficients, uh, we, we can calculate say a mean standard deviation on each file separately and then uh, do a kind of a map reduce approach to, to combining them. And there, there's some floating point math issues that come into that uh, if you're not careful. Uh, there's another approach for quantile scaling, which I found to be more robust. Uh, so there's an algorithm called T-digest that allows you to essentially does like a, a kind of clustering of uh, like representation of, of, of a of a CDF. Uh, there is a Python version of it, uh, but it's not supported. So this is another reproducibility support issue is like the, the library has fallen out of support. Uh, so I'd like to use it, but I haven't been able to yet. Uh, so one of these days I'll actually get, get to tr trying it out. Uh, what I'd li like to end on is uh, talking about uh, decomposition of uncertainty. Uh, so, so one thing that's come up is like statistical validation of our models. Uh, we have two kinds of uncertainty. One is a is a ALA torque of data uncertainty and another is epistemic or kind of we call model uncertainty. Uh, Basically, with, with with data with the da aleatoric uncertainty, the only way you can reduce this is by finding another variable that is more informative. Whereas epistemic uncertainty varies depending on the example you're dealing with, uh, and, and uh, you can you can add more data and that can help. Uh, but there's always there may still be spaces in your model space that that are more uncertain than others. And so we're even interested in using machine learning to calculate figure out how to how do we actually calculate aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. Uh, and, and if you make some assumptions about your, your distribution, such as uh, a, uh, like, like if, if you can, for a classification problem, you can use a Dirichlet distribution instead of just a, a, a categorical distribution. You can then uh, decompose your predicted variance into an aleatoric and epistemic component. If you use an ensemble of probabilistic models, you can also do the same thing. Um, we can also do other kinds of decomposition, such as uh, this dempster Schaefer theory, where we can Take the same components and then calculate an I don't know term, and and these probably is two, this is another variation of epistemic uncertainty essentially. Uh, so we can one way we can do this is with one model using an approach called evidential deep learning. We have a paper uh, that's on archive that just came out about a month ago. Uh, for this problem, we're taking basically sounding data and using it to estimate the probability of, of different precipitation types. Uh, we can represent our uncertainty with an ensemble represented by the blue histogram, a deterministic pr probability represented by either the, the, the red or the blue line, or we can use a, a kind of uh, evidential PDF, which uh, basically assumes a, a, a Dirichlet distribution and we can sample from that to get our, to, to get a smoother PDF that covers a wider range of, of, of uh, possible probabilities compared with our original model. And then again, we can also calculate our Using the the dempster shather uncertainty, we can calculate this U value or this purple unknown value compared with the probabilities of sleet and freezing rain. Uh, to do this, we can use a standard neural network architecture, uh, and and in the process, basically change how we do the output layer. 
Uh, and, and this allows us to calculate basically pseudo counts of evidence for each class. And then we can use our Dempster Schaefer or our uh, Dirichlet distribution magic to turn that into probabilities. Uh, we also have run into quality control issues that affect the problem. Uh, and we have had to filter the data to, to deal with those. Um, Finally, to evaluate our model, one of the things we, we can do is look at more traditional uncertainty metrics like, like uh, reliability diagrams and see how well our different models do. But we can also look at uh, things like a, it's called a discard test where we rank our data by uncertainty and throw away the most uncertain data while recalculating our, say, our prior skill score. And we can see if this be basically the, the, the prior skill score should go up as you discard most of the most uncertain data. And we see it does that for most of the classes, but not for SLEET. And we think there's some issues with the modeling with the data quality that are affecting that. Uh, we can also look at uh, regional case studies, so running our model in real time, we can, and we can see where the uncertainty is high under what circumstances is that happening. And this can help inform us to like, where may the model diverge, where maybe expect like different models will get different solutions uh, so that we wouldn't expect, say, model consistency in, in, in those situations. Uh, we can also look at composite soundings and see how they behave across both different models and different uncertainty metrics. And we, we see some significant deviation in behavior uh, uh, between these different approaches. Uh, so to support this, we have a number of Python packages. Uh, for our uncertainty work, we have Miles Guess. Uh, we also do hyperparameter optimization with a, a package called EchoOpt. Uh, this, uh, this one also has some other diagnostic features to allow us to see how well is our model, re uh, basically, how are we converging, what parameters are we converging on, and what are their sensitivities. And that can also help us with consistency and reproducibility. Our Hoggle slide package does a lot of tracking and evaluation, uh, and bridge scaler, again, is for rescaling data in a, a more reproducible way. So um, I'll wrap up there uh, with some figures and happy to take a couple questions. Our next speaker is Tara Jensen from Research Application Lab here at NCAR. Tara? All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Tara Jensen. I'm with NCAR Research Applications Lab as well as the Developmental Test Bed Center. The DTC is actually a um, collaborative organization between NCAR and NOAA, um, as well as with the Air Force. Um, and we, we do have sponsorship um, through NCAR from NSF as well. Um, our goal is to, to help with the transition from research to operations. Um, so I'm going to be talking about MET Plus, which is the model evaluation tools, and what I'm calling the long and winding road um, to unified verification. MET Plus has now been around for 15 years, and it has gone through many um, growth cycles and, uh, and a lot of different um, avenues and paths that we weren't exactly expecting when we first started this. So um, first off, why unified verification? Um, in this sense, uh, because verification you know, can mean um, two different things. It can mean um, evaluation against um, observations or what you consider to be truth. So like model verification, um, or it can be you know, what a lot of this um, uh, particular workshop has been on, um, which is you know, software verification. Um, in, in the context, much of my talk is going to be more about comparing to, um, you know, observations and truth, but through that I'm also going to weave in trying to describe how our, our software package has um, evolved and the challenges that we've faced. But um, starting out with why do we want to have unified verification for models, um, especially, is that if you have a comprehensive and unified verification tool that forecasters use, operational centers use, universities and national labs use, then um, you know you have a better opportunity to, to have everybody using the same um, package, use, getting the same results. And that makes the, the transition from research to operations more efficient and provides you with a consistent set of metrics. It also allows everybody to use that common verification language. And um, in essence, also provides a, a greater opportunity to train um, all on better verification best pra practices and so forth. And so um, that is what um, we started out with, with um, MET um, originally, and then expanded to MET Plus. Um, here's the core team of MET Plus. You can see that there's a lot of names here. Um, we, you know, we have several that are kind of helping project manage. Um, we have three different primary areas of engineering, um, and I'll go over what those um, components are. 
Um, and then we do have a host of atmospheric scientists that um, join us when we're um, going through the, the development um, life cycle um, in trying to guide and make sure that the science is correct and um, is meaningful and, and the numbers make sense and so forth. And then we also have two statisticians that help us out. We also have um, collaborators across um, basically uh, across the globe. Um, we have a, a lot of the different centers, but especially the um, NOAA Environmental Modeling Center is one of our primary collaborators. Um, but we're also working with the Air Force and um, the Met Office on um, trying to help them adopt Met Plus and transition it into their operations, as well as the Naval Research Lab. Um, and then I have a whole host of, of folks um, within the community, different organizations that um, we've worked with um, for Met Plus over the past couple of years. Um, when you're looking at all these names, you, you may feel like, oh, they've got like a huge team working on this. But actually, I would say only like one or two people on this list um, actually have an allocation of, you know, greater than 80% of their time spent on Met Plus. Most of the people um, on this list are um, spent somewhere between five and 50% of their time on Met Plus. So it's, it's not as big of a, of a um, team as, as what it appears on, um, on a slide. So um, this was supposed to be kind of a long winding road and instead it turned out to be kind of a, a you know, interestingly colored um, arrow. So that's what you get for today. <clears throat> but I, I just want to give you a little bit of um, history. Um, the goals for MET Plus um, was initially to develop model and forecast verification um, capabilities and, pa and a package that could be used across the community. So once again, with, within the research community as well as operations. Um, and initially um, we were tasked with replicating the core capability of the EMC Verification Statistics Database or VSDB package, which um, was focused on um, the weather components, primarily looking at short range um, weather, um, you know, one to three days, and then um, medium range weather um, global models, you know, from like three days out to seven. But um, our design, our development and our, and our design practices um, also allowed it to be scaled to be used um, for different applications at, at different um, uh, spatial resolutions. So the initial idea was um, kind of started bubbling up in 2004. It was actually the Air Force who said, oh, it'd be great if we had a package that um, everybody could use for verification. Um, after having some workshops to kind of focus in on what initial capabilities should be had um, in 2008, that was the first release of MET. So that's where I'm saying we've got 15 years of MET, um, the original model evaluation tools um, to our history. And so um, it, it has evolved over the past 15 years. Um, in 2009, we had our first um, user interface um, development start, um, and that's, that was called Met Viewer. And once again, that was to replace some EMC capability that they wanted replaced. In 2015, Met, Met was selected as the verification package for the NOAA, what's now called the Unified Forecast System. And at that point, we realized that um, we needed to not only have um, you know, the core tools um, that were written primarily in C++, um, with you know some aspects of Fortran, some uh, different Fortran modules that we didn't want to recode in C++. Um, but we needed to, to provide everyone with a, a way to um, know how to use those tools and how to set up the, the system quickly um, in order to script all of the different tools being called um, you know one by one, kind of in, in similar to any other Linux type of um, package. So that's when in, in 2016, um, we started developing um, what's called the MetPlus wrappers, which are Python based and, you know, kind of wrap around the model evaluation tools, configuration files and, and you know, passes in pertinent information, basically through environment variables. In 2017, that's when um, EMC started um, developing their first um, in, uh, installation of, of MetPlus for their, their global workflow. And so we worked heavily with them on, on trying to get that started and, and getting the Met Plus wrappers in place. Um, in 2019, then we um, saw that there was a need um, to not only have these wrappers around the tools, but also um, ways to, to have analysis and diagnostic tools that were written in Python and were more accessible to the scientific community. So that's um, what started in 2019. Um, in 2021, um, the MET Plus wrappers were accepted for installation on um, WCOS, which at that time was the operational 
um, system for NOAA EMC. And that was a, a huge, huge um, milestone and achievement for um, this little package that started back in 2008 um, to do um, some model um, verification. And then um, just recently, um, all the components, including the analysis and diagnostic tools and, and so forth have been um, accepted for install on, on WCOS2, which is the current operational system. Uh, our biggest challenge, which I kind of didn't really highlight, but it's down here at the bottom to remind me to say it, is um, trying to extend these core capabilities in a way that is useful to the scientists without having to refactor every five years. Because you can only get so much money, especially for verification, because verification isn't really all that exciting. Um, people would rather dive their, you know, um, put their money into developing new physics packages and, and so forth, and rightfully so. Um, so what we've had to do is have to be very, um, very strategic in how we've developed um, this suite of tools. So Matt, I already kind of covered um, the core things, you know, it's a set of Python wrappers around the core, the analysis tools. We do have this, um, this way to communicate between MET and Python algorithms. Um, we do um, have the ability to use managed exterior, um, externals to connect repositories, but we haven't been using it much lately because there hasn't been any um, desire to, to do that um, uh, over at EMC recently. Um, we have over 150 um, traditional statistics and different diagnostic methods, um, both for point and gridded data sets. Um, and there's like 15 interpolation methods as well. I already mentioned that it's kind of a mix between C++, Fortran and Python. Um, and to be honest, the pipe, especially the Python, the packages that we can use um, is driven by operational requirements. So it's driven by um, uh, NCO at um, for NOAA um, to put on their operational system. And it's dr driven by, um, you know, the Air Force cybersecurity team and um, IT for putting it on their operational system and, and, and so forth. So um, we are limited in the breadth of capability um, that we can use. So a lot of these packages that you were, you've were you been talking about all day look really, really great, but they're not something that we can necessarily bring into MET+. Plus. So that, that also has been kind of a challenge. Um, but one thing that has, um, that has always kind of worked for us um, in order to make sure that we um, provide the community with reproducible results is um, having configuration files to, to allow for this easy sharing of how to set up the, the MET tools um, or how to you know, run data through um, MET Plus using the wrappers and so forth. Um, the last time we were able to keep track of users, which we stopped keeping track of, I think about five years ago when, when we were told to, um, we didn't need to have a download page anymore, um, was about 3,500 users, both within the US and international communities. And then um, here's just some eye candy as to you know, different types of of methods and, and um, type of, of diagnostics that um, we have within MET Plus. Basically, um, I've already kind of covered some of this as well. MET Plus is a layered system. So this kind of gives you a visual of, um, you know, kind of what MET Plus is. So the core um, statistical tools is MET. That's um, kind of represented here in this orange um, box. Um, and then the wrappers are basically kind of um, contained within the lighter orange box, as well as all the, the black arrows that, that kind of show you that they're helping drive the data in a workflow, in a low level workflow from one tool to another. Um, and then within MET itself, there are a whole bunch of different tools in there. And once again, it was originally designed to, to act like um, some you know other packages that you would run on Linux, a lot of small tools that have very limited um, scope and capability so that you can string them together. Um, so basically there is there are reformatting tools. Those are the dark green ones. There's data inspection tools, which help you um, make sure that your data is correct um, before you put it into the, um, the statistical tools because garbage in is garbage out. And if, you, if you're um, putting in a, um, a, a grid that winds up being flipped or something like that, then you're, you're gonna wind up having um, statistics that just don't make any sense. And then we do have some analysis tools that are actually written in C++ to provide some very basic um, aggregation across different times and, and um, you know, regions of interest and so forth. Focusing in a little bit more, um, we do have uh, pre-processing. That's once again, all of, the, all of this green over here. And I think I heard someone else talking about how, um, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of um, challenges with dealing with all the different disparate data um, sources and, and data formats and so forth. 
And um, we've ran into that as well. We, you know, we've tried to support um, some of the industry standards, but there, there's just a, a continual stream of, can you support this particular um, observation source or this one? And so what we wound up doing was we wound up ad adding in what's called Python embedding, um, which is basically um, an interface between MET, um, the C++ um, code, and Python so that the, um, the MET tools can call Python, um, have, run a Python script to maybe ingest the data or compute a different um, diagnostic field or something like that, and then pass that back into the MET tool to compute the statistics. So one way that we've worked around trying to, um, to allow for um, supporting lots of different um, file formats, um, and hopefully, um, as long as uh, the, their scripts are, are being um, passed around um, throughout the community, um, reproducible results is by using um, this Python embedding. Um, standard statistics, um, actually there aren't as many tools associated with just computing all the standard statistics, but that's because um, these um, tools wind up writing out 10, 20, 30 different statistics um, that are aggregated across you know, the different um, domains, the different regions of interest and, and so forth. Um, and, and so we've got grid stat that does grid to grid comparison, um, point stat that does grid to point um, comparisons, ensemble stat handles the ensemble, um, data, and then we have um, uh, things that are focused um, specifically on tropical storms, tropical cyclones. Um, and then we, we do have the analysis tools I already mentioned that um, provide um, a basic level of analysis, um, but no graphics associated with them. Okay, and then we have a, a whole bunch of other tools that do what I would call diagnostics, um, and that you know allows the, the model developers to dive into the data and understand um, why their model is either per performing well or poorly and, and where they may need to be looking um, in order to improve performance. Um, so I have all that highlighted. Um, one of the interesting thing is, is that there's never enough diagnostics. We have learned that no matter how many diagnostics you put into a, a package, there's always gonna be another um, application group that says, but we want this and we want that. And so that's one of the other challenges that we have is trying to figure out how to use all of the, the um, capability that we already have in MetPlus, reuse it um, in a way that is meaningful but, and doesn't make, um, make for us to have like redundant code and so forth. Um, so then there's um, also the analysis tools, which are actually a little bit more standalone. Um, we have two user interfaces that allow for um, folks to do deep dives um, as well as quick look queries um, on databases. Um, but then we're, we also have as the backbone for those two user interfaces, um, a couple of Python um, packages uh, that we've developed that do the aggregation and calculation of the statistics um, and then the plotting um, and so forth. So all of that's in Python. And once again, we have to be very careful about what Python packages we choose so that they can make it onto the um, operational systems. Um, in the interest of time, I, I was going to talk about how, um, you know, just all the different, once again, aspects of model um, development that MetPlus supports, um, and especially when you're looking at verification, um, being able to look at different areas of interest and looking at um, having the ability to, to regrid um, your, uh, your domains or your models um, onto a single um, uh, projection um, within the tools themselves rather than having to do it outside, being able to dig in and, and be able to pull out the tendencies, um, you know, from the, the models and so forth. Um, here is some examples of community contribution. And I just kind of want to touch on this just once again to show you that, that there, um, once again, there's, there's a lot of challenges with taking in um, contributions from the, the community. Um, for example, this particular multivariate distribution um, we got the code in Fortran. We chose to rewrite it in C++ because that is our primary language. And once we got that, then we had to do a lot of tests to, to make sure that we were very close to bitwise comparison um, between the, the output from the Fortran and the C++. Similarly, we um, got some code um, from in MATLAB. And in that case, we chose to convert it to Python because it didn't make sense to put it into C++. It wasn't a lot of heavy computation and Python could handle it. But then we also had to do generalization to be able to, to make it more flexible um, so it fit within the MetPlus paradigm. Um, we actually got some code in C++, which was really exciting, but we still had to general, generalize the code. Um, 
same thing. We got some, um, we got um, some, uh, a procedure um, written, or we, we had a procedure in an art, in a journal article, and then we had to um, figure out how to code that up in C++ and wrap it in Python and so forth and so on. Um, I'll just leave this for people to go and look at so that they can get a sense of, of some of the challenges and, and what we um, have to do as far as um, trying to, to make sure that once we're um, you know bringing these into our package that um, the results are the same outside the package with the test data and, and inside. Um, once again, um, skipping past quite a bit because I did want to talk about how we um, work towards correct, um, correctness and reproducibility in our software. First, first off, we do um, our feature or um, issue develop, development usually has a team of a, a scientist, an engineer, and then someone who's helping with documentation. And they work together on developing the, the issue or the feature, and then um, you know making sure that it passes all the appropriate tests. Each feature or um, de development task has a GitHub issue assigned to it. The feature branch is then um, broken off for a dev branch um, that has that issue kind of in the GitHub ID name um, so that the work can be performed. And then once it's ready to be um, brought back into um, the develop branch, um, we use GitHub Actions um, to do continuous integration testing, um, as well as um, having a scientist and an engineer for uh, more complex um, uh, pull requests and sometimes just a scientist or an, or an engineer um, to make sure that there's quality um, assurance um, of both the scientific integrity as well as the software integrity. Um, you know, when we are doing these pull requests and bringing things in through GitHub. We also have beta releases for user and cross-platform testing um, about every six to eight weeks. And there's usually four to five beta um, releases per major development cycle. So we can do as much testing as possible. For um, code reproducibility um, and results re reproducibility, we have configuration files, we have MetPlus wrappers, um, once again, that, that um, tend to um, set environment variables that then swap those into the MET config files so that the MET tools can be run. Um, and then there's also the MET analysis suite, which also has config files. Those are in XML and YAML, whereas the MET config is in an in-house language that at some point we're going to have to replace. Um, we also have examples of how to use MetPlus in um, online documentation and, and these use cases, which have the MetPlus config um, configuration file, the MET configuration file, sample data and documentation. And then um, once again, we do the cross-platform training, testing. We also have a lot of support. Um, so there's GitHub discussions. There's a lot of documentation. We have um, a training series that have been recorded, um, an online training series as well that you can just work through at your own pace. And um, use cases, which I already um, specified, you know, has that sample data, the configuration files and the documentation. So basically, we have 15 years of, of our reproducible results. Um, it's a large, complex system. And thank goodness for GitHub Actions and, um, because it, it, it saves our bacon every time we try and do a, a pull request and, and just make sure that um, you know, we haven't broken anything. And with that, any questions? Questions? Hi, um, but thanks for um, um, very nice talk. Um, that, that's kind of also um, 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 came back to me in the talk of the um, about the ASML tool. So this is like a huge community effort, and the, it's a huge tool. And you implement the um, positions by the users. Um, the question is here: How do you actually decide which one to include? I mean, do you include um, every proposal, or do you just say, well? Is the demand actually there in the broader community, or is it just one user? Because I mean, it's a huge effort. It's crazy. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, um, it it is crazy. Um, to be honest, uh, our right now our what is included many times is driven by um, our sponsors. You know who's funding us and and um, you know what they're requesting. It's our job then to to try and figure out how to integrate it as effectively as possible. Um, Right now we're kind of in a lull. And so we only have about 15 different sponsors um, or different projects that are feeding into the development of this. I think my all time high um, 
was I think 22 or 23. So yeah, it's managing a lot of deliverables and that's why GitHub um, also saves our bacon regularly um, because that way we can keep track of, you know, what really needs to be done by what, you know, by what given time um, and, and, you know, which beta version and, and, and testing and stuff, but it, it really is, it's driven by um, whoever brings the money at this point and whoever has, you know, a, a clear vision. I, we, we need to, we need them to be able to, to work with us and help us understand um, what they're, they're asking for, because, you know, it, there's a, there's just a lot of science involved in it too. And, and I don't know a lot about S2S or seasonal forecast systems or, or climate models, but the, the folks that we work with do, and then they, they help provide us with the, you know, the requirements that, that are needed. Does that answer your question? He says yes. Okay. All right, let's think again. And uh... how's that? Any oh yeah, that's definitely different. Okay, how many people have never written a unit test at all? Oh come on, you can admit it. Really, everyone. <laughs> all right, very good. Okay, the Enzyblib libraries are um, a bunch of uh, Fortran seventy seven code mostly. They're required for the UFS and many other NOAA applications, including Met, MetPlus that we just heard about using several of them. Um, some of them are are no longer active. Uh, they're listed over there on the, on the side. But the ones that are active uh, control IO interpolation and GRIB and buffer for a lot of NOAA applications. And these uh, more active ones, we have transitioned to uh, agile software development, and in particular, added unit testing. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So why did we do this? Why do you wanna put unit testing in your code? I think the number one reason, of course, is to prevent catastrophic failure by finding more of your bugs. But one thing that, that does not seem to be appreciated widely is the productivity gain that unit tests will give you on software projects. Um, when you have unit tests, it's much, much cheaper to develop new features on the code. And by cheaper, I mean, it takes less programmer time. So the NetCDF project, for example, has no more than two programmers, nor has it ever in its entire history. And yet it runs on every single HPC platform and it's used by thousands of science projects and it works really well. So how do they achieve that? We achieve it by, by unit testing. And so that's the motivation for putting unit testing on NSEP libs. Ironically, NSEBLIB's code is in many cases older than NetCDF. NetCDF was written in the 80s. A lot of NSEBLIB's code was written in the 70s, and all this time it has been used and maintained without unit testing, but we've just added it. I'm not gonna read all the things, but what I wanna point out is that unit testing dramatically increases programmer productivity. It makes it faster to code on the system. It does take discipline. I, I was very fascinated by Michael's talk. Where's Michael? He's in there. There you are. And your, your mentioning of um, techniques that had uh, a small effort gave a small payback, whereas many software engineering techniques require a big upfront effort before you get a big payback. And unfortunately, unit testing is more like that in that, yeah, it takes discipline. You have to do it right. You don't get the benefits if you mess it up. If you just half-ass it, it's not really gonna do anything for you. You have to really lean into it and respect it. And you know it has to become central to your, to your work in order to really provide the benefits. But when, when you do make it central to your work, your programming speeds up by a considerable extent. But you have to be strict. If you're just gonna, if you're just gonna get, let yourself out of it every time, then you know, it doesn't help. I worked for, for decades uh, on projects with unit testing everywhere, including at Unidata. And then about five or six years ago, I started working at the EMC at NOAA where nobody uses unit testing at all. And I thought, well, scientists being such rational people, all I will have to do was one time explain the benefits of unit testing and everyone will switch. Why, why is everyone laughing? I don't understand. But, Anyway, that did not happen. And I've come to realize that there is a big emotional component to the decision whether or not to unit test. And I think the way it looks to me as someone who has unit tested for decades 
is that for legacy programmers, more tests equals more code equals more pain. So when I say write some unit tests, you think you're asking me to like poke myself in the eye with a, with a pencil. But for modern programmers, programmers like me, more tests equals more safety equals faster work, which is more fun. So you tell me to write unit tests, and I say, great, that sounds terrific. So that's, that's the difference. And legacy programmers generally do not seem to believe that programmer, programming can be done in a better way. They think they're already doing it the best possible way. And anything you're telling them is just going to slow them down. It's not true, but that's what they think. Time is frequently cited as the excuse for why we don't unit test, but it, I don't believe it's ever really the problem. Because when you're programming without unit tests, you're already moving very, very slowly. Your tasks are taking weeks or months, not hours or days. And so on a task that's taking weeks or months, uh, how can you not have time to spend a few hours writing tests? That doesn't make any sense. Testing is very, very quick code to write. Once you understand the, for the code that's under test, in order to write the test code, it just takes minutes or hours. It's very quick. So you always have time to program more efficiently. I mean, that's what efficiently means. So it's faster to program with two unit tests. Therefore, don't refrain from doing unit tests because you don't have time because you have too much programming work to do. That doesn't make any sense. I realize, though, that I may not be addressing the emotional component when I say that. OK, system tests are definitely not enough. Uh, I see a lot of efforts at the EMC to do system testing, and it's fantastic. But I also feel like sometimes this is done as a way to avoid doing unit tests. If we system test enough, then we don't have to write unit tests, right? But they're not the same at all. When, when you fly in an airplane, one of our beautiful modern airplanes from Boeing or Airbus, you're in one of the most efficient and reliable machines ever made, right? But when they design that airplane, they did not design all the pieces, take them out into the runway, assemble them and try and fly it. Instead, each piece was tested, each component is tested. Everything is tested before they put it together and try and fly the plane. Which is why when Boeing designed the 777, the, the very first plane they ever built took off and performed perfectly, okay? That was not because they got lucky, it was because every piece of that plane was tested before they did that. And that's the way we need to treat our software. Okay, so system tests are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And unit testing is really what speeds the development. The problem with system tests is even if you detect an error, it's too late. It's already in the system and it's in there somewhere that you don't know. And now you have to figure out where it is and how it got in there. And that's what takes all the time. Another problem with system tests is they cannot detect all bugs. They detect, they detect obvious bugs. And we had a great, great talk. Uh, what was the first talk this morning from Steve? in which he was talking about the model, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I get that. And that is a certainly a good thing to bear in mind. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about avoidable software bugs that can easily be fixed. We're not talking about the, the limits of physics or you know the limits of models. We're talking about just dumb bugs that you could fix. And here's an example of one. This was in UFS Utils. I'm not trying to pick on it, it's just an example. We found this very quickly when we wrote some unit tests. There was a value that should be 273.16, and in fact, it was 268. Now that's only off by 2%. So you're not gonna look at the output of system tests that are well down the road from this and say, oh, wow, something was off by 2%, you know, six stages up in the calculation. You can never see that. The only way you can see that is by testing that code, which we did and we fixed, okay? So obviously there's limits to the science, which are gonna be caused by you know, physics and, and models and the limits of doing models in the first place. But there's no need to degrade the science results further with totally avoidable software bugs that could easily be found if you simply took a moment to look for them. Okay, I've talked about unit testing. I haven't really defined it. Really a unit test is just a small program which runs a piece of your code and checks the result. Okay, and that's very important. The second part is important. You have to check the result. Unit tests are run usually when, you're, when you type make test or make check for a, a system that you're installing, and they're all automated. You're not required to look at them to see if they ran correctly or not, or if the test passed or not. The, the software knows whether a test should pass or fail. 
And we can measure our code coverage to see how we're doing. So here's an NSEB libs package. This is a buffer lib, as a matter of fact. And we see these green bars. This is These are the, the code files. And the green bars tell you what percentage of that code file has been exercised in testing, OK? So we can see we have some, some code files here where we have a lot of code that's not, don't touch, sorry. I'll stand over here. That's not been exercised at all, right? And if we click in on one of these things, we can go in here and we see some code of ours. And the green code is code that has been run during testing. And the red code, oh, thank you, has been, okay. The red code has not been run in testing, okay? So that red code is code that we're running on our operational systems and no one has ever run as far as we know. That could be wrong. That could cause the, the whole system to, to crash. That could cause WCOS2 to burst into flames. We have no idea because we've never run it. How careless is that, right? So we unit test it. Now we run this code and we, we know it works. Okay, on each, on each commit, and on each commit of a pull request, okay, we've been talking about GitHub. Everyone here familiar with GitHub and what a pull request is? A pull request is when someone wants to change your code, they're giving you new code. When you do a pull request on GitHub with continuous integration using GitHub Actions, it will take their changes, it will apply it to your code, and it will run a bunch of tests, and it will show you the results. And that's what we see here. We're seeing just a few, but if you look, it, sees a, it says on this thing that it runs 46 different versions of these tests. So what are all these 46 versions? We're testing on Intel compilers and GNU compilers. We're testing on different versions of our dependencies. We're testing different CMake build options that we can build our package with. We're testing SPAC build, we're testing Mac OS. We're doing a lot of extra testing. We're testing that our documentation builds and it's complete. We're testing that all our tests run without violating any memory issues. We're testing that we have introduced no new compiler warnings into our code. So all these tests are run on every pull request, every single commit automatically. And if you notice at the bottom there, this particular example, I've, I've picked the top the top check did not work, the SPAC build. There's a, little, there's a little red X there. And at the bottom is where it would normally say, oh, there'd be a little button saying merge this code. But because we have configured our CI in the correct way, it will not let us merge broken, broken code. We must fix this code before we can merge it into our system. So the point is, with unit testing, the CI doesn't let anyone merge broken code. And this saves your team a tremendous amount of time. The cost of a bug to your organization is directly related to how long that bug has been in your code. If your bug has only been in your code 10 minutes and you find it, it's very inexpensive. If it's been there two years and it's caused all kinds of downstream problems, right? It's different. So this prevents the bug from going into your code in the first place. Okay. How do we do this? We started with none. Well, the first step was just to set up all the configuration and um, Michael was mentioning uh, scientists don't want to get involved in new tools, and that's great. Uh, CMake and GitHub Actions provides absolutely everything you need. You don't need any new tools. The first step there should just take 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, in the case of NSEP libs, we upgraded all of the documentation to Doxygen, which was a great thing and has been very helpful, but I'm not really going to address it in this talk except to say that we did it before testing because when you are doing unit testing, you interact with your, doc with your uh, documentation very closely and it's great to be able to update it um, usefully. Then we converted existing manual tests to automatic testing. If you have tests that you run on your code, you can make them into automatic tests. And then we use code coverage to fill in the gaps. With C and Fortran, we're aiming for about 85% code coverage with Python, of course, and, and mocking, you can get up to 100, that's great. But in C and Fortran, you usually can't test all of your code. Once you have a good um, test code situation, as we do with NSEP libs now, we can enforce this in new contributions. So we will not accept changes to NSEP libs without unit testing showing that those changes are correct. We've had to change our practices to support the test. This is what I was talking about. If you don't change your practices, it doesn't really work. When you're doing new coding, you must write your tests concurrently or, or before your code. So testing is what you do first, not last. You don't write a bunch of code and then say, okay, now I have to go fill it in with tests. You write the test first, what your code should do, and then you try and make your, your code work in the test. And the reason for that is, first of all, it helps you develop your code much more usefully. 
with better API, but also when you're done with your code, you're also done with your tests. Both are done at the same time. Okay, and when you have unit tests on all of the code already, you will be able to make changes to it with confidence and speed. And that is the point of unit testing. Debugging changes with unit testing. Basically all debugging is unit testing. There is no debugging without writing unit tests. So someone reports a problem, say with NCEP libs, we start with a reproducer bug, which reproduces it at the top level. And then as we debug the, the problem, we introduce a unit test at every function level where the bug lives, right? So if it's, it's been reported in function A and we look in function A, we see that's calling function B and we see that's calling function C and function C is where the bug really is. We end up with a test for A, a test for B and a test for C. So three new unit tests have been added while we found that out, okay? Now we fix the bug and all of those tests pass and those tests remain part of the code base forever. And in fact, we take an extra step now to generalize those tests so that they still catch that specific case, but also as many others as we can conveniently do. So the point of all this is that you never have a reoccurrence of the same bug. Once the bug is found one time, your unit test will prevent it from ever being introduced again. This is what I just said, put in a little diagram. So step one, you do your configuration. Step two, we updated our documentation. Step three, we converted manual tests. Step four, we wrote a bunch of unit tests. And now we've reached step five where we can enforce it. And a lot of the enforcement can be done automatically. Here is where we are right now in terms of test coverage for the NCEP libs libraries. And the ones at the top are the most tested and the ones at the bottom, the least. We have prior, we have deprioritized GRIB1 because everyone tells me GRIB1 is eventually going away. And I, I don't know if I believe them because it's been a long time and I'm getting cynical. But in any case, it's still at the end of the line and eventually we'll reach it and start filling in test for it, I'm sure. We've made a lot of progress this year with GRIB2 and buffer. Um, we have, of course, um, had significant outside contributions to our code in the past, and we, we continue to do so. We're very happy to work with outside developers. Of course, any code that is merged is subjected to detailed review. Um, this is an operational code, so we're very careful with it. And the great thing about the CI system with all this unit testing is many of the things we would like to enforce are done so impersonally and automatically. So people don't feel rejected from me, they feel rejected from GitHub. And that's that feels better, it really does. It really does, try it and see. Um, unit testing gives the team and the contributor confidence that their contribution has not broken anything. And otherwise, how would we even know that, right? So, but we can help if you wanna contribute and you're not used to unit tests, that's okay. Contact us, we'll help you get started and, and write some unit testing for your code. And all of this is to save team time, okay? If we, if we unit test everything and we're sure everything's tested, the team spends less time debugging the software and more time doing a new software or other science. Okay, so unit tests and CI lower the bar for community contributions and make it easier for the community to contribute to us and easier for us to accept their contributions. Unit testing is an engineering practice uh, universal in the software industry. If you go to Facebook or Apple or Google or Microsoft, they will not let you write software without unit testing. And, you know, again, Michael, your, your talk was so interesting and I heard the guilt and I just wanna, I wanna absolve all the scientists in this room of, of guilt right now. Guilt is not a productive emotion and the people at Google are not better people than you. The people at Facebook are not better people than you. They do unit testing because it's cheaper. That's why their boss makes them because he doesn't want to spend the extra money, he or she, okay? So it's universal, not because they're better people, but because they're subjected to more economic pressures and they're not, they're not permitted to use inefficient methods to produce software anymore. That said, uh, unit testing is a discipline which allows us to program faster and spend less time on maintenance, but it is a discipline and it must be done correctly. 
And if your goal, I also heard Michael, your talk about people who tried it and gave it up. It's maybe hard to get started and I should consider that more, but it's also true that if your goal is to have it fail, you will succeed. If your goal is to say, I'm gonna try this stupid unit testing because they're making me, but I'll show them that it doesn't really help, then it won't really help. So don't do that. We have a poster on this uh, at the AGU this year, and there is the um, abstract and my collaborators at NOAA. I have another poster, which is going to be on, and we have a lot of NetCDF users in this room, new compression methods in NetCDF. So also look out for that. And if you're a NetCDF user and you're producing too much data, then check out the new compression. It's in PIO now too, right? So good. Okay, in conclusion, we've improved the NSEB lives testing and automation quite a bit. And this helps us to maintain them um, more inexpensively, more quickly, more responsibly, and with less effort from our staff. Any questions? So we have an online question from Jen Sun. Okay. He says, Earth system model generally has too many subroutines and writing unit tests for each of them will lead to a long and costly test list overall. How do you make a balance here or decide what should be tested routinely? First of all, when you're in a hole, stop digging, <laughs> right? So you've written a bunch of untested code. The first thing to do is stop doing that and set up unit testing and make sure that all new code and all changes are, are tested as you put them in. And as for the rest, um, I don't believe that there's any way to get out of it. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna absolve anyone of your obligation to test your code. If you've gotten away with it this long, then my advice is that you should, I don't know, work weekends. <laughs> sorry if that sounds harsh. So, so first one quick aside and then a question. Um, yeah. I think I read an interview with Kent Beck, uh, sort of one of the fathers of test-driven development, a few years back when he had gone off to Facebook, and he made some statement about he doesn't really do unit testing anymore, and he's at Facebook. They just have a different thing. They deploy, and if people complain or there's some problem, they undeploy. So, so them is more about not testing anymore, but reversibility. So, any, anyways, I don't. I, maybe things have changed again since then. But my question is, you didn't discuss testing frameworks per se. Now, C test in some sense is a zeroth order testing framework, um, and you started doing unit testing long before any of these kind of tools existed. So do you have experience with testing frameworks and how much that might even further simplify introducing new people to unit testing? I, I don't really like testing frameworks because I think they add a level of complexity that is not really helpful. And um, as, as Michael pointed out, in terms of don't use a tool that might go away, um, if you don't need it, then don't use it. So I, I'm not a fan of testing frameworks. The thing about testing frameworks is Frequently, they're centered around human-oriented output. We will give you very nice printed output from your tests. Well, when you have automated testing, you very rarely look at the output anyway. So the whole point of a testing framework, what is it giving you? I mean, CMake can already run all the tests you need and do everything perfectly with almost no code. So I don't know what a testing framework would bring to the table, really. That's just my opinion. So. <clears throat> When you uh, converted the manual test that you had to um, to, um, to um, unit test, uh, what was your coverage at at that point before you had to start writing more? It varied from, from nsublib to nsublib. The most effective was bufferlib, which came in at 65% coverage when we did the manual tests. And many of them, like all of the GRIB libraries, had zero manual testing at all. So they came in at zero. I just want to, so, um, you know, scientists write code at a variety of scales and, you know, for very small, if you have, you know, a five line Python script, you probably don't need tests for it. And so at some point there's a crossover where you should start testing. So do you have any thoughts about when, when that occurs? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I will not say that unit testing should always be used, but I will say that if you are writing code that's operationally being run at NOAA, unit testing should always be used. So somewhere between those two. Right. I mean, I think if we got to the point where all operational code was unit tested and then we started to ask, okay, what else? That would be very worthwhile, but we're not even close to that, right? We don't, we don't even test our code. So I think let's focus on our operational codes first and then research codes maybe. So there's a lot to discuss here, thank you. For now I'll ask, what do you think about property-based testing? About what? Property-based testing. 
Um, I, I'm I'm not super familiar with property based testing, but as I why don't you explain what it is? So when you write unit tests, you typically write down specific inputs and outputs that you're so you're going to call a function, you're going to pass it certain inputs, and then you're going to check to make sure the output is what you're expecting. Um, but you know, in general, you need to test your code with a variety of different inputs. Um, and then okay. there's some relationship between the inputs and the yeah. outputs that you're expecting. And so in property-based testing, instead of write, writing down concrete inputs, you say, for all inputs that match the following condition, the following relationship should occur between the inputs and the outputs. So for example, if the input is positive, then the out output should be positive, right? And then a, a, a test generator will generate a bunch of positive inputs. And then it'll see for each of those, is the output positive like it's supposed to be or not? And if not, well, there's, there's a bug. Yeah, I have heard of that. And... I think that again, that's a more advanced testing feature. I'd be happy to see us. Okay, so we're writing a generally Fortran subroutine and it's taking a bunch of inputs either as subroutine parameters or as global variables. And we're doing some mathematical transformation and we're coming out with some answer, which again, we're either passing as parameters from the subroutine or else changes in global variables, right? So I would be happy if we could start with, okay, given this specific set of input data, I get this specific output result. And you know, only then would I say, well, we have a few of those tests, then it's time to move on to more advanced testing. Like this kind of change should always make you know, the temperature go down. I think the idea is that it's supposed to save you time by preventing you from having to write so many unit tests. I'm very old fashioned and I don't believe that it, I think the desire to save time by not unit testing is, is the myth. You do not save time by not unit testing. You save time by unit testing. So write your unit tests and stop trying to avoid so the it. The point is you're, you're writing a whole suite of unit tests. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so right. I just want to mention that um, Dominique Orchard, who's online and giving a talk tomorrow, says that he's going to discuss property-based te testing. Uh, and yeah, so I just add that probably Dominic will talk about this too. Just a comment before my question that I think that maybe the the true philosophy would be both. You would want to have unit and property testing because your unit testing will cover the cases where you know what the output would be, but the property tests are essential to catch things that randomization, for example, um, would help you find essentially because maybe you didn't get sure. all of the cases with yeah. your input. I so, agree. And this, if I can just talk yeah, about yeah, that for a second. Can. This kind of addresses the so-called oracle problem, which is scientists will say, oh, my subroutine can't be tested because it's already coming up with the best humanly known answer to the problem. Therefore, what do I compare it to, right? And that's certainly a real problem, but how much of our code is really touched by that problem? A small bit, but 98% of your code is like moving data around and taking averages and Great. converting things you know, between units and all this stuff, which is totally exact. And there's no Oracle problem at all. So I say, let's test all that code. And then when we get to the Oracle code problem, certainly then special techniques will be called. Right. So I would agree that you would basically need both. So my question actually was more from an experience perspective in terms of when you have legacy code that has a number of dependencies and in the terms of you might have a single subroutine that's rather simple. You could unit test it probably quite easily. And yet you have to build an entire infrastructure that maybe takes an hour to build because you're yeah. building the only way to get at that subroutine yeah. and the way the code is generated now is to build the entire model so right. you can isolate it. Yeah. And so do you have experience with how to overcome that limitation uh, without having to rewrite you know, whole lines of code, which that would then turn, make the emotional thing click kick in pretty hard. Yeah, I'm going through this exact thing right now because I'm writing unit tests for the, the so-called wave model, the WW3 model. I, I got to laugh. And indeed, there's a lot, before you can do anything, you have to have all of this all of this global stuff set up, right? And so, wow, that's that's discouraging. But at the same time, you know what? It took me like two days to get that all working and now it's going to be working for every unit test that I write. So, you know, you just man up and do it and then you have it so you know stop being a baby if you write code that's really hard for it to run in unit test well that's a great reason for you to start using unit testing so that in the future you won't write code that's so difficult to test you'll start to write code because you'll say well i gotta write a test for this code how do i do that and you'll do that before you write the code and when you're done you'll end up with a much more testable code which means your code will have less bugs so it's, it's all good embrace it embrace the difficulty lean into it yeah 
So, so I just want to say, um, at this point, the next half hour, I just have slotted open discussion, so we can we can continue Wait talking about unit tests. We can let Ed uh, take the microphone off and sit down. Um, but I want to make sure people online know they can uh, chime in and ask questions. And in the room, we'll bring you the microphone. And but if you've had enough fun and can't take any more and want to leave, that's fine too. But um, we'll be staying to discuss. So. Go ahead, Aaron. Oh, yeah. No, so I was, I, I think my question might have implied that that should be a barrier for unit testing. I should probably start by it, saying it I completely agree yeah. that you need unit testing. Um, in our own experience at the DOE, one of the major motivations for the complete refactor that we did do of our atmosphere model was that because we started over again, we could start doing unit tests easily. And that that barrier was very palatable. And so I think it would be helpful for anyone who's dealing with legacy code to understand kind of how you could overcome that barrier if, if there's a way to do it without a complete rewrite. I mean, just, you know, to set up the, the global variables from oh, home, it's going to be some tens of lines of Fortran code, right? Not more than 100, probably. Maybe 200. Okay, so, you know, write the 200 lines of code. It's just, that's what it takes. That's what you have to do. It's engineering, right? I mean, I wish it was easy, but it's not always easy. Well, I don't want to be just me and him debating. So maybe we can, yeah. But I would just point out, it's not, unfortunately, it turns out that in some cases, it's not even that easy. If it were, it would be great. But in some cases, there are such difficult dependencies that it, it it can turn into more than just a few hundred lines of code, unfortunately. You keep wanting to talk. Oh, and this is fine, yeah. <laughs> now I was going to throw in a different perspective bridging the two opinions I heard. One is, if you look at uh, the standard software industry, which is uh, not HPC or uh, climate science centric, uh, they do fuzz testing. This is the go-to method for that. We cannot fuzz many of the routines because we don't know the input constraints. If you don't know the input, like if a matrix has to be positive, somebody definite, you had to set it up in that uh, uh, manner. Uh, you had to test it against uh, a linear algebra code, means you need to initialize the routines with the right condition number, otherwise the solver will not be tested well. So there are some semantic uh, conditions you need to set up. This is one reason why fuzzing, in my opinion, you can correct me. If many of the MPI codes, if you try to fuzz, it will just die. <laughs> this is the problem because they are very brittle. They are meant for specific use cases. So in that sense, Single use cases, uh, like you said, seem to be feasible. This is what I see getting written. And I don't see fuzzing at all used in HPC. And the property-based testing will be amazing, but uh, there are uh, impedances like what I was alluding to, which are the semantic conditions under which a code is supposed to work. That is not articulated. The only routine I know where assertions, sits, uh, assertions are placed is Lulish. They have put in assertions at module boundaries. And many of the codes don't even carry assertions. And without assertions, you don't know what inputs and outputs there are at each interface. So, but you can, if you're talking about your own code, yeah. which is a model that you run, yeah, you can actually run it and stop it in the debugger and see what the inputs and outputs of everything uh, are. Right, 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 right. But what I mean is uh, the kind of uh, property-based testing that to take off, it must be saying that x less than y, unless it's something else. You know, those things are yeah, and. I can tell you story uh, codes without naming that there are actual conditional tests. If X equal to equal to Y, um, codes ex like that exist. <laughs> so I don't know where to draw the line. So there's definitely yeah. problems, but it's <laughs> yeah. not a reason to not test. I know, I know. Yeah. Anyway, I think the main point is fuzzing is something that people always bring up. Thanks. Anyone else want to say anything? This is so far on the other end of the spectrum, but as a person who's like come from the scientific background, not really a computer science background, I'm like really bad about this. Do you have any recommendations for like a good resource? Because and this sort of maybe related to this other question, which is like, I tend to write a lot of this sort of research code that is not production code but I do so much debugging of my horrible code. And so I would, do you have like a recommendation of a nice resource or book or something? I'm like, I need to be doing more of this. 
I, I'll jump in with one example and then uh, test driven development by example by Kent Beck is a very lightweight fun read showing the advantage of going down there, but it, it does assume a testing framework. So it's a slightly different philosophy there. Um, with our poster at the AGU, we're doing an extended abstract where we use the NCEP libs as an example for how we do each technique, including unit testing. So there's examples in there, and then you can go look at the NCEP libs online and see examples. So hopefully that'll help. So I wanted to ask a broader question kind of for discussion purposes. Um, you know, people have used the word verification here to mean a variety of different things. And I, I'm I'm sort of looking for insight from you all to understand sort of what your expectations are, what you mean when you say verification, what you wish you meant but can't mean because you don't know how to do it, <laughs> um, what correctness means, right? So, I mean, in the programming language community, correctness is very slippery because correctness is with respect to a specification. And in many kinds of software, actually, in you know, in sort of in commercial software, there's no specification. And so there's no actual definition of correctness. Here, maybe you have a more well-defined definition of correctness, but maybe either has actually no formally written down specification, but maybe there's something in mind. So I, I'm wondering if, not, not exactly a poll of the audience, but I, I wanna hear from a lot of different people about what you mean by correctness. All right, who wants to go first? So, so let me try this. Um, so tomorrow I will have a uh, presentation on the um, uh, code integration. So basically we have the UFS model and we have code updates coming to the, um, from community to the repository. So it is a, a big challenge to say the, the PRs, the, the changes coming in is correct. But we I think we have a common sense say for a certain update, you have why you make this change and what you did. So from that, we have a common expectation what the model should do. So from that, for example, if I do something and I expect model will change, then we start from that draw to confirm, okay, the change showing up in the results is what we expected. So that is in, in my understanding in the, when we deal with developers, we have this common sense, okay, this change should not change results. Then you need to show me it does not. But if it does say, oh, it will, the purpose of your code update is to improve precept, then I need to see the precept is improved. So that is a, a way, I don't know for others, this is just uh, to get other people <laughs> started. So my two cents is in the absence of tests, if you have tests, they define what correctness is, whether the tests themselves are what you want, that's what you've got that defines correctness. And since most of our software lacks that, the only measure we have is whether or not anybody's upset with the software. The software is correct if no one has any reason to complain. They do have reasons to complain, so we know our software is not correct. Anyone else? Uh, my comment on that is, uh, so correctness is something binary, right? Something is either correct or incorrect. So in that regard, I think when we talk about correctness, it's more on the software side. Whereas in, in the case of modeling, it's not correct or incorrect. It's accurate or less accurate. You know, That's my take on that. what Alper alluded to might be distinguishing between code level correctness, which is array out of bounds or whether certain defects, null point or if exceptions are present or not. Then we need to bind it to the application semantics. It becomes so tied to the what the application says must happen, right? And for instance, uh, in computer science, there is a standard technique of arguing that loops terminate by establishing a ranking function, which decreases. In HPC, sometimes uh, termination is when the chemical system that you're simulating quiesces. <laughs> you don't know how long that takes. So termination is a property of the chemicals that you're simulating, not the code. You know There are certain things like that. I think there are certain connotations like that which I'm picking up. I'm not an expert by any means, but there is a distinct difference when you 
talk about correctness in CS community versus in other communities that I know. Yeah, Michael, I think this is a really interesting topic because I think um, we we do define things loosely. So, uh, you know, if we write a routine and it's, we put in multiply these two numbers, two times three, and it comes back and says cat, well, we know we're incorrect. And that's really easy. Um, but if we put in, uh, you know, two times three and we put them in as floating point values and it comes back and says six, we say it's correct. If it says 5.999999987, uh, is it correct? I mean, so it depends a little bit on on this and it's a little bit flexible. And I think understanding if there are better ways or, or to give an example from a climate model, if I make a change and it says the temperature over Boulder is now 500 degrees, I know it's wrong. If the temperature field has changed by 0.01%, uh, is that correct? Or it, is that what my change was expected to do versus what I got? And these are very gray areas. I think it would be really interesting to understand more formal ways of looking at this. That's that's my view. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, one thing that I want to and I apologize, I missed part of the discussion. I did jump out for a call, but. Um, I think one thing that we don't seem to have talked about as much is levels in between the like full complexity of the the most complicated version of a particular model, and then you have unit tests on the other end of the spectrum. Um, I've had a, a few conversations this week where I've talked to people about how often uh, a lot of the bugs that slip through the cracks in climate models are one person defining a variable slightly differently than another like but they have almost the same value so then it's hard to tell until you get into some edge case or um yeah like things where there are really semantic issues of the assumptions of two parameterizations are are incompatible in a in somewhat of a subtle way and i think that's where you get into really needing um, things like simplified models, ideally you have um, like things where there's an analytic solution to compare to or something, but that's very rare that you can actually get that. Um, things like conservation of energy and momentum and um, like different types of tests where you just try to check for invariance. And so, you know, correctness ideally, you know, from this perspective would be that everybody can sit down and agree on what the model should be doing, or at least agree on what approximations you're making. And if you have people who are developing key parts of the model that have fundamentally different ideas about like some basic things, then it's sort of dubious that it's correct in the sense that like somebody with a consistent view of the whole thing would, would agree that it's consistent. And that's something that's hard to do automated testing of, but you can, test a lot of these things like conservation um, or or different like invariants or properties that you expect the solution to have. And that can help to find issues like that. That's all I have. I'm gonna add to that vein. So I'm a statistician. So we think about the world, like everything has a distribution. And I think in this context, I'm gonna talk tomorrow about our approach here, but it makes a lot of sense to think about like we know these are chaotic systems, right? It doesn't need to be exact, but can we still say something meaningful in terms of that's the kind of distribution we want? And I'd like to, I love unit testing. I think it's really good. And I think it's important to separate actually writing correct code in some mathematical sense that makes all sense in the world to do that. I mean, at the CSM code seems formidable to me because I've, I've worked, when I used to work here, like I know about it, it's something like 1.6 million lines of super messy, mainly legacy code or something. That seems like I know I was involved in the efforts to start unit testing. I think from a psychological point of view, it probably needs like 10 ads. And when uh, Marshall was talking about these parentheses, I think we could all spend 
next hundred lifetimes trying to get these parentheses in the code. So I think there's some realities that I'm not, um, that I, ha I have some level of appreciation for and no solution whatsoever. <laughs> but I think framing the problem of, so let's say the code is perfect, but what we have seen a lot is like these little things, like you just change the MPI library or something like that, like that we can assume it, there's no truth that this thing is better than other, or maybe there is, but let's say they're all equivalent. And they, there are really different results, but they're not crazy different, but there's, you the way I view it is there's a distribution around it. Uh, and characterizing that maybe, and um, thinking about it, well, obviously I'm gonna talk about it more, but to me, this is a better way of thinking about correctness in, in this kind of climate model world where we really know there's no way to truly character this. It's very different than saying a function doesn't give us the right output because we have a bug. I mean, that's just true, really, we should just fix it. You know, that's, that's how I see it. to know the variability that an MPI library change introduces maybe in the reduction semantics, right? And which, yeah. So once we actually did such an experiment by taking higher order stencils and trying to imagine all possible ways of reassociating addition, just for the heck of it, it's a very limited study and we could come up with four alps of uh, difference if you play with a certain distribution of numbers. So if you have, a, that kind of amount is useful because if it is like, um, 32 alps or 64 alps, then you know it is outside the space, you know. So I think variable T can be calibrated at lower levels and maybe that can feed into your higher level decisions that you take uh, in your work, maybe. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Anyone else? All right, well, if no one else um, has anything to share, I just want to say one thing. There are, there's an international computing in the atmosphere sciences symposium that NCAR runs every other year, I believe. And it's gonna be next year, September. There are these little advertisement sheets out by where you got your coffee and water. So if you're interested, um, pick one up or talk to one of us NCAR folks. And did you wanna, oh, you have, so this, this is sort of a follow-up right I'm, I'm wondering what keeps you up at night right like what, what are what are the risks you know so like you know when you think about bugs that you found or then and you're worried about more instances of those or you're worried about bugs that you haven't found what what, what bothers you <laughs> so so that explains the whole journey I had from being uh, an HPC active scientist to where I am today. Um, bugs that I introduced into models as a postdoc that weren't discovered until months or so later literally would get me up at night. Uh, I'd just wake up in a cold sweat knowing that I had harmed other people's research. And so since then, I've become just a fierce advocate of test-driven development. Um, I've sort of stepped off the soapbox these days. I believe in it, but I no longer get up and try to sell it to everyone. So that's and, and I would add that one of the things that, that I love is or it's sort of statistical testing because I don't believe anything from a single run. And uh, I, I've just turned into a giant skeptic about things. Um, and, it, and it's interesting when we look at things like something as simple as, you know, we talk about the models. And by the way, CSM is now 2.5 million lines of code. It's even worse. So, uh, yeah, so it, the but if you something we, we think about the models a lot we think about the physics code in there but something as simple as like with our new system we're going to have to switch compilers part way through um it builds the code it runs the tests but if we have statistical small statistical differences does that translate into a bias in the model we talk a lot about biases and physical processes but what about the software environment the math libraries all of these things this stuff if I had hair, I would rip it out. Uh, I, it's 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 stuff that stresses me out because we don't know, and I worry that we have giant things like the IPCC report to various governments, and we're like, uh, what part of that is system bias? No idea. So, yeah, stuff like that worries me. Yeah, since I'm from operational centers, so just <laughs> let you know, a big worry is that if operational run fails, then all the WFO 
the uh, forecast office, they cannot get data. So this is impossible. This cannot happen. So that is a big worry for the the code that will be implemented operation. So I do appreciate Ed made a lot of effort in such kind of environment, and he also made me feel guilty many times. But that. <laughs> But that is I can't make you feel guilty. You only you can do that, Jim. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say, in terms of what keeps scientists up at night, that there seems to be a general feeling that the most complex math code is the most vulnerable, and that's where the mistake is going to be. And yet, in my experience as a scientific programmer, very frequently, the code that has the bug that affects the result is some unimportant or unsexy or stupid piece of code that therefore nobody is paying much attention to, and it was written a long time ago, and it has a bug in it, which has been affecting everything for years, and no one ever noticed. So we were working on the um, total irradiance monitor, which is an instrument family that flies uh, and, and measures the sun's irradiance. It's built right here in Boulder. And the amount of time and money that was spent on that software is tremendous, but it was not unit tested. When we started unit testing it, we found that the biggest computational error was caused by a floating point uh, constant being inadvertently put into an integer and dropping the decimal part. So instead of being 12.4, it was just 12. And that caused a, a loss of one fifth of their entire error budget on a dumb software bug, which is like the most original software bug that everybody made in their freshman year of college. So just because it's you know not the complex math or the complex code, that doesn't mean that you don't need to test it. Sorry to make you feel guilty, June. Anyone else? I think let's call it a day then. Let's thank all our speakers and thank you everyone for participating. And I'll see you at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs>